Chapter 39 Eli Pope, Day 91 By the time Eli reached the warehouse, it was 2 a.m. Ragged ribbons of clouds drifted across the moon like burial shrouds. There was no movement, no sound but for the bugs, the swish of weeds against his thighs, the sigh of a soft breeze through the pine needles. On high alert, he limped toward the building, but remained within the tree line. The warehouse had been abandoned for a couple of decades. Graffiti scrawled across the concrete exterior. Vines crawled up the walls and snaked over the metal roof, and trash and debris were scattered everywhere. The upper windows were shattered, the lower windows boarded up. He hesitated behind a pine tree, keeping the trunk between him and twenty yards of open pavement. His gaze swept the milky shadows, pulse quickening as he caught a glint on top of the warehouse roof. A sniper. His hand slid to his combat knife. Little good that would do in a firefight. This is Alpha One, he whispered into his headset. He wasn't sure if it would still work. Anybody alive in there? A crackle of static, and then Moreno's voice said, Guess you're not dead, Alpha One. That's a pity. We had a bet going for the last five gallons of gasoline. Too bad you lost. That our guy on Overwatch on the roof? Yours truly, Hart said. I don't see you anywhere. That's the point. They'd set up a defensive perimeter as he'd instructed. They were learning. You gonna let me in or what? Hart's got you covered, Marino said. Come on into the Hilton and make yourself at home. Hope you brought your best suit. The dining room is black tie only. Damn, my tux drowned in the river. Eli waded through waist-high weeds. Bramble snagged his clothes and scratched at his exposed skin. Ahead of him, the parking lot zigzagged with cracks as he made his way around to the rear entrance. The rusted steel door hung on squeaky hinges, a cement block holding it closed, the padlock long busted. A shuffling sound came from behind the door, and then Jackson shoved the door open enough for Eli to slide through. Jackson moved aside and gestured for Eli to enter, closed the door behind him, and shoved the cement block back into place. He carried a red filmed flashlight low in his hand, so as not to draw undue attention. Relief welled through him. He hadn't realized how strongly he'd feared Jackson hadn't survived until he laid eyes on his old friend's grim, sooty face. He resisted the bizarre urge to hug him. Instead, he cleared his throat awkwardly. Guess your ugly mug made it too. Alexis stood behind the door, guarding the entrance. She saluted Eli. Good to see you, sir. We were starting to get worried. So was I. And I'm no sir. Jackson scanned his injuries with concern. You're hurt. Couple of scratches. Alexis frowned. Is that ranger speak for on your deathbed? Something like that. We've been waiting for three hours. We thought. Jackson didn't finish what he'd thought, but his dread and worry were written across his face. Sorry to disappoint you. Jackson's mouth thinned. I'm glad you made it, you big idiot. Eli only grunted. It had been three hours of hell. His whole body ached. He longed for a soft mattress, a bowl of soup, and maybe a painkiller or two. Hell, what he wanted was a morphine drip to surrender to oblivion. What about our people? He asked. Who's hurt? How is Devin? Devin is fine. Everyone made it. Still, there was something in Jackson's voice, a thread of sorrow, of defeat, that gave Eli pause. He examined Jackson's face, searching for clues. What is it? Jackson's expression hardened. He started down the hall and waved him forward. I'll explain in a minute. Alexis stayed behind to keep watch. Jackson led Eli deeper into the warren of rooms and hallways, his flashlight beam low and sweeping ahead of them. 
The warehouse smelled faintly of burnt plastic and something dead. The rancid carcass of a raccoon or possum, perhaps. They entered the cavernous main room, which was three stories tall. The perimeter ringed with a one-story metal grate catwalk. Smashed pop cans, shriveled condom wrappers, and shredded cardboard were piled in the corners. Deep, wavering shadows lurched along the walls. His boots crunched shattered glass. With every step, his anxiety grew. In the center of the room, the team sat in a circle, on stacked crates and pallets, slumped forward, elbows on thighs, their heads down. Fighters, who'd escaped death, but were drained, exhausted, and weary to the bone. There was no elation, no exhilaration at surviving, at beating the enemy. They hadn't won. They had barely escaped with their lives. At the sight of him, Nix rose, picked up the HK-417 she'd rested across her thighs, and handed it to him. Thought you were a goner. I got lucky. He winced as he slung the rifle over his chest. He didn't feel lucky. He scanned Nix and automatically checked her over for injuries. Her shirt sleeve had been cut away and her shoulder bandaged. Her right arm hung limp at her side. She saw him looking and grimaced. I can move it, but it hurts like hell. It was a through and through, a flesh wound. It didn't hit tendons, ligaments, or bones. <laughs> At least I don't think so. You, however, look like you got run over by a dump truck. I'm fine. In truth, his arm and thigh felt like someone had jabbed him with hot pokers. He needed to remove the tourniquet and get his forearm stitched up ASAP. On second thought, I'll take some ranger candy. Beside them, Devin raised her head. She was dirty and soot-streaked. Blood smeared her cheek from a nasty cut above her eyebrow. Other than that, she was unhurt. What's ranger candy? Nix rolled her eyes as she pulled a packet from her eye fac, tore it with her teeth, and dumped the pills into Eli's outstretched hand. Army speak for ibuprofen. Between you and Antoine, those are my last two, you jerk. Thanks. Eli swallowed the pills without water. What the hell's wrong with Antoine? Nix offered a sharp smile. He misses his mommy. Antoine cursed in French. Damn straight I do. He sat beside Devin, nursing a second degree burn to the left side of his face. His shirt hung in tatters from his left shoulder, the ends singed from his neck to his ribs. Blood oozed from a few lacerations along his ribs where shrapnel had struck him. What happened to you? Eli asked. Anton winced. Got kissed by a grenade. You look like death warmed over. Takes more than a damn grenade to kill me, brother. I am a cockroach like that. In more ways than one. Nix said. Antoine winked. Still here to fight another day. That's what matters. Yeah, well, you should have seen him two hours ago, crying like a big fat baby. Tears of joy at our reunion, Antoine quipped. Nix rolled her eyes. He clearly needs to have his head examined. We were lucky as hell we didn't lose a man, Jackson said quietly. In addition to injuries, we lost a truck to an RPG. We have barely enough fuel to return home. Devin shot a grateful look at Nix and Antoine. We were trapped before these two came barreling in like kamikazes. They pushed back the shooters so we could escape. The bad guys retreated when the train left. Luckily, they didn't pursue us. He could see it in their eyes. Nix and Antoine had earned their grudging respect. No one could deny it. The mercenaries had saved their bacon. Eli shifted his attention and scanned the shadowy warehouse. At the far end, two of the wildland trucks were parked in empty bays. The rolling doors pulled down to shield them. He searched the dirty concrete floor around the group. He didn't see what he was looking for. 
The insulin. Where is it? Nix's face darkened. In the middle of the gunfight, as we were driving back the hostels, one of them threw a damn grenade into the bed of the truck. Antoine and I managed to jump out in time. We dove behind a concrete building, which got most of the blast. The insulin was in the back of the truck. I'm sorry, Eli. But it got blown to smithereens. The blood drained from his face. He couldn't breathe properly. Everything they'd risked, only to fail, and to fail utterly. They had suffered far too many losses for such little gain. All he'd done was expose himself to Sykes and paint a target the size of Montana on his back and those he loved. Plus, he was now injured, weakening him for the next time he would face his enemy. Then he remembered. With his good arm, he reached into his pocket, searching for something. He pulled out a handful of broken glass shards, slippery with clear liquid. Dread scrabbled up the notches of his spine. When he'd removed the lid of the refrigerated crate to verify the insulin, he'd grabbed a handful of vials and shoved them into his pocket. The vials had shattered, either during his battle with Sykes or his dive from the bridge into the river. No, not all of them. He cradled two unbroken vials in his palm, a few weeks of life for the woman he loved. He closed his fingers over the vials and gently slipped them into a pouch on his chest rig next to his heart. The beta blockers? Nix asked softly. Did you find them? Chagrined, Eli shook his head. I'm sorry. Nix didn't respond. Her mouth tightened. She stared dismally at a spot of fresh graffiti scrawled across the warehouse wall. The end of the world is the beginning of hell. At that moment, he couldn't agree more. Moreno grimaced. How the hell did things go sideways so fast? And who the hell was that who attacked us? They weren't soldiers, but they sure as hell were vicious and armed to the teeth. The Cote Cartel, Eli said wearily. And Darius Sykes. Jackson blanched. What? According to Sykes, the Cote Cartel slaughtered the National Guard stationed at the Sioux and took over the locks. They're extending their reach into the Upper Peninsula. They hired Sykes and his convicts, gave them weapons and more men to ambush the National Guardsmen and steal the train. Across the circle, Eli met Jackson's gaze. Jackson looked stricken. He knew what this meant. It was no longer a matter of time. Sykes was coming for them now, coming for everything they held dear. A shocked silence settled over the room. Chief McAllister shook her head, horrified. Here? On American soil? Devin let out a soft groan. Holy hell. What do we know about the Cote Cartel? Nash asked. They're a Quebec-based organized crime network, Jackson said. They've consolidated power from Montreal to Toronto to Vancouver. For years, they dealt mostly in narcotics trafficking, until seven years ago, when Louis Galt assassinated his cousin and several of his high-ranking Cote family members at a birthday party in Cancun. It was an organized coup. Under Galt's leadership, they've built underground networks with the worst of the Mexican cartels, the Sinaloa cartel and Los Cedas, and sunk their claws into black market weapon smuggling and human trafficking. Galt has a particularly vicious enforcer known as the Jackal. Not much is known about him, other than his affinity for brutality. The cartel is organized, effective, and merciless. Cross them, and they go scorched earth. They wipe you out and your entire lineage. Over the last few years, they've stepped up recruitment efforts and built themselves an army of foot soldiers. They have an arsenal of weaponry, 
including RPGs, grenades, and automatic weapons. Hell, they have helicopters and rockets. We've seen what they can do, Antoine said with terrible awe. They attacked us on the open highway, nearly slaughtered us. We barely got away. The National Guard and local cops showed up and were massacred. Sawyer stole from them, Eli said. They don't know who or where he is, or they would have come already. If Sykes sniffs around enough, he might figure it out and relay that intel back to Galt. That wouldn't be bad news for Sawyer, but it would be bad news for us. The cartel wouldn't just destroy Sawyer. They'd kill whoever got in their way. Then we better figure out how to catch the SOB, and quick, Moreno said. The somber silence grew thick and heavy. No one spoke for several minutes. They listened to the wind suffing through the broken windows, the rustle of trash, a rat skittering in the corners. Jackson glared down at his hands, as if he could figure out a way to solve this mess if he thought hard enough, or as if he could conjure up a solution through sheer force of will. When he looked up, his eyes were haunted. They knew we were coming. What? Nash said. We didn't surprise them. They were ready for us. This was an organized counterattack. I was hoping you would come. Sykes's words echoed in Eli's mind. I was hoping it would be you. Eli nodded. He's right. The group gazed at each other, aghast. Who? Moreno's voice rose in anger. The only people who knew about the mission are here, right now. Hell, we've only been planning the op for a freaking day. What the hell happened? Suspicious gazes turned on Antoine and Nix. Nix bristled. We told no one. Our butts were on the line, too. She jerked a thumb at Antoine. Look at his face. Why the hell would we ambush our operation? We didn't leak intel. Someone sure did, Nash muttered. Someone ratted us out to Sykes. To the cartel, or both. Jackson said, I will not rest until I find out who did this. And they will pay dearly for it. Believe me. This is just the beginning, Moreno said what they were all thinking. Sykes and his merry band of murderers will keep coming. Now that they're backed by the cartel, they're stronger and even more dangerous. They have more men and better weapons. They'll keep coming. No one answered him. Eli gazed at his disheartened team members, at the despondency in their expressions, their slumped postures. He felt it too. Despair lurked at the edge of his consciousness, the darkness creeping in, his failure sharp as a razor blade. Devin stood unsteadily and cleared her throat. This is bad, but it's not over. It's not the end. We'll keep fighting. Jackson reached over and squeezed her hand. She offered him a grim smile. Eli had no energy left for smiles or comforting platitudes. The darkness did not recede. Chapter 40 Lena Easton, Day 91 Hold still, Lena demanded. She bent over Eli's wounded forearm, skillfully stitching the gash with a sterilized needle and sutures from her med kit. She had no access to topical anesthesia, but she'd iced the area, using ice cubes from the solar-powered fridge in the inn's kitchen. It helped, a little. Sykes's knife had opened a nasty four-inch gash in his forearm, biting deep into flesh and muscle and barely missing an artery. He was lucky a tendon hadn't been cut, or he might have lost the use of his hand. The cuts on his side and the back of his leg were shallow, although they'd bled profusely. Lena had debrided the wounds with sterilized water, then applied antibiotics and antiseptic cream before stitching the lacerations. She winced with every puncture of the needle through his flesh. For his part, 
Eli was stoic, merely gritting his teeth against the pain. He held completely still, hissing an occasional curse. The fire flickered cheerily in the fireplace, the flames casting the room in a warm, comforting glow. The constant tinkling of her glass syringes boiling in the pot over the fire was the only sound. They sat at the table in the conference room, Lena's favorite spot. She loved the oversized leather armchairs, the papery smell of hundreds of books, and the huge windows with beautiful views during the day, though night pressed against the panes now. It was four o'clock in the morning, but Lena hadn't slept, hadn't thought of anything else until Eli and the others returned to Munising. Neither had Shiloh, though as soon as she knew Eli was safe, she'd passed out in her bed, with Bear splayed half on top of her, both snoring soundly. Last stitch. Lena snipped the thread and leaned back in her seat. The lacerations will be tender for a while. You need to take it easy, or the wounds will open up again. A deep wound like this one on your arm can easily get infected. I can't take it easy. She placed her hand over his on the table. I'm telling you to try. I'd be abdicating my responsibilities as a medical professional if I didn't. He shook his head, his mouth flat, his black eyes burned with anger. I failed. I failed you. I failed the mission. Sykes is still out there. Worse, now he knows I'm here. He will hunt for us. He'll find out about you, about Shiloh. She heard the fear in his voice, which scared her more than she wanted to admit. We'll deal with it the same way we've dealt with every threat we've faced so far. Eli shoved his chair back and rose abruptly, as if he couldn't bear her touch. He paced the room, his body rigid, expression taut. I didn't get the insulin, Lena. They were ready for us. I should have gotten more intel before we attacked. I should have seen it coming. This isn't your fault. I promised you insulin. He halted next to the desk, reached into his pocket, and pulled out two vials. He placed them almost reverently next to her glass syringes, test strips, and blood sugar meter. This is all I could get. I'm sorry. Lena released the breath she'd been holding. At least it was something. She tried not to show her fear, her exhaustion, the sickness she felt in her cells, her bones, her marrow. Those vials buy me a few more weeks. It's good. It helps. That's nothing. That's not enough. He started up his pacing, roaming in tight circles, the tendons standing out in his throat, hands balled into fists. It's something, Eli. Thank you. He grunted as if he'd barely heard her. She watched him helplessly. He was silent, tortured, and stewing in his pain. It hurt her to see him like this, like a pulsing wound in her own heart. She rose from her chair and went to the desk, wincing as she pricked a tender bruise on her pinky finger to check her blood sugar. Then she injected eight units of insulin and placed the used syringe in the pan to sterilize later. Eli, she said. He looked at her with glazed eyes, like he wasn't even seeing her, as if he hadn't heard her. I'm going to kill him. I want to kill him. I long to kill him with every fiber of my being. He paused in front of the fire, his form silhouetted against the flames. I kill people. Sometimes I... I enjoy it. I like killing. I want to make it hurt to make men suffer. He looked down at his hands with revulsion, as if he were seeing them drenched in someone else's blood. Shame shadowed his face and etched his voice. I'm a monster. I kill worse monsters. 
that doesn't absolve what I am. I know what you are. You are no monster. He started to shake his head. Without thinking, she crossed the room, unable to help herself, drawn to him with every cell in her body. She placed her hand on his uninjured arm and forced him to look at her, to meet her gaze. You're good, Eli. That is who you are. A good man. This close, she inhaled the dusky, woodsy scent of him, took in the lean lines of his face, his slanting cheekbones, those hard black eyes that pierced her heart. He watched her, desperately, almost hungrily. Heat swelled in her belly, quickening her pulse. They stood close, less than two feet apart. I know you, she said. I know you better than anyone else. Lena. His eyes darkened with want, with need. The same need was reflected in her eyes, the desire she couldn't hide, couldn't bear to hide. Not any longer. Never had she been more aware of the time she'd been given. Nothing had felt more right in the world than this, here in this room with him. You don't have to hide, she said. Not from me. I want the dark parts, the ugly parts, the broken pieces, the parts you don't want anyone else to see. She swallowed hard. I want it all. He stared at her for a long moment, as if he couldn't believe her words, that it couldn't be real. His gaze questioning, hesitant, full of yearning. Are you sure? I don't want to hurt you. Shut up, she said, and kiss me. The years of pent-up longing burst like a dam breaking. One powerful stride and he reached her, seized her waist and pulled her to him. Drawing her against his chest, he cradled her face in his calloused hands and tilted her chin toward him. Eli bent his head and kissed her deeply. His lips on hers set her skin on fire. Her lips tingled and her fingertips sparked. Lena kissed him back, at first tentatively, then as hungrily as he kissed her. Her pulse thudded wildly against her throat. She felt his heart beating in tandem with hers. Their bodies pressed together. Eli held her close, as though he couldn't bear to let her go. The years of want, of trials, of suffering, of loneliness and heartache, it all fell away, burned to ashes and swept to dust. Lena pulled away her heart surging in her chest, breathless and giddy. She reached up and touched his cheek, looking into those dark eyes she adored. I've loved you my entire life. Eli's voice grew husky with emotion. I would do anything to protect you. Anything, even if it takes my soul. She gazed up at him. I know. Chapter 41, Jackson Cross, Day 91. Where is he? Jackson asked. Where is Horatio? Astrid blinked up at him from her seat in the living room, a novel in her lap. Her wheelchair sat next to the sofa, the cane leaning against the cushions beside her. Where is who? Father. He's out. Out where? Astrid gave a nonchalant shrug. Out, with whomever. Who knows, I'm not his keeper. He's a grown man, in case you haven't noticed. Did he say when he would return? Nope. Why do you care? Jackson forced himself to breathe, to be calm, to steel himself so he could think clearly. Since the train ambush, suspicion had been growing in the back of his mind, festering like cancer. He needed to know, for certain. He needed to confront Horatio in person, face to face. Jackson strode through the expansive kitchen and vaulted living room, down the long hallway to his parents' master bedroom, 
looking for his father's things, searching for a hint as to where he might have gone. Astrid hoisted herself from the sofa, grasped her cane, and thumped down the hallway after him. Whatever you want, you won't find it here. Shut up for once. You only visit when you want something, Astrid spat at his back. How do you think that makes mom feel? Or how about me? Jackson was too stressed to worry about hurt feelings. Still, guilt pricked him. He did worry about his mother. He did care. Wearing gloves like he was working a crime scene, he checked Horatio's master closet and dresser. Several items of clothing were missing. His shoes were lined up neatly on the floor, but a few were gone, though his suit still hung, immaculate and untouched. His suitcase was not in the closet. On the dresser, Horatio's wallet and truck keys were gone, a clean spot in the dust where they were usually kept. His father was gone. Where had he gone, and why? Horatio, his mother croaked. Jackson turned from the closet, padded across the carpet, and sat on the edge of the bed. Dolores leaned against a pillow, her pencil-thin legs draped in a rose-pink comforter. Where have you been? Her voice was thin and raspy. I want my pills. I need my pills. He winced at the sight of her. Leaning down, he kissed her cheek and took her hand in his, her wrist bones burred thin beneath his fingers. I love you, Mom. She didn't seem to hear him or even register his presence. There was nothing in the house, so he went out to the garage. At the back of the six-bay garage was a workshop, filled with shiny tools his father enjoyed owning, but seldom used. The workshop featured a marble half-bath, a window for natural light, and a mahogany desk and leather chair. A new-looking ham radio system sat on the desk. Strange. As far as he knew, his father had never owned a ham radio. Jackson picked up the mic with gloved hands and turned it over in his fingers. Next to the mic was a laminated book of call signs. Why had his father procured a ham radio? Who was he in communication with? Why hadn't he said anything to Jackson? Was this how he communicated with Sawyer? Or someone else? His concern deepened. That suspicion niggled in his mind, whispering terrible things. As he turned to go, something caught his eye. On the second shelf, a half dozen prescription pill bottles lined up neatly next to a pair of speakers. Jackson examined them. The medications were prescribed to strangers. Jason Myers, Callie Pine Alton, and Taylor Ferguson. He didn't recognize the medications, so he wrote them down on his notepad. These were not Astrid's antidepressants or his mother's sedatives. His father was in robust health and took nothing but a multivitamin. Why was his father keeping meds in the workshop and not in the medicine cabinet in the house? He picked up another bottle and shook it, studying the tiny blue oblong pills. A shiver of unease rippled through him. His father must have procured these meds from Sawyer, as he did the fuel for the generator and gasoline for his vehicles. In exchange for what? For the years Horatio had looked the other way and allowed a parasite like Sawyer to gain a foothold and flourish unopposed? Or was his father in bed with something even worse? His anger didn't abate, but burned bright, turned incandescent. They were surrounded by wolves, escaped convicts on the hunt, killing and thieving with impunity, a murderer living amongst them, hiding in plain sight, and the Cote cartel, a threat looming ever closer. With a growl, he pounded the desk, feeling stymied at every turn due to the lack of communication, lack of transportation, lack of resources, lack, lack, lack. He kicked the office chair in frustration. The wheels squeaked. Next to the office chair, parallel scuff marks marred the shiny wood floor. Sawyer. He needed to confront Sawyer. 
Sawyer could tell him the truth about his father. He'd enjoy every second in the telling, but Sawyer had no reason to lie now. Jackson took a last look at the mysterious pill bottles and headed for the door. Chapter 42 Jackson Cross, Day 92 Jackson stood on the dock of Williams Landing on Grand Island, arms in the air, palms out in a show of surrender, a dozen rifles pointed at his chest. More armed men descended from the trail and exited the visitor station, weapons up and trained on Jackson. Two burly men stepped forward and frisked him roughly, then checked him for listening devices. Jackson recognized them from past arrests and surveillance. He spoke calmly. I'm unarmed. I'm alone. I'm here to talk to Sawyer. One of the men took a step back and spoke into his radio. Jackson waited, outwardly calm, but his heart juddered against his ribs, his palms damp. It was reckless to come alone, without weapons or backup. Eli would have his hide for it, so would Lena. Jackson needed answers, and he was determined to get them, despite the danger. He'd contacted Lena that morning about the prescription meds he'd found in the garage. She'd said, Tolteridine is an acetylcholine blocker. Acetylcholine blockers are prescribed for IBS, depression, heart disease, Parkinson's, and insomnia. Treatments with anticholinergic effects in the brain can cause memory disturbances, agitation, confusion, and delirium. And lorazepam is a benzodiazepine, a medication meant to treat anxiety and insomnia, but it has sedative qualities and can cause cognitive problems, especially if he was giving her very high dosages. They could cause symptoms of dementia. Her words had confirmed his worst suspicions. He'd thanked her, then promptly borrowed a fishing boat from the marina and rowed to Grand Island. A mere half mile from the Munising Marina, the island was buttressed and fortified. It was a citadel, set atop a 300-foot sandstone cliff, guarded by 200 hardened mercenaries, skilled ex-soldiers, and violent criminals. It was the middle of August. The heat wave had finally broken, and the day was a warm 75 degrees, the sun shining brilliant in the cobalt blue sky. Half a dozen yachts bobbed along the dock within the placid waters of Murray Bay. Something glinted high above him, along the cliffs of Wick Point, the gleam of sniper rifles. Sawyer had overwatch teams providing security 24-7, as if the plethora of weapons aimed at his head and chest wasn't enough. A minute later, James Sawyer emerged from a trail leading to the bluff and strode down the dock toward Jackson his movements languid and unhurried. Dressed in cargo shorts and a crisp button-down shirt, he was tall and muscular, his wavy hair sun-bleached, his tan skin weathered from years on the water. He halted on the dock, his hands hanging loosely at his sides, his posture straight but relaxed, a hard alertness in his blue-gray eyes. There was no depth in that gaze, no emotion, just a wary watchfulness like a wild animal hunting its prey. Sawyer didn't smile. Well, if it isn't the sheriff of Nottingham. Jackson met his icy gaze. Sawyer. Last time we met, it was under very different circumstances. Last time we met, you had snatched one of my men with the intent to torture and kill him. To be fair. You sent a rat into my organization. I deal with rats accordingly. Jackson thought of David Kepford, how Sawyer's men had slaughtered him, shot him in the back, and dumped his body somewhere they'd never find him. His hands fisted at his sides as he struggled to push down his anger, to hide the revulsion burning his insides. He longed to arrest Sawyer where he stood, slap handcuffs on him, and drag him to prison. He'd let him rot in a cell for the rest of his miserable life. Those times were over. He had to deal with the reality they faced now. 
Justice was elusive when society supposedly functioned. Now it threatened to slip forever out of his grasp. I took care of our little problem for you. Sawyer was referring to Cyrus Lee. He's probably at the bottom of the lake, wrapped in chains right now. I wouldn't know. Jackson clenched his jaw, tension radiating from his teeth to his temples. He was my suspect to arrest. You say potato, I say potato. He felt a dozen pairs of hard eyes on him. The gun barrels zeroed in on his torso from men and women who'd love to put a bullet between his eyes and call it a day. I'd feel more comfortable if your people would kindly lower their weapons. I'm no threat to them. Jackson knew better than to make demands. Sawyer was more amenable to requests that stroked his considerable ego. Please. No threat. At the moment. At the moment. Jackson readily agreed. Whatever makes you comfortable. Sawyer smiled without mirth and raised a hand. Two dozen rifles dropped into the low ready position. Itchy fingers moved from triggers, but barely. What do you want, Jackson? Sawyer said in a low voice that wouldn't carry to his men. I'm a very busy man. I've seen your handiwork. Overdoses are at a record high. Drug-induced suicides. Meth heads robbing innocent families for supplies to trade for more drugs. Sawyer offered his most innocent look. I've no idea what you mean. Yes, you do. Sawyer shrugged. Life is hell. Hypothetically, if people want to escape that hell, what's it to you or me? People have a right to choose how to live. Frankly, for every person that chooses not to pass go and collect $200, there are more resources to spare for you and me. For Lena, and for that kid you care so much about. You're destroying people's lives. Hypothetically, and I'm not doing anything. It'll kill them. They're dead men walking anyway the dregs of society. No one wants them. Let them go in a drug-induced haze. Everyone's better off. You're not stupid, Cross. You're stubborn and arrogant and infuriating, but you're not stupid. I know you see that. Jackson thought of Daniel, Scott Smith's son. They weren't better off. He was physically present, but they'd already lost him, and they knew it. Sawyer's countenance brightened. Do you need something to take the edge off? Pick your poison. I'd be happy to make a deal with the new sheriff. Off the record, of course, for old friends. Sawyer had grown up with Jackson and the others, but he'd never been part of the in crowd, although he'd brought the goods to all the parties, and he'd always wanted to be an insider. His father had been a narcotics trafficker serving as the distribution link between Detroit and organized crime in Quebec. When his father went to prison, Sawyer had taken over the business and transformed himself into a kingpin of the Upper Peninsula's criminal underworld. Anything Sawyer did for him would have a price tag. It always did. I'm not here to make a deal. Sawyer looked disappointed. Then why, pray tell, are you here? Seagulls soared and squawked above their heads. Clear jade green water lapped at the dock. Behind Sawyer, the island rose, verdant with dense forests of pine, spruce, beech, maple, and alder, impressive sandstone bluffs jutting into the lake. I'm here for my father. Hate to disappoint you, but he's not here. I have some questions. Answer them, and I'll leave. Sawyer's expression didn't change. You're not wearing a wire. This isn't a trap conjured up by the FBI. Does the FBI even still exist? Wait, don't tell me. I don't care. I just want the truth about my family. Sawyer's lip curled. Be careful what you wish for. 
Jackson decided to lead with the truth. My father drugged Dolores, and possibly Astrid, keeping them docile. He's using prescription drugs to artificially induce dementia in my mother. I believe she knows things he doesn't want getting out. I can say this with absolute certainty. Those meds didn't come from me. My father is dirty. Sawyer's eyes narrowed. I don't know a thing about that. Jackson put his suspicions into words. I already know, Sawyer. My father has been working with you for years, alerting you to surveillance, tipping you off to raids, and exerting his power to keep the heat off you. Even after he retired, he still held political sway over Underwood, the mayor, the DA, and the governor. He still held value for you. In exchange, you've kept him cozy with fuel for his generator, food, and whatever black market meds he needed. Sawyer didn't react, other than to flash a cunning smile. And in that smile, he confirmed everything Jackson needed to know. It wasn't evidence in a court of law, but it was enough. Jackson exhaled slowly. Acid stung the back of his throat. He wanted to puke. Clammy sweat broke out on his skin. He felt sick. Horatio had been corrupt from the beginning selling himself and his office to the highest bidder, all along pretending to be the champion of the moral high ground. How far did his father's corruption go? He tried not to show how rattled he felt, horrified and ashamed. Sawyer tilted his head, studying him for a moment like he was a bug beneath a magnifying glass. He took a step closer. Who your father is? And what he does is no concern of mine. As you know, I'm innocent of any wrongdoing. However, I do have something I'm sure you'd be interested in. Jackson went still. What is it? You'll owe me a favor, Sawyer said slyly. I don't owe you anything. We'll see, Jackson sighed. Tell me. I'm only throwing you this bone because we have a mutual enemy, you and I, whom I happen to despise more than you. Spit it out, Sawyer. Sawyer's eyes sparked with anger, but that anger wasn't directed at Jackson. Your good old papa switched sides. He found a bigger fish and went and suckled that teat. My network has informed me that he's snitching, providing information to our enemy. Jackson felt like he'd been sucked underwater. He couldn't breathe. The cartel. Sawyer snapped his fingers. Bingo. He didn't want to believe it, but there it was. The evidence, staring him in the face. The ham radio was the method Horatio used to communicate with the Cote cartel in the Sioux and beyond into Canada. How Horatio had warned them of the train ambush. Horatio had overheard Jackson and Devin speaking on the radio that day at the house. It was the only thing that made sense. There was no other leak. It was his father, in bed with brutal criminals. His father, who had ratted them out to the cartel. Anger burned through him. Outrage threatened to burst from his skin and incinerate his bones. He struggled to rein in his emotions, to stay in control of himself. Sawyer saw his fury and smiled. Ah, the truth stings, doesn't it? Jackson took a hard look at his nemesis. Sawyer could be deceiving him, but he didn't think so. Sawyer was also incensed that Horatio had betrayed him and was out for blood. Every answer he uncovered filled him with more questions. Why would his father jump ship on Sawyer when he had a good thing going, just to climb into bed with a worse criminal? Was that the reason? Horatio saw a chance to align himself with the most powerful entity in the region, and so he did. To betray Sawyer was no small thing. 
Sawyer had an army and extensive reach. He had eyes and ears everywhere. Almost everywhere. But the Cote Cartel represented a criminal enterprise the likes of which they had not yet seen. Rapidly consolidating power, growing exponentially, and spreading like cancer. There was something he was still missing. A piece to the puzzle not yet in place. I'm going to have to find your father, Jackson, Sawyer said. He knows I'm onto him. He's in the wind. I don't know where he is. I believe you, though I have my ideas about it. You think he's already with the cartel? Sawyer gave an insolent shrug. You know what I have to do. Jackson knew what Sawyer was insinuating how he liked to wrap his enemies in chains and throw them to the fish in the deepest depths of Superior, the water so cold that bodies remained preserved for decades down in the frigid depths. I'll find him first. Something shrewd and calculating flitted across Sawyer's face. May the best man win. Jackson spun on his heels and headed down the dock toward his little boat bobbing against the pilings. Don't shoot me in the back. That is not a war you want to start. Wouldn't dream of it. Sawyer paused. Oh, and Jackson. A foot from his boat, Jackson halted, his stomach in knots. He turned back toward Sawyer. He kept his posture relaxed, his voice nonchalant. Is there something else? I'm busy. Speaking of wars. You wouldn't happen to know the whereabouts of two of my loyal soldiers, would you? Jackson stilled, his heart pounding. He kept his expression neutral. Two could play this game. What are you talking about? I'm missing a couple of men. To be exact, one male, one female. They're fairly attached to each other. It's odd that they would both fail to show up for their duties two days running. Also, I'm coming up short on fuel and propane gas. Very odd, don't you think? I have no idea how you run things or what your people do or don't do, Sawyer. Because if you did know their whereabouts and you failed to tell me, it would be grounds for a war a war that you and your boy scouts would certainly lose, even with Eli Pope batting for your team. Duly noted, Jackson said. Neither man moved. Tension thrummed between them. Sawyer's men raised their weapons a fraction. Jackson didn't look at the guns surrounding him. He kept his gaze steady on Sawyer and didn't blink. Sawyer broke the stare first. He waved a hand dismissing Jackson. Don't ever say I didn't do favors for old friends. Jackson bit his tongue, stopping short of a snarky response. Sawyer still thought there was some connection between them, even after everything, and Jackson chose not to disabuse him of that notion. The Cote Cartel was a common enemy, and there might come a time when Alger County needed something from Sawyer. A placated Sawyer was something Jackson could work with, if necessary. He kept his true feelings to himself and forced a smile. We'll see about that. Sawyer grinned, but it failed to reach his eyes, which were flat and empty as a shark's. Like I said, be careful what you wish for. As Jackson departed, he half expected a bullet to the spine, but it never came. He was on the fishing boat rowing for the mainland when his radio crackled to life. It was Moreno. We've got something on Sykes. Chapter 43 Eli Pope, Day 92 Eli cursed. We just missed him. He stood in the center of the cavernous room, Jackson at his side. Moreno and Hart worked one side of the factory, while Devin and Chief McAllister took the opposite side. Nash was outside taking castings of the tire tracks. 
They stood in a paper mill factory off River Rock Road, 15 miles west of Munising and north of the hamlet of Chatham. A maze of machinery loomed above their heads. Huge pallets of paper were stacked higher than his head. He inhaled the scents of dust, ink, and paper. A couple of sleeping bags had been left in one corner behind one of the printing presses. Discarded trash wrappers from protein bars, bags of chips, and MREs were scattered everywhere. He inhaled the cheesy scent of Doritos, and his stomach growled. Toward the rear of the factory floor stood five truck bays. Scuffs and scrapes in the dust revealed where large objects had been moved recently, likely loaded through the bay into trucks or SUVs. One of the volunteer observation posts called it in, Jackson said. I put eyes on surveillance on as many associates of the convicts as I could track down and cover. This warehouse is owned by Jared Huffman, the uncle of Jacob Huffman, convicted of strangling his ex-girlfriend when she attempted to leave him. We didn't know about it until two days ago. I put two guys across the street, and last night, we hit pay dirt. They saw a bunch of SUVs entering through the back. They entered from the alley and cut the gate padlock. The factory is miles from town and out of radio range, even with the repeaters we've installed. It took hours for the volunteers to get back to town and alert us. By the time we arrived, the suspects had left. How many vehicles did they count? Four. Devin kicked at several candy wrappers strewn about with the toe of her boot. Looks like they've got plenty of food. Jackson walked around between the pallets, studying the scene and taking photographs with his phone. The cartel supplied Sykes with meds and weapons. No reason to think they wouldn't provide food as well. He bent behind a stack of pallets, retrieved something, and returned to Eli and Devin, holding it almost reverently on his palm. A Snickers bar, unopened and unsullied. Sweet, Devin breathed. I haven't had a candy bar in two months, maybe more. My mouth is already watering. Finders keepers, damn it. I'd give you my left pinky finger for two bites. That's Shiloh's favorite, Eli said. I know. Jackson tucked the candy bar into his pants pocket. I'll save it for her. Lucky dog, Devin grumbled. Moreno approached them from the factory side door. The tire tracks we found outside match the casts we took from the Fitch, Marlowe, and M28 crime scenes. No doubt this is Sykes. Was Sykes. Eli said in frustration. He's long gone. We'll set up more deer trail cameras and checkpoints on all roads leading to and from the paper mill, Jackson said. Too late, Eli said. They took everything but trash. They're not coming back. If I were Sykes, I'd move around too. Never stay too long in one place. Especially not a safe house connected to my old life that someone could track, as we did. Any hits on the cameras? Jackson asked Devin. Not yet. We're sending teams to check them every day. It's only a matter of time. Time we don't have, Eli said. Jackson spread out the map of forest roads on top of a crate of shipping packages. He traced red X's with his finger. The last three crime scenes were located west of Munising, including the paper mill. We'll concentrate our resources to the west. That's hundreds of thousands of acres of wilderness and thousands of miles of logging and forest roads, Devin said. What's even out there? Eli said, lots of old mines, campgrounds, caves, abandoned logging camps, and a few small townships. As good a place as any to get lost in. Once we sniff out his trail, we'll have him, Jackson said. Eli nodded, barely listening. The stitches itched incessantly. He resisted the urge to scratch through his bandages, which he changed twice a day after applying topical antibiotics. So far, he'd avoided infection, but the wounds hurt like hell and hampered his movements. He kept thinking of Lena. He could still taste her on his lips, smelled her vanilla-scented hair in his dreams, felt her arms around his waist, 
her heartbeat against his chest, the sound of her laugh ringing in his ears. She was more than he could have imagined. She was real, she was flawed, and she was everything he wanted. This woman, strong and sweet, tough and gentle, who believed in goodness, by some miracle, believed in him. Lena's encouragement had given him the strength and confidence to be a father to Shiloh. She and Shiloh had transformed his entire world in monumental, earth-shattering ways. He could never return to the small, shrunken life he'd lived, trapped within a prison of his own making. The thought of Sykes hurting Lena, or Shiloh, set his insides humming with rage. If anyone touched his daughter again, he would disembowel them with his bare hands. He would destroy the whole world before he allowed any harm to come to her. We need to set up listening posts, he said. We'll do things the old-fashioned way. How the FBI and DEA used to do, before GPS tracking. Show me where the deer cameras are. If they didn't catch anything last night, then we focus on the forest roads without cameras, as one of those logging roads was the most likely path they took out of here. Where's the nearest one from this location that's heading west? That's where we start. Jackson examined the map and then pointed. This one goes north to our train, before heading west, hugging the coast through Marquette. And this one here stays west, through the center of the UP, through Chatham into Marquette County before branching off in several directions near Gwyn, less than 50 miles southwest of Munising. You think he's holed up that far from Munising? Devin asked. With electric vehicles and a way to charge them, which he obviously has, then it's an hour's drive. Add some time for the rugged logging roads, but it's doable. I'll reconvene the task force, and we'll get the listening posts going tonight. Jackson turned to Devin and Moreno. Keep working the scene. They nodded and went back to work. Jackson hesitated, rubbing at his jaw. Dark circles ringed his eyes, a tightness around his mouth. He hadn't shaved in days, if not weeks. Eli's mind raced ahead to the task at hand. But he could tell when something was bothering Jackson. He always could. What is it? Jackson lowered his voice. It's my father. He's the one who ratted us out to the cartel. That's how they knew we were coming for the train. He overheard me on the radio and went straight to them. Anger roiled through Eli. Horatio Cross was an arrogant dirtbag, always had been. His son had nearly lost his life in the ambush. So had Eli, for that matter. An image of Sykes's sickening smile seared his mind. He felt himself drowning again. I'm sorry, Jackson said, stricken. Eli forced his rage down somewhere deep, inhaled a steadying breath, and steeled himself. Did you know? Of course not, but... Then you have nothing to be guilty for. Do you know how to reach him? He's gone. Probably fled to the protection of the cartel. What's done is done. Jackson shook his head in misery. I don't understand how he could do this. Put him out of your head, Jackson. He's been playing mind games with you since we were kids. He's getting to you, messing with your psyche, and he's not even here. Don't let him win. Jackson nodded. Yeah, you're right. I need to know that your head's on straight. Your people need you on top of your game. First we get Sykes and those meds. Then we'll worry about your damn father. A hint of a smile crossed Jackson's face. You said we just now. Eli could tell he was thinking about the old times, when it was just them, two lonely boys against the whole world. Eli scowled. Don't get sappy on me. We've got a whole bunch of bad guys to kill. Chapter 44, Shiloh Easton, Day 93. Shiloh scrunched up her nose. You want me to eat cattails? Gross. Marshland 
hot dogs, Lori corrected her. Most parts are edible. The root, called the rhizome, is crunchy and fresh, like celery. I slice up the tops when they're still green and use them in stir fries. The seed fuzz can be used as a fire starter. We can also dry the roots and grind them into flour or soak them to extract the starch. Sounds disgusting. I'll pass. If you're starving, you won't think so, Ruby said. Shiloh gave her the middle finger. Ruby only smiled. Lori led a small group along a trail through the property, pointing out edible plants and mushrooms, teaching them the best times to harvest each plant, what parts to eat, and how to cook them. Ruby and her mother, Michelle Carpenter, were visiting for the day. Michelle was considering moving to the Northwoods Inn. Two nights ago, their neighbors had been robbed at gunpoint. Lena had talked to Tim and Lori, who'd invited Michelle to check the place out. Lena took up the rear, taking photos with her phone, scribbling notes, and collecting specimens. Bear wandered after them, enthusiastically snuffling every plant, twig, blade of grass, and tree root, his tail wagging as he took in the spectacular scents of his new home. Bear looked relieved to have escaped the attentions of Faith, the goat, who was busy tormenting the chefs in the kitchen, determined to steal as much human food as she possibly could. Lori pointed to a carpet of wild violets growing in the shade of a huge oak. Use the whole plant, stem and flowers, in salads. Or you can crush them and make a honey violet cough syrup. They're high in vitamins A and C, and are antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and good for colds. She showed them nettle leaves and fiddlehead ferns, a swirly plant that tasted like asparagus, and mushrooms, cautiously distinguishing the edible from the poisonous ones. How do you know so much? Michelle asked. When we bought this place 20 years ago, we envisioned it as a thriving artist's colony, a retreat for writers and artists. One of our early writers was a prepper of sorts. He's the one who showed me how to forage in my backyard and showed us all the amazing things we could be doing with the property. We were inspired. We've tried to grow everything we needed from our land as much as possible, which is why we invested in goats and chickens, planted so many edible trees and bushes, and started hydroponics gardening. Things grew from there. I bought every book I could get my hands on that had to do with edible plants, foraging, homesteading, prepping, and homeopathic remedies. The books have proven to be invaluable. No one person can know or remember everything. Lena said, I think you're pretty close. Michelle stretched and rubbed her back. I like what you're doing here, Lori. I never imagined I'd want to join a commune, but here we are. Desperate times call for desperate measures, Shiloh quipped. Lori smiled, her eyes crinkling. I admit it. I never imagined this place as a post-apocalyptic stronghold. Shiloh liked the sound of that. Let a madman like Sykes try to infiltrate this fortress. They'd slaughter him. Eli would take him apart piece by piece and leave chunks of him for the crows and vultures to devour. Lori said, I think, as time goes by, that more and more folks will return to living in groups, like clans for protection and division of labor. It was how humanity survived for thousands of years. Many hands make our tasks not so burdensome. And while companionship won't end suffering, friendship lightens the load. Lena knelt next to a bunch of morel mushrooms, plucking several and adding them to the canvas satchel slung across her chest. She was too skinny, her jean shorts hanging from her hips, her face pale, circles smudging the skin beneath her eyes. Without enough insulin, Lena was fading more every day. Whenever Shiloh glimpsed her bruised fingertips, her guts nodded in apprehension. It worried her more than she could articulate. Eli had brought back enough for a few more weeks, but it wouldn't last. And then what? 
No one could answer that question. How many people can stay here? Lena asked. We've got about 150 residents, give or take, Lori said. I think we'll max out around 200, if we can scavenge enough supplies to build more cabins and dig another latrine. Any more, and you start getting clans within the larger clan, and divisions. Us versus them, more politics, plus the hygiene, sanitation, trash, and septic problems. Too many people, and it gets overwhelming. The only thing we know for certain is that change is inevitable. We pray, do our best, and leave the rest in God's hands. Wish we could leave the laundry in God's hands, Shiloh grumbled. Lori laughed. She had a kind laugh. It rang pure and sweet through the trees. Fine wrinkles crinkled at her eyes and mouth. Her cheeks were pink and plump, like the grandmothers in fairy tales. Everything about the brooks seemed too good to be true. Shiloh fisted her hands on her hips. Why are you so nice? You could keep this all for yourself. Most people would. If you weren't sharing electricity with so many people, you'd have enough to power everything. Hot water, the washing machine, and lights. Two reasons, Lori said. We could try to keep this place a secret, but... Someday, someone would find out. And then they would try to take what we have. If they had more people than we did, they would win. It's not ours if we can't keep it. We brought in others to help us protect ourselves and keep this place safe. We're stronger together, and that's the truth. It made sense to Shiloh. And the second reason? It's the right thing to do. I believe in God. I have faith, and faith means living out your beliefs. You have to live your faith, or else, what is it good for? Faith without good works is dead. Shiloh made a face. There's got to be a catch. No catch? I don't believe in that stuff. Lori's smile only broadened. You don't have to believe in anything, sweetie. No one here is going to push anything on you. I do believe there is meaning and purpose to life. Otherwise, why don't we just give up right now and end it? Life is too painful if it's all meaningless. I choose to believe I have a purpose. As humans on this earth, we're responsible for each other. Commitment and responsibility are a part of life. A good life. A purposeful life. Worth living. That goes whether we have laws electricity and a functional society, or we don't. Shiloh didn't know what she believed, but she knew the importance of family right down to her soul. She'd lost too much to take anything for granted, and she'd fight to the death to protect the people she cared about and the places worth keeping, like this one. Lori walked further along the trail and paused at a thicket with large green maple-shaped leaves and bright red berries. The thimbleberry is a delicacy of the UP. It's incredibly nutritious, a good source of vitamins A and C, plus potassium, calcium, and iron, and boosts the immune system. Lena raised her brows at Shiloh. And for those of you with a sweet tooth, thimbleberries make delicious jams and pies. Shiloh's mouth watered as she plucked a berry and popped it in her mouth the sour sweet juice bursting on her tongue. She tried to banish her anxiety and forced a smile she didn't feel, for Lena's sake. Now you're speaking my language. Chapter 45 Jackson Cross, Day 93 Jackson stood in the doorway to his mother's room. Rain rattled the roof and poured down the glass. Lightning lit up the darkened windows in pulses. Mom, are you awake? Dolores blinked blearily up at him from the bed. Jackson, is that you? Relief flared through him. It's me. You left me. 
I've been all alone. So alone. I'm here now. I'm right here. He helped his mother out of her nightgown, averting his gaze from her emaciated figure, and gave her a sponge bath. He brought in a bowl of warm water and rinsed out her hair, combing the brittle strands with his fingers. He talked to her, told her things would be okay, reminding her of memories and people and events she could no longer recall. His chest ached. How quickly her mind had retreated into a fathomless nothingness. It broke his heart. I won't leave again, Mom. I promise. If only he could carry her in his arms, deposit her in his truck, and whisk her to a hospital where nurses would dote on her, and the doctors would order a battery of tests and hook her up to machines to monitor her vital signs. The loss of modern medicine was devastating. Humanity had taken the miracle for granted. Now it was abruptly, ruthlessly gone. I need my pills, she mumbled. I can't sleep. I can't sleep without them. I know. I'll get them. He got her settled back in bed, fluffed the pillows, and lay her gently down. I love you, Mom. But his mother wasn't listening anymore. It was like she couldn't even hear him. Her shoulder blades were hunched inward like wings. Her silver hair was frazzled, her crepe skin loose around her jowls. She looked so incredibly frail. Jackson stayed with her, long into the night, listening to the rattle in her chest deepen, along with his fear. Chapter 46 Shiloh Easton, Day 94 Shiloh picked up her pace. I want to do security. Eli jogged beside her. That's a hard nope. Why not? You're a kid. That's not fair. Seems perfectly reasonable to me. Shiloh and Eli ran through the forest along the jogging trail that circled the perimeter of the Northwoods Inn property. The trail Eli ran daily, checking the perimeter's security measures, the sniper hides, and the patrols. I'm no little kid. She pumped her legs harder, dodging rocks and sidestepping roots snaking across the dirt path. I'm nearly 14. He halted, stopped right in the center of the trail, and stared down at her with a stunned expression. The realization dawned on his face. He didn't know her birthday. He looked guilty as hell. Shiloh harbored zero resentment toward him, but she wasn't beyond manipulating that guilt to get her way. Widening her eyes, she twisted her features to appear hurt. When, he swallowed, when is your birthday? September 16th. Her nose scrunched up as she worked out the days of the month in her head. That's only a few weeks away. He nodded soberly. I'll remember that. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't know. Shiloh took the moment of respite from their punishing run to grab her filtered bottle from her pack and guzzle several mouthfuls of lukewarm water. She wiped her mouth with the back of her arm. It hurts, Eli, down deep in my soul. A gaping wound I'm not sure I'll ever recover from. I'm gonna need years of therapy for this. Unfortunately, last I checked, the shrinks are all in hand-to-mouth survival mode like the rest of us. I'll look into it. You do that. She still called him Eli. Late at night, lying in bed with Bear snoring in her ear, she considered the options. Dad? Father? Daddy? Too babyish. What if he didn't like being called Dad? He'd lived his whole life without knowing he had a daughter. This was probably as weird for him as it was for her. Everything between them had gone awkward, as if they were feeling each other out all over again learning how this strange new relationship would take shape. He'd never been a father. She'd never had one. Neither knew how this was supposed to work. Keep running, Eli said gruffly. We've got to finish the circuit. Ten freaking miles, with a backpack. Eli was a cruel taskmaster. 
She took one last slurp from her water bottle and stuck it into a side pouch. Her stomach rumbled. She'd donate a kidney for a Snickers bar right now. His dark eyes glinted. Unless you're too tired. Eat my dust. She took off ahead of him, but there was no outrunning Eli. They jogged together side by side. Eli slowed his steady stride, his breaths even. Shiloh was small, but quick, her legs pistoning to keep up, gasping for breath like a dying fish. To be fair, they'd already pounded out seven miles today. Everyone was so busy, with Jackson and Eli constantly on the hunt to track down Sykes, that she seldom saw Eli unless she joined him on his runs. She despised running. It nearly killed her. But she was getting stronger, faster, and fitter. Either that, or she was about to give herself a hernia. Truth be told, it wasn't just the running. She was Eli Pope's daughter. She belonged to someone in a way she never had before. It was changing everything in ways she didn't quite understand yet. She'd never admit it out loud, but it was good. Everything about this father-daughter thing they were building together was good. Well, almost everything. How are things going at the inn? Eli asked awkwardly. Making friends? I managed to make it through the day without beating anyone with a chair, so I'd say my people skills are improving. Eli guffawed. She liked it when she could make him laugh. It was a rare event. When are we going to tan that black bear hide? I think I'll get more respect once I'm wearing it as my new apocalypse coat. It's going to jazz up my vibe, you know? Then I'll just need some leather chaps to complete the outfit. Shock and awe, baby. I get the shock part. I don't know about the awe, though. Eli increased his pace. When we have time. In case you haven't noticed, we've been busy trying to keep everybody from killing us. Shiloh worked harder to match him, the stitch in her side burning. Yeah, I've noticed. Which brings me right back to my security proposal. Too dangerous. You've been training me. I'm even better than you at the crossbow. Doesn't matter. Sure it does. You're not ready. That's a big load of BS. It's not like you've got elite tier one warriors manning your checkpoints and perimeter security, by the way. I caught Jason Anders falling asleep at the Northwest Post two days ago. And last night, I was out using the latrine, so I thought I'd check on the Southern Patrol team. Amanda Martz was smoking a cigarette, which blinds your night vision, right? Someone could have snuck up on her easy peasy. Shiloh looked up from the path ahead of her to sneak a glance at Eli. His profile was stern, as if etched from stone. His jaw clenched, mouth flat. He wasn't happy. Their sneakers thudded the packed dirt in rhythmic beats. Shiloh's pulse roared in her ears, her chest tight, her lungs bursting. You're letting Drew Stewart on the security team, and he's 16. He doesn't know his butt from his tail end when it comes to weapons. He's not that bad. Dude, he can't hit the broadside of a barn ten feet away. I was better than him when I was seven. Hell, I was better than him when I was in diapers. Eli grunted and ran faster, his long legs outpacing her. Shiloh's side ached, lactic acid building up in her muscles. It felt like she was dying. I have the skills. I'm just as good as them, and I'll get better. I said no. That's not fair. Why should you have any say? Just because you're, because you're my... Her voice trailed off. She halted in the middle of the trail, one hand pressed to her side, gasping. Hot tears stung her eyelids, and she blinked them back fiercely. You can't treat me any different. Eli stopped and turned around to face her. They stood three yards apart. He was barely winded. A sheen of sweat dotted his forehead. Like hell I can't. Birds twittered around them. Sunlight shifted through maple, beech, and elm trees, 
and violets sprouted in the shade on either side of the trail. Insects hummed. Two squirrels chased each other up the bark of a massive oak tree. Its branches arched across the trail above them in a thick green canopy. I've more than proven myself. I survived Boone. I survived the lighthouse attack. I killed the black bear. That jerkwad attacked me in the woods and I fought him off. Me, all by myself. She pounded her chest fiercely with her fist. I did that. You did, Eli admitted, like it was the hardest thing in the world. I'm sitting here, stuck and helpless, while people are dying, while Lena is sick and I can't do anything. Whenever she thought of Lena dying, the ground seemed to drop out from beneath her. A sob clawed up her throat, but she forced it back and pushed out the words. What was the point of everything I've done? If I can't do something that matters. Eli stared at her for a long minute in silence. I just found you, he said in a halting voice. I can't. I don't want to lose you. What about me? Don't I get a say? You and Jackson are out there risking everything. Maybe I can't bear to lose you either. Did you think about that? Did anyone think about that? The thing is that I already know how it works. I know it better than anyone. Death takes whoever it wants, whenever it wants. You can lose everything and think you can't possibly lose more. But you can. Her voice was a hoarse whisper. You can always lose more. Eli wiped sweat from his brow, his expression contorted. Shiloh, don't you dare patronize me. Not me. Not after everything. She squared her shoulders, straightened her spine, and stood tall in the middle of the trail. Trees towered above their heads, blocking out the sun. She breathed in the scent of pine needles, peat, and rich soil. Not me. He stared at her like she was a feral creature he'd discovered inside his house. He didn't know how to get close without getting scratched or bitten. She fisted her hands on her hips. I have the right to defend my home and my people. You can't take that away from me. You don't have the right to take that from me. I get to choose. A long moment passed. Finally, Eli's shoulders slumped in resignation. He didn't look happy, but he blew out a breath and gave her a reluctant nod. Okay. She stared at him. Okay, what? This is the deal, Eli said. I will give you security posts with the least chance of hostile contact. You will serve as a sentry. That's it. You will neither argue with me, nor will you complain. You will accept my orders without question. You will train with the security team every evening for two hours minimum, in addition to your other chores. Shiloh breathed deeply, her lungs expanding. She felt a lightness in her chest, spreading through her whole body. She stuck out her sweaty hand and offered her cheesiest grin. Deal. Chapter 47 Jackson Cross Day 100 Jackson squatted beside Gideon Crawford on a bed of pine needles beneath a tall jack pine, two yards into the trees lining the forest road. He breathed evenly, inhaling the scents of pine needles, damp earth, and moss. The night crouched low and dark over the trees. The sickle moon hung bright in the cloudless sky. The stars scattered in dense, sparkling layers, the Milky Way arcing overhead. A branch creaked above them. Alarmed, Gideon whipped around, reaching for his weapon. On his knees, he gripped the rifle with both hands, brought the stock to his shoulder, and peered wildly through the optical sights. Above their heads, a large shape burst into motion. Jackson's heart kicked in his chest. The large shape spread enormous wings and took flight. 
a great horned owl. The details blurred against the hazy green background of their NVGs. Large speckled wings beat the air as its head swiveled, glowing yellow eyes peering down at them for a moment, before it lifted its mantle of wings and flew up and away, a black silhouette against the bright stars. Gideon raised his rifle. Jackson reached out and shoved the barrel down toward the ground. What are you doing? What the hell was that? Gideon cried. Just an owl. Gideon lowered the rifle, chagrined. Sorry, he muttered. I'm on edge. Calm your nerves. Yeah, okay. Guess I'm more nervous than I thought. This is an observation post only, Jackson assured him. We use the gun only as a last resort, since the sound might alert anyone nearby to our presence. We won't be fighting. They won't even know we're here. Gideon nodded as he shifted his position dropping the rifle to his side. They wore dark clothing, their faces smeared with Eli's grease paint, and their exposed skin slathered in natural bug repellent to fend off mosquitoes. Their helmets with night vision goggles attached allowed them to see clearly at night. The forest shone an eerie, alien green. Jackson peered between the trunks of two powdery white birch trees at the road. Weeds sprouted in the center of the two-track dirt lane, with overgrown underbrush spreading into the trail. Overhead, leafy branches formed a dense canopy. Without the DNR, the wilderness was swiftly reclaiming the formerly groomed forest roads. Jackson and Gideon were positioned in a hide, a couple of hundred yards from the next intersection, where the forest road headed straight to the west, turned east, or curved in an S pattern to the north toward Marquette. They would remain at this listening post for the night, taking turns on watch. Four days ago, the motion-activated deer camera had captured several dark-colored SUVs driving this road headed west. Each night, they'd moved their listening post bit by bit, gradually zeroing in on Sykes's location. Once the SUVs passed a listening post, after they'd gone a safe distance ahead, the observers would walk or ride via bike a few miles until the next fork in the road, and then stop. The next night, the observers picked up at the new location, again following the SUVs at a safe distance until the next fork in the road, then stopped again. In this way, they were covertly trailing the convicts back to their hideout, cautious mile by cautious mile, night by night. They couldn't follow the SUVs by car, since any vehicle on the road would automatically arouse suspicion. The process was infuriatingly slow and painstaking, but if Sykes caught on, he would move again, and they would lose him. Gideon was antsy. He kept fidgeting, nervously clearing his throat and guzzling noisily from his water bottle. For a moment, Jackson wished he'd brought Devin instead. She was far better company but she was manning another listening post on a logging road ten miles south of their position. Besides, Jackson had chosen Gideon as his partner for a reason. The desire to capture Sykes consumed him, matching the compelling need to track down life-saving meds for Lena. But he hadn't forgotten about Lily's case, not for a single second. Jackson wasn't naive, Cold cases were extremely difficult to solve on a good day, and untangling a near-decade-old murder amid a worldwide disaster felt overwhelmingly futile, searching for that impossible needle in a haystack. The needle was out there. He knew it. He felt it. And he was certain the citizen volunteer crouched beside him was a liar. Jackson flipped up his goggles. The glowing green world vanished. In its place, the light of the full moon gilded the edges of things in pale glimmers. He blinked to adjust his eyes to the darkness. We need to talk, Gideon grunted. I'd rather not. I have a few questions to ask you about Lily Easton's case. Oh, hell no. It won't take long. You already caught the killer. 
he said the same thing he'd said to Astrid. We're closing out the case, tying up the last few loose strings. Jackson didn't mention Cyrus Lee Jefferson, or that he'd had an alibi for the murder. He didn't say that he suspected Gideon, but couldn't prove it. What does it matter if there's no court system? Everything matters. The law still matters. Someday the world will get glued back together, and then we'll have to answer for what we did in these hard times. I want to be able to testify that I did everything I could. Don't you? Everything's breaking down, including the law. Nothing is getting put back together. Jackson feared Gideon was right. Even if the next decade or two brought power and order back to the Northern Hemisphere, everything would be a chaotic mess and remain so for years. No one would remember who did what to survive, let alone collecting evidence and holding trials. But there was more to justice than courts and prisons. We don't have to lose our humanity, Jackson said quietly. That's up to us. Gideon's mouth thinned in anger. You brought me out here for this? I volunteered to protect my community, not subject myself to a pointless interrogation. I don't have to answer your questions. No, you don't. No one can make you. Frustration bubbled up inside him. He was sick and tired of being stymied at every turn. He paused, letting his words hang in the air. Seems like you'd want to help me find out what happened to the woman you professed to love. Gideon tensed, his hands balling into fists like he expected a fight and wouldn't back down. Emotion contorted his features. Was it guilt or something else? He didn't speak for a minute, as if struggling with his conscience, self-protection vying against the desire to do the right thing. He looked away and shrugged his broad shoulders. Whatever, ask your questions. Where were you that night, during midnight and 2 a.m., the time of the murder? My statement is in the file. It says you left the bar at 10 p.m. and went to Anna Grady's house, the mother of your dead fiancé, and you stayed until 11 p.m. You don't have an alibi for the time of the murder. Gideon deflated. I went to Anna Grady's that night because I was drunk, all right? I drove to her place drunk, and I drove home drunk. She'd agreed to be my sponsor at AA, but I couldn't stay sober for more than a month. Shame flared in his voice, his face. She'd tried to help me, for her daughter's sake, but it was too hard for her. I've spent the last eight years half-sauced, even at work. Is that what you want to hear? That I'm a louse? A self-flagellating loser who can't keep a relationship, who barely maintains my practice? That the only thing I look forward to in life is getting off work, coming home to an empty house, and drinking myself into a stupor? Now even that's been taken from me. Bitterness and regret flashed in the man's eyes. The tragedies in his life had carved wounds that never healed. It made him pitiable. It didn't make him innocent. Gideon scratched at a wormy scar that writhed across his collarbone and worked up the side of his neck. A scar from the accident that crippled Astrid. Jackson had seen him do it before, a nervous, instinctive gesture. The details of the accident were vague in Jackson's mind. He'd been in college when it happened, though he'd read the incident report. His father had been first on the scene at 3 a.m. in the slashing rain, the roads slick, gleaming with broken glass and twisted metal. What happened that night? The accident. Gideon rubbed the scars harder. I lost control in the rain on M28, went around a curve too fast and hit an oncoming vehicle. That's what people told me when I woke up in the hospital. I have no memory of it. Zilch. It's in your father's report. I've read it. The report is slim. It says hardly anything at all. Not my problem. The report says no one was at fault. Gideon's jaw stiffened in the moonlight, 
His right eye twitched. That's what it says. If there's something else, I'm listening. Gideon lowered his voice. It was a long time ago. I've moved on. Everyone has moved on. Part of him wanted to let well enough alone, but that wasn't the job. Things were niggling at him, strings and snags that led nowhere and unraveled the more he tugged. Sometimes the tapestry made no sense until you viewed it from a different angle. There was something here. He just didn't know what. He took a chance. Cyrus Lee Jefferson didn't kill Lily. He had an alibi. Someone else did. Someone we haven't found yet. Gideon flinched. His head jerked up and he stared at Jackson like a deer caught in the headlights. What? You heard me. Gideon's expression flattened. You think I did it? That's why you brought me out here. Jackson didn't deny it. He used the common tactic of identifying with the suspect, making them think you were on their side, that you were the same at heart. She was cheating on you. If it was me, I would have been furious, outraged and heartbroken, so upset I couldn't see straight. Gideon stared at him, bristling with resentment. Screw you. You went over there to confront her, and things got out of hand. It happens. No. No way. After I lost Allison in the car accident, I thought I'd never love anybody again. I loved Lily. I loved her with my whole heart. I would never have hurt her. Jackson said nothing. He let the silence stretch between them, let the tension build. Most suspects couldn't handle that silence. They needed to fill it with something, with nervous chatter, an unspooling rope of words that Jackson used to hang them. Gideon's eyes darkened. As I said before, I didn't know about her and Eli. And even if I had, I never would have laid a hand on her. I would have forgiven her. I loved her that much. We could have worked it out. Jackson didn't believe him. Gideon was lying. But about what? And why? And what did it have to do with Lily's death, if anything? Horatio was most certainly covering something up. But what was Gideon Crawford hiding? And for whom? It's in the past, Gideon said wearily. What does it matter? The past is never dead, Jackson said. The past is right here, right now. Just a few weeks ago, someone tried to kill Lily's daughter to shut her up. If I don't stop them, they might try again, and soon. If you didn't kill Lily, help me find who did. He saw when it happened, the dam breaking, the lies and deceptions crumbling, the man's whole body deflated. He exhaled like he'd been holding his breath for years. It's time, Gideon, Jackson said. In a defeated voice, Gideon said, It's time. Chapter 48 Jackson Cross, Day 100 Gideon met his gaze with dull eyes. Lily was there. I don't mean the night she was murdered. I mean before. The realization struck Jackson like a punch to the solar plexus. She was in the car. The night of the accident. Gideon nodded. We went out that night. Me, Lily, and Allison. Lily and Allison were good friends. It was raining so hard. The official accident report said it was a head-on collision between two cars. But Astrid's car was stopped dead on the road. The car just appeared out of nowhere, in our lane. She was in our lane. His voice choked. I didn't see the body until after. Jackson got that feeling, that little shiver at the back of his neck when the hunter catches the scent of his prey. He didn't move, didn't alter his facial expression or tone of voice. 
tell me about the body. Astrid, she, she'd hit something, someone. She hit a pedestrian. Who knew what he was doing on the side of the road at night in the rain? He had hiking gear, boots, a big pack with a tent and a sleeping bag. Like one of those guys who take eight months to hike the entire North Country Trail from North Dakota to New York. He was all torn up, broken bones poked out of his skin. His head was, it was bad. It had just happened. Astrid was still in her car, trying to figure out what to do, I guess. Not believing it was real. Hell, steam was still boiling from the hood. And then we came barreling around the curve and slammed right into her. When I stumbled out of the car, it was like a scene out of a nightmare. The headlights highlighted everything. Blood and, and glass were everywhere. Allison, she was, she was already dead. In the other car, Astrid was screaming and screaming. I had blood running down my temples. I could feel the blood, but I didn't feel the pain, not yet. I was going into shock. Lily was in the back seat. She had some bruises, but she was okay. At first, when I saw the body lying crumpled on the ground on the shoulder of the road, I thought it was us. I thought we hit him, and his body went flying across the road into the ditch. At that moment, I panicked. I knew how bad it was. This was going to ruin our lives. I told Lily to go, to run. She was five miles from home. You told her to flee a crime scene? I thought I was saving her. Okay, Jackson said. Okay. Once she was gone, I called 911, which goes through the sheriff's office. The car was mine, and it was wrecked. It wasn't like I could run. I'm sitting on the side of the road, sobbing. I know Allison is dead. I'm staring at the dead body of the hiker on the side of the road. I can't tear my eyes away, and that's when it dawns on me. Astrid hit him, not us. That's why her car was in our lane. There was blood on her bumper and grill, but the rain was washing it off, washing the evidence right off the road. Sheriff Cross pulls up and walks around for a minute. He calls an ambulance for his daughter, but he doesn't call for backup, not yet. He sees the beer cans in my car. He shines the flashlight in my face and makes me take a breathalyzer. Then he says, I have a choice. I'm drunk, he says. I didn't think I was drunk. Just buzzed, but I'm in shock. I'm terrified. I've got a concussion. What do I know? He says he can charge me with vehicular manslaughter and prosecute me to the fullest extent of the law and put me away for years. Decades, maybe. My future, gone. Gideon chewed his lower lip, staring at Jackson. Wariness on his face. Apprehension and maybe fear. This is your father we're talking about. I don't, I mean. I know about my father, Jackson said. Keep talking. The sheriff says, I can go to prison or I can make the smart choice. He'll report that he found me concussed and unconscious. The concussion is real. I'm feeling like my head's going to explode. He's going to take care of the beer in the car and make it all go away for me. I don't have to think about it ever again. I get my future back in a blink. Not Allison's future, but hey, we were drinking and driving. What the hell did we think would happen? Take the win, kid, he says. Take it and run. I did. Horatio covered it up. Gideon nodded miserably. And I let him. What happened then? I did what he said. The ambulance came. That's it. 
Had other deputies or officers arrived by the time you left? He shook his head. Just the sheriff. Another car was pulling up. It was unmarked. I remember seeing the headlights past the ambulance. Someone had helped get rid of the hiker. Perhaps someone known for wading bodies with chains and dumping them in Lake Superior. The lake so cold and deep, she never gave up her dead. Jackson recalled the missing hiker report around that time. A college kid from Wisconsin was taking a gap year to hike the 4,600-mile North Country Trail that spanned eight states, five in the Midwest, crossing nearly the entire width of the Upper Peninsula, through 550 miles of old-growth forest, rugged hills, spectacular waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There were lots of places to fall, to go missing permanently. He was seen at a Munising gas station. Authorities suspected he'd slipped and plunged from a steep bluff where the trail hugged the jagged superior coastline. The case was still considered open. The pieces fell into place, the picture gradually revealing itself, everything making a horrible sort of sense. Horatio had called in a huge favor. He'd been in debt to Sawyer ever since. And Lily? Jackson asked. Gideon rubbed his eyes and made a wounded sound in the back of his throat. She had seen the hiker, too. The sheriff didn't know she was in the car. I told her to keep her mouth shut, and it would be fine. Everything would be fine. She got pregnant with Cody soon after that. I asked her what good it would do to go to prison for telling the truth when she had a kid to take care of. We'd been drinking. We'd hit Astrid's car and crippled her. To out the sheriff was to out ourselves. The sheriff knew it. He knew I wouldn't talk. It ate me up inside, but I coped. Lily, though, it ate her up in a different way. It bonded us, the accident, losing Allison like that, and keeping that terrible secret. We grew close, and then we fell in love. I loved her, though she was haunted by her ghosts. Hell, we both were. Gideon shook his head, grief on his face, his eyes glassy with the pain of remembering. Years go by. Every once in a while she'd talk about telling the truth and coming clean. I told her she was crazy. She couldn't start telling people that Sheriff Cross had covered up a vehicular homicide to protect his daughter. I would lose my license and go to jail too. But she became more and more obsessed with it. Justice for Allison, she kept saying. We never would have gotten in the accident if Astrid hadn't hit that hiker. Gideon rubbed his eyes with his fists. Lily told me, the night before she died, that she was going to come clean, no matter the consequences. She couldn't live with it anymore. She was going to tell you, Jackson. Did she ever come to you? Jackson swallowed a fresh wave of grief. No, she didn't. She never got the chance, did she? Gideon shook his head angrily, in despair. I knew she was messing with bad stuff. Someone had gotten rid of that body that night. Someone powerful and dangerous. Your dad was the sheriff. He'd lose his job, go to prison, and be humiliated. His house of cards tumbling down. A man like that doesn't go down quietly, does he? No, he does not. It was silent for a few beats. Jackson said, you had almost as much to lose, Gideon. He lifted his head and met Jackson's gaze. His eyes were bloodshot, devastated, but clear. I did not kill her. I loved her. I would have married her in a heartbeat. If I'd stood by her instead of drowning myself in vodka, if I'd agreed to come clean with her, everything would be different. Harder to kill two people rather than just one, isn't it? I was a coward. I was a coward. And she's dead because of it. Believe me or don't. 
That's the brutal truth. Jackson did. He believed him. No one could blame Gideon Crawford more than he blamed himself. The man had revealed his worst sins. He had nothing left to hide. And after Lily was murdered? I thought. I thought it was Horatio at first. I was scared spitless. I thought the sheriff would frame me and kill two birds with one stone. The boyfriend is always the easy mark. Then Eli was arrested. It came out that Lily was cheating on me. They said he got jealous when he found out about me and flew into a murderous rage. You know the rest. Jackson stiffened. He knew far too well. You let the secret stay buried. Gideon swiped at his tired face and hunched his shoulders as if to ward off a blow. Yes, yes, I did. I was afraid and I was a coward. I thought I had suffered enough, but I had no idea. I had no idea. Jackson had no answer to that. Are you happy now? Gideon spat. No, Jackson said quietly. Not at all. Gideon scrubbed wetness from his eyes and cleared his throat. Do you think your father could have killed Lily? A shudder ran through him. If Lily had gone to confront Horatio at his home, his father would have lost everything. His illustrious career, his reputation, his family, and his freedom. Horatio had motive, means, and opportunity. I'm going to find out. Wh what's going to happen to me? Jackson looked at him, a man he'd known his entire life and barely recognized. Absolutely nothing. Gideon's features seemed to cave inward. He was hollowed out by pain, secrets, and guilt. All the years he'd spent in this town, helplessly watching Sheriff Cross shake hands with the governor, eat with the superintendent, win awards and accolades, while Gideon swallowed his dirty secret, the one his fiance died for, the one he despised himself for, the sordid truth he'd buried to save his skin. But it was half the truth, a piece of the truth, because something was still buried, rancid and rotting, and Horatio was somehow in the fetid center of it. Whatever it was, Jackson was going to dig it up. I never thought, Gideon started. Jackson heard something. He held a finger to his lips. Gideon nodded tightly. He strained his ears, listening hard. A sound reached them. It was different than the rustling and churring of the night creatures. It was a soft and sibilant purr. The rush of wind on a windless night. The whir of tires over dirt and grass. Jackson whispered, they're here. Chapter 49, Jackson Cross, Day 100. Jackson dropped to the ground and yanked Gideon down beside him. Through the trees, the first SUV flashed past, dark green through the NVGs and almost silent. A second SUV drove by, then a third and a fourth. Staying low on his belly, Jackson flipped his NVGs over his eyes and crept through the underbrush toward the road to get a clear view of the caravan. Gideon scrabbled up beside him, making too much noise. He was a gorilla, big and unwieldy. He scraped branches out of the way, shaking bushes, dragging the rifle in one hand. Stay quiet, Jackson hissed. Up ahead, the caravan of SUVs had reached the intersection. Instead of turning left, or right, or keeping straight, the lead vehicle halted. Brake lights gleamed like predatory eyes. Adrenaline shot through his veins. Less than a hundred yards separated them. A dozen armed thugs in four SUVs against two men with rifles. What are they doing? Gideon asked. I don't know. Why aren't they moving? 
I don't know. And then he did. The brake lights grew larger. The SUVs had reversed, heading backward, straight toward them. The occupants must have seen something, somehow, glimpsed the metallic gleam of Gideon's rifle barrel, or caught the unnatural rustle of bushes in the rearview mirror. Either way, they were screwed. Get behind cover! Jackson retreated, scrabbled low on his belly, and crawled rapidly behind the thick, two-foot diameter trunk of the jack pine. Staying low, he peeked around the trunk. Ten yards to his left, Gideon lurched behind a log and flattened himself into the depression beneath the fallen tree. On the forest road, the SUVs stopped directly in front of Jackson's hiding place. The windows of the SUV rolled down. Several wicked-looking gun barrels poked out. Alarmed, Jackson withdrew behind the pine, shrinking himself, rifle gripped in his hands and held vertically between his thighs. He was immensely grateful for the black clothes and grease paint. There were too many of them. Their only chance was to hide. Stay small, stay silent, and wait them out. If they didn't see anything, they would leave in a minute or two. No point in firing at them, which would only reveal his position. Fighting was a last resort. He stifled his breathing. Fear soured his stomach, his pulse a roar in his ears, too loud. He was certain they would hear it, would find him. Gunfire exploded. A cacophony of automatic gunfire split the night. Rounds smashed into the underbrush, shredding leaves and branches, and slammed into tree trunks. Several rounds pummeled the jack pine with powerful impacts. Bark splintered a foot from his skull. Jackson winced as slivers of bark struck his cheek. He held the rifle to his chest with clammy palms. Cold sweat popped out on his forehead. His ears rang, sound going fuzzy. A second wave of automatic fire stitched the trees. Pine needles and small twigs rained down upon Jackson's head. More rounds blasted the ground less than two feet to his right. Clods of dirt sprayed his legs. Gunfire cracked all around him. The jarring barrage vibrated in his teeth and his chest. As abruptly as it had started, the thunderous rat-a-tat of gunfire ceased. The night fell absolutely silent. One of the SUV's doors creaked open. A thud as a pair of boots hit the ground. Footsteps drew closer. Jackson sensed a figure standing at the shoulder of the dirt track, peering into the dense forest. He stopped breathing and pressed his spine against the base of the pine. Bark bit into his back and shoulders. The incessant buzzing of insects hushed. The woods had gone eerily still. His mouth was dry as a desert, his heart pounding, his sight narrowing with tunnel vision as panic bit at him. No matter how well he'd concealed himself, they only needed to traipse a few yards into the woods to discover him and Gideon. A deep voice broke the silence. You see anything? Nah, whatever it was is good and dead, said a second voice. Told you it was a deer, said a muffled voice, likely from inside the SUV. It wasn't a damn deer, the second voice snarled. I saw someone, I know I did. Like you said, it's dead now. You punched a dozen holes in anything living within a 50-yard radius. There was a moment of silence as the thugs considered their next move. Jackson heard the stifled anxiety in their voices. They didn't like the darkness, or the woods. They were far from thrilled at the thought of trolling through the forest in the middle of the night, looking for threats. No matter how skilled they were at moving with cover and concealment, there was the chance someone could get off a lucky round and put a bullet in your face. Even trained soldiers would hesitate to enter such hostile territory. These scumbags were brutal and violent, but far from trained. I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, man, a third voice whined. We're already late. Come on, let's roll. Another door slammed. Seconds later, the whir of tires followed. In near silence, the SUVs departed. 
Jackson closed his eyes for a moment in abject relief. His whole body was shaking. His jaw clenched so tight he thought his teeth might crack. He forced himself to crawl through the underbrush to the edge of the road, in time to watch the caravan of electric vehicles drive past the fork in the forest road and head straight. Moments later, the taillights vanished. Gideon, he called. There was no answer. He could barely hear his voice over the buzzing in his ears. His head rang like a struck bell. They were damn fortunate the thugs hadn't bothered to hunt their quarry down. He called Gideon's name again. Still nothing. Slinging his rifle over his shoulder, he pushed aside thorny thickets, branches clawing at him as he headed for the fallen log. The trees were clumped close together, blocking his view. Gideon, he whispered. Where are you? Still no answer. Jackson rounded the log. Gideon lay on the ground. He was on his right side, half curled in a fetal position, clutching his left leg with both hands. His rifle lay on the ground beneath a thicket of rhododendrons. Due to the wavelength of the night vision goggles aperture, the blood gushing through Gideon's clenched fingers looked almost translucent. Jackson sank to his knees beside him, aghast. He pushed the goggles up on his helmet. Blood spattered across the leaf litter and matted pine needles. The wet liquid glistened in the moonlight, black as tar. Gideon hissed out a breath. It hurts. Jackson called for help on the radio, but got only static. They didn't have repeaters out here in the boonies. Any backup was too far away. Jackson reached for the first aid kit. He had first aid training, but his skills were rusty. Nowhere near Eli's or Lena's. Gideon needed a skilled surgeon. He needed a hospital and a surgical team on call, ready and waiting. Gideon was panting, his breathing shallow, his pulse thready. His femoral artery was pierced. He could bleed out within minutes. Hold on, just hold on. Frantic, Jackson fumbled for a tourniquet, ripped the packaging with his teeth, and pulled it around Gideon's thigh a few inches above the gunshot wound, then buckled it and yanked the end strap to tighten it. He twisted the windlass rod to further tighten the tourniquet increasing pressure to stop the bleeding, then secured the rod with a strip of Velcro. You're gonna be okay, he said. Just breathe, keep breathing, and hold on. Don't let me die. I don't wanna die. Jackson needed to get him out of there, but Gideon was too injured to ride his bike. Jackson would have to ride within radio range of Devon, who would bring the diesel truck. They could put him in the back seat and drive him back to town like a bat out of hell. My, my stomach hurts. Jackson felt Gideon's torso and stomach and lifted his blood-soaked shirt. The darkness and Gideon's black clothing had obscured the wounds. Oil black liquid leaked from several holes that punctured Gideon's stomach below his belly button. Sour panic clawed at his throat. The bullets had most certainly shredded Gideon's internal organs. There was too much blood. Gideon's skin had gone cold and clammy. His breath came in shallow gasps, his pulse fast and weak. Even in the dark, Gideon's lips were tinged grayish blue. He was going into shock. Is, is it bad? Jackson swallowed his dismay. He tore bandages from the first aid kit and held them to the wounds. It was too late, already too late. We're going to get you back to the inn, and Lena will stitch you right up. You've got a few flesh wounds. You're going to be fine. Just hold on. Gideon grasped Jackson's arm with feeble fingers. I, I loved her. I should have done things different. Jackson checked his thready pulse. He could barely feel it. I believe you. Forgive me, Gideon begged, his voice hoarse. Please, forgive me. Jackson had no power to forgive Gideon of his demons, or anyone else, including himself. 
He'd brought Gideon here to grill him for answers, to pursue his own goals. Gideon had bravely faced his ghosts and spoken the truth, only to be shot for his courage. The terrible unfairness of it was incomprehensible. Please, Gideon mumbled. Jackson fought back bitter tears. If Lily were here, he knew what she would say. He hoped he did, for he had sins of his own to account for. Lily would forgive you, Gideon. She forgives you. Cicadas whirred in the underbrush. An owl hooted from somewhere nearby. Moonlight limbed the leaves of the oak tree spreading above them. Gideon's eyelids fluttered closed. He gasped, blood bubbling from his lips. Stay awake. Jackson leaned over him, desperately pressing the wadded bandage against the wound's gushing blood. It was no use. He squeezed Gideon's ice-cold hand. Stay with me. Come on. Gideon gurgled something Jackson couldn't make out. His eyes rolled into the back of his head. His chest went still. Distraught, Jackson sank back on his heels, his hands limp and useless in his lap. Gideon's blood was hot and slick on his palms. He wanted to scream at the heavens, to demand that God rewind time, take it back. This wasn't supposed to happen. This was his fault. Gideon's death was his fault. They were so close to catching Sykes. He was closer than ever to solving Lily's murder. Yet he'd never felt more lost and alone in his life. Chapter 50 Lena Easton, Day 102 I'm out of insulin, Lena said. No, Shiloh said, stricken. No. That's impossible. Jackson and Eli stood in the conference room next to the fireplace. She'd asked them to come, to tell them together so they'd know, so they could prepare. The wind whistled outside the windows, the glass syringes tinkling, the flames in the fireplace popping and crackling. Bear leaned against her leg and gave her a plaintive look, whining mournfully. Maybe he scented the sweetness of her breath and could somehow sense the dangerously rising sugar in her blood. Squaring her shoulders, one hand on the desk so the others wouldn't see her weakness, she faced the three people she loved most in the world and told them the truth. I don't understand, Shiloh said thickly. How can you be out so soon? You were supposed to have another month. Eli bought you another month. I've been sharing the insulin with Tracy and Kurt's little boy. They stared at her in shock as her words slowly sank in. Grief and anguish crossed their faces. Their pain made Lena's chest ache. How could you? Shiloh said in a wretched voice. How could you? It was my choice, not yours. Lena tried and failed to keep her voice even. She wanted to keep a brave front for Shiloh. I couldn't in good conscience keep it for myself. It wasn't fair. Fair? Who cares about fair? You'll die. Lena took a step toward her, her heart breaking with Shiloh's grief. I help people. It's what I do, who I am. Shiloh, I need to tell you. I don't accept it. Shiloh said, I don't. I love you with all my heart. Death won't change that. You promised, her voice broke. You promised you wouldn't leave. I'm not choosing to leave. I would never. But Shiloh was disconsolate. She fled the room and slammed the door behind her. Bear lowered his head and whimpered, nosing Lena's palm. Lena petted his head to soothe him with trembling fingers. I'm sorry, she whispered. I'm so sorry. I'll go after her, Jackson said. Lena nodded, fighting back tears. Thank you. Instead of leaving, Jackson went to her first and touched her shoulder. 
We're doing everything we can. We're closing in on Sykes and those meds. We're so close, Lena. Don't give up. I'm not. I won't. She looked at him, really looked at him, a faction squeezing her chest and tightening her throat. His face was haggard, his eyes haunted, a man pursued by ghosts. She knew Gideon Crawford had died with Jackson two nights ago. She knew how much he cared, how hard he fought for justice, the price he'd paid, and was still paying. I love you, you know, she said. You're the brother I never had. Jackson hugged her. You're the family I chose. She hugged him back. We chose each other. I'll be here for her, Jackson said. She needs you. You and Eli. Now more than ever. Lena pulled back to look into his face. I need you to find Lily's killer. You'll be there to see it. I probably won't, and you know that, Lena said softly. But I know you'll keep hunting. I know you'll find him, for Lily, but more importantly, for Shiloh, to keep her safe. Jackson swallowed hard. I will, Lena. I promise. He released her and headed after Shiloh, closing the door quietly behind him. Alone, Eli and Lena stood facing each other. Eli did not yell or lecture or rage. He stood like a man stunned into terrible stillness. I'm sorry, she started. Don't apologize. His voice was gruff, raw with pain. You don't ever have to apologize to me. Her face crumpled, her eyes filled with tears. She blinked rapidly. Fear strangled her lungs. No matter how strong she acted, the truth was, she was afraid, so afraid. I'm trying to be brave. I'm trying so hard. I don't think I'm doing a good job. You don't have to be brave for everyone else. You don't have to be brave at all. It's okay. Whatever you feel, it's okay. Words failed her completely. She didn't have to say anything out loud. He already knew. Eli opened his arms, and every fiber of her being longed to go to him. He kissed her through her tears, fiercely, desperately. He wrapped his arms around her drawing her into his warmth and his strength. So long as she was in his arms, she felt utterly safe. She sank into his embrace, pressed her cheek against his chest, and listened to his steady heartbeat. She loved this man, was in love with him, truly and madly, with every beat of her heart. It had taken the end of the world to find true love. How ironic. Tears coursed down her cheeks. Once they started, she couldn't stop them. He stroked her hair with tenderness. Her heart felt ripped out of her chest. I'm so scared. Me too, he said into her hair. They stood like that for a long time, holding each other, offering solace, a reprieve from the pain, from what they feared was coming. She murmured into his chest, her words muffled. I don't want to die. You won't. He spoke with conviction, but he was lying. No matter how hard he tried, no one could promise the impossible. He held her tight. Whatever happens, I'm right here. I'm here until the very end. Chapter 51 Shiloh Easton, Day 102 Shiloh sat with Jackson on a mossy log along the riverbank on the Northwoods property. Beside them, a waterfall spilled into the river. Crystal clear water rushed over mossy rocks and boulders. Birds twittered as small creatures rustled through the underbrush. Nature went on like nothing had happened, like the world hadn't cracked in half, as if Shiloh's heart wasn't shattering into pieces as she sat there, trembling and devastated. I'm here, if you want to talk, Jackson said. 
She didn't want to talk. She wanted to open her mouth and scream and scream and never stop. She wanted to kick, to punch, to hurt someone as badly as she hurt. You have to save her. We're doing everything we can, he said quietly. But you need to know. It might not be enough. She made a stricken sound in the back of her throat. She already knew. Of course she did. Lena would leave her like everyone else. She was going to die, and there was nothing Shiloh could do to stop it. The tidal waves of fury and sorrow nearly bowled her over and stole her breath from her lungs. Jackson leaned toward her, compassion in his expression, but his movements hesitant and unsure. Like he wanted to hug her, but she glared at him with such animosity that he pulled back and held his palms up in surrender as if she were a rabid dog. It's okay. Nothing's okay. Nothing's ever going to be okay. I know. I love her too. She's my best friend. She saw the suffering on his face and knew it was true. Jackson wasn't the bad guy. He'd gone above and beyond for her and Cody, more than anyone else. She tried to apologize, but the words sat on her tongue like a lump of clay. I know you're angry, heartbroken, and scared. So am I. What am I supposed to do? She whispered. Don't waste what time you have with her. Treasure every second. That's what I'm going to do. Shiloh swallowed the lump in her throat and nodded. I won't lie to you. The conversations you have with Lena over the next week or two might be the very last you'll have together. After she's gone, you won't be able to take it back. You won't be able to tell her I'm sorry or I love you. Please, don't let your last words with your aunt be like this. Her vision had gone blurry. She gazed up at the sunlight sifting through the leaves of the great oak, spreading its canopy above them. Insects whirred, mosquitoes and gnats and black flies. The tsunami of emotion threatening to drown her was almost too much to bear. Okay, she said, and meant it. I promise I'll make it up to her. Don't wait. I won't. She listened to the breeze stirring the leaves, the rustle of grass and buzzing grasshoppers, the burble of the waterfall spilling over moss-covered rocks, and steeled herself. I want to talk about my mom, about what happened. Jackson looked at her, startled. Now? Her nails dug into her palms. Yes, now. I, I was standing outside the door for a minute, trying to work up the courage to go back in. I heard what Lena said to you. She asked you to keep looking for my mother's killer. What if Lena... She swallowed the hitch in her throat. What if she dies without ever knowing the truth about her sister? That would be, it would be terrible. Yes, Jackson said, it would. And that guy who attacked me? I know everybody's worried that someone else might try to hurt me again, that whoever killed my mom was behind it. I can't do anything about insulin, but maybe I can do this. If there's something in my head that could help. He hesitated. Listen, Shiloh, it would be better if a child psychologist did this with you. That's what I've been waiting on. I went through the directory I had saved on the hard drive of my laptop and did a search for child therapists the sheriff's office has worked with in the past. I wanted to find someone with experience in childhood trauma and associated memory loss to help you relive your memories safely. I rode out to Manistique, Grand Marais, and Marquette, but I couldn't find anyone. So many people have left, headed downstate ahead of winter, or they never made it home during the solar flares. Plane crashes, car accidents, and people stranded with no way to get home. I'm sorry, I tried. I can't ask you to do this. I need to do this. Are you certain? Her fear tasted like battery acid in the back of her throat. Yes. Jackson looked unsure. I had a couple of assault cases, 
where I watched a therapist using techniques to help bring back repressed memories. She explained it to the district attorney while I was there. I'm far from qualified to do this with you, but if you're willing, so am I. She slumped forward on the log and rested her elbows on her knees, her head in her hands. She closed her eyes and thought of Cody, of her mother, of distant laughter, and of spinning in sunlight in strong arms. After that came the darkness, the screaming, the blood. Remembering felt like suffocating. Jackson leaned forward and grasped her arm. Shiloh, hey. She stared at him, wild-eyed. The ghosts were in her head, the darkness seeking her out. We don't have to do this. I'm, I'm okay. Concern wrinkled his brow. Shiloh, nothing is worth your well-being. Not even this. If you think I'm going to risk your psychological health for the sake of this case, you've got another thing coming. I care about you. I always have, from the moment you were born. She blinked back a sudden rush of tears. I know, she said thickly. I do know. And she did. The years he'd dropped by to check on her, brought her books and Snickers bars. After Boone had kidnapped her, Jackson hadn't given up. He'd cracked the case and brought Eli to save her. They'd both saved her. Why can't I remember everything? Because the trauma was overwhelming, annihilating even. Sometimes the only way to survive is for victims to leave their bodies, essentially. Complete dissociation, a total shutdown. It was too much for your mind to handle. So to protect itself, to protect you, your mind hid those memories from you. When something is unbearable, our brain finds a way to hide it from our conscious selves as self-protection. It's completely normal, Shiloh. You had a perfectly normal response to trauma, and you were a young child. That explained the blackouts, how she would fade in moments of extreme terror. The memories are still there. Somewhere, Jackson said. The body doesn't forget. If I have a clue inside my head, if I can finally know who took my mom away from me and Cody, if Lena can know before... Her voice cracked. She hated her emotions for betraying her, but she couldn't help it. Grief threatened to pull her under. Jackson nodded. We can stop at any time, understand? Let's just do it. Jackson took her back in time, slowly, gently, asking questions about her house, her bedroom, and her favorite stuffed animals, asking her to describe items in detail, her Paw Patrol sheets, the bedroom walls painted navy blue, not pink like her mom wanted, the Simba stuffed lion that slept with her every night. With a jolt, she remembered that Eli had gotten her Simba for her fifth birthday. It had smelled like him, woodsy, like pine needles and wood smoke, and she'd loved it. Even then, Eli had been a part of her life. Jackson took her through that night, the Paw Patrol episode she'd watched, the spaghetti they had for dinner. What woke you up that night? A strange sound. I don't know what it is. Thump, thump, thump. The horrible sound invaded her dreams, night after night. Then someone is screaming. It's mom, I know it's mom. I'm holding the covers so tight, I'm so scared. There's someone in the house. Mom's here, but somehow I know it's not her. The footsteps are heavy and halting. They don't sound like her. They're furtive, secretive. I sit up fast, scared my heart like a bird flapping out of my chest. I call out for my mom. The scream comes again. That's when I know it's not a dream. It's real. It's in the house. Her fingers dug into the log, nails clawing soft bark. Her breathing was shallow and ragged. She couldn't get enough oxygen, her muscles rigid. Everything rode close to the surface, memories sparking beneath her skin, the past touching the present. 
she closed her eyes and let the memories come as her surroundings faded. Then what? What is happening now? The thumping sound is getting louder. Someone's coming. Shiloh was breathing fast, almost hyperventilating. She trembled all over, her eyes stinging as the tears welled, unbidden. Where are you? What's happening? I'm trying to hide. I'm so scared. I'm cold. I may throw up. I'm trying not to cry. I want to scream for my mom, but I know something's wrong. A monster is in the house. A windigo. He's come here to devour me and my mom. I know it. I can feel it. Where are you? I scramble out of bed and slide down between the wall and the side of the bed. It's only a foot wide. I'm tiny and I can squeeze in. It's where I go when grandfather starts yelling and mom's not there. When mom is there, she stands between me and Cody and him. But he's not here tonight. It's me and mom and whatever is making her scream. Whatever is making those horrible noises. More sounds, bumps and scrapes, and a terrible, pained groaning. A muffled scream cut off in the middle, severed. And after, silence. Deafening silence. Someone's there. Someone's on the other side of the wall where I'm hiding. They're knocking on the wall like they know I'm there. Like they're saying, come out, come out, wherever you are. I don't move. I can't move. My body is locked up. I'm frozen. The darkness is coming for me. I'm so afraid, but the dark will take me. It promises to make the fear go away, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Where are you? What's happening? I'm crouched in my bedroom, huddled between the wall and the bed, trying to make myself small. Can you see over the bed? What do you see? He's looking in the doorway to my bedroom. I think he can see me. The nightlight is on. What do you hear? The thumping sound as he's walking into the room. Can you see his face? He's got a hoodie on. He's holding the hood around his face so I can't see any details. Shiloh stopped speaking, stopped breathing, and stared into space as back in her bedroom eight years earlier, she looked into the face of a monster. It felt like she was occupying two places at once, here with Jackson and there with the monster, in the same terrible moment. The fear like a hook lodged in her throat. Her heart thundered in her ears, vibrating through her chest. He's looking right back at me. In my dreams, it's a demon, with holes for eyes and a mouth. The face turns toward me, but it's a blur. No distinction, no details a smear of shadows beneath the hoodie. Then everything goes dark. I think I blacked out like I did at the salvage yard when Boone took Cody. What did you do next? Jackson asked gently. It's still dark in the house. I don't know how much time has passed, minutes or hours. I'm standing beside my mother's bed, shaking her arm, trying to get her to wake up, but she won't. Her limbs are strange. They're floppy, like a doll's. Her eyes are open, but they're staring up at the ceiling like they're not seeing anything. She can't hear me. The blankets are pushed off the bed, like when you have a nightmare and kick the covers off. She's not wearing any clothes. There's a glint of a necklace, but I've never seen it before. It's not hers. She's so beautiful, like a porcelain doll her dark hair splayed across the white satin pillow. But there's something very wrong. I can feel it. I put my hands on her face and call her name. There's slippery stuff on her skin. I can't see what it is. It's like black paint on my fingers, but I know it's not. I'm little, but I know. I knew it was the shadow, the windigo, the thing that invaded our house. Shiloh started to cry. Her body was shaking, shivering, and she was cold, so cold. Her bones frigid, her flesh made of ice that might crack at any moment. The tears came slowly at first, and then the dam broke, and she broke into deep, wrenching sobs. 
She's dead. She won't move. That, that monster killed her. She wrapped her arms around her rib cage and wept. She could see the blood so clearly. Her mom's lifeless stare. The glint of the necklace around her bruised throat. Jackson put his hand on Shiloh's shoulder. He scooted closer and drew her into him. I'm here, Shiloh. I'm here. We're here. You're sitting here with me. Open your eyes. You're right here. You're safe now. Shiloh opened her eyes, blinking blearily, and looked at Jackson as if from very far away, as if she had plunged a hundred leagues beneath the ocean and couldn't find her way back to the surface. She couldn't stop shuddering, her breath hitching in her chest. It's now, not back then. You're safe. You're safe now. Look at the grass. Look at the trees. And pay attention to your breathing. Start slowing your breathing, Shiloh. Listen to the waterfall. You're not in that house anymore. You're right here. Come back now. Anchorage, Madagascar, Brussels, Dubai, Istanbul, Hong Kong, Auckland. Shiloh mumbled the names of the places she desperately wanted to visit, but probably never would. The familiar litany gradually calmed her. The river returned, as did the burbling waterfall the blue sky, the trees, and the crumbly bark of the log beneath her. Then the dappled sunshine, the singing birds, the rustling meadow grass tickling her shins, and Jackson sitting beside her. Sniffling, she bit back the sobs, swallowed hard, and scrubbed the tears and snot from her face as the shuddering in her chest slowly subsided. She took deep, hitching breaths to steady herself. When he stopped in my room, he was deciding whether to kill me, too. I think so, yes. The killer didn't see me as a threat. He left me to spend the night in an empty house with my dead mother. He left me to find her like that, to see her after what he'd done. I should have done more. I should have recognized whoever it was and told the police told you. You survived. Your mind protected your fragile psyche the only way it could. There's no shame in that. Absolutely none. They were the same things she'd told Ruby over and over. Somehow it was easier to say it to someone else than to believe it yourself. It was strange the way people were hardest on themselves. You're stronger because of it. No, Shiloh said. It's not the trauma that makes you stronger. It's every day you get up after you've been knocked down. Every time you choose to keep fighting for one more hour, one more day. That's what makes you stronger. You're right. Jackson squeezed her shoulder again and kept his hand there, offering what comfort he could. This time, she didn't pull away. Chapter 52, Lena Easton, Day 103. Lena! Lena spun, holding her foraging bag across her chest with one hand and reaching instinctively for her pistol with the other. Her heart leaped into her chest. Tracy Tilton dashed toward her, breathless. I hoped you might be here at the lighthouse. The inn is so much further and there's no time. We're out of time. Her words came fast and jittery. The woman was hyperventilating, her face red with exertion and her blonde curls in disarray. Lena eased her hand off her pistol. What's wrong? Tracy's frantic gaze dropped to Bear, who was sniffing a butterfly perched on a mossy log with great interest. Shiloh said you do search and rescue, that your dog can find anyone. The long shadow of the lighthouse tower stretched toward the beach, where waves pounded the shoreline in lacy white plumes. The wind had picked up, shaking branches and rustling the leaves. Lena had slipped away for an hour to forage for wild cranberries, which she'd only found in the peaty soil in the bog near the lighthouse. The sour berries, 
budding from low-lying, trailing vines had begun to ripen in late August. Wild cranberries were high in antioxidants and lowered blood pressure, improved heart health, and prevented UTIs, among other things. Bear can find almost anyone, Lena said. Tracy, what is it? Tracy looked stricken. It's Keegan. We were hunting the ducks out by the Enchanted Cascades. There are so many of them, and they're used to being fed, so they come right up to you. We got turned around for a minute, and he was gone. He just vanished. We have to find him. Alarm flared through her. Lena glanced at the overcast sky. It was late afternoon. Heavy shadows slanted through the trees. They were losing precious daylight by the second. Clucking her tongue at bear, she headed for the driveway, calculating the distance in her head. It was ten miles or so, and four hours to sundown. Instinctively, she reached for her pump with her bruised fingers, before remembering that she had no pump and no remaining insulin. She hadn't checked her blood sugar numbers since this morning. Another painful prick to tell her what she already knew. Her number was too high and climbing. Tracy hurried after her. Lena stumbled, nearly losing her balance, but the woman didn't notice. Her focus was on her missing son. She ignored her pounding headache, her knotted stomach, and the constant ache of hunger. Thirst plagued her, no matter how often she drank. When was the last time he had an injection? This morning, around 10 a.m. His numbers were running high. He needs another dose. We have two left of the supply you gave us. A night in the forest alone will stress his system. Lena knew the dwindling odds. She knew how easy it was to disappear in a thousand miles of wilderness, to lose your way, trip over a root and sprain an ankle, slip and fall down a ravine, or wander in circles until one perished of exposure, or, in Keegan's case, slip into a coma and never wake up. A little boy was lost in the woods, with the dark of night approaching. He had no food, no insulin, glucose tabs, or pump, no tent, fire starter, or water filter, nothing he needed to survive a night in the wild. She reached the spot where she'd stashed her mountain bike behind a birch tree, her emergency medical first-in bag stored on the back. Next to her bike, a horse stood in the driveway, saddled and sweating. In her desperation to locate Lena, Tracy had run him hard. Tracy mounted the horse and clutched the reins. The horse shook its mane and snorted impatiently. Lena looked up at her. Do you have an item of his clothing that he's worn recently, yesterday or today? His handkerchief he always carries in his pocket. We found it on the trail. I put it in a paper bag. Please, Lena, I'm begging you. While she had strength left, she had no choice. She had risked herself to save Keegan's life once. If she failed him now, what was the point of her sacrifice? There was meaning in this. A purpose for their collective suffering. There had to be. If not us, then who? She asked Bear. Bear nudged her side, his entire rump wriggling with enthusiasm, his ears cocked in anticipation. He'd sensed the tension recognizing an adventure when he saw one. He loved Sar work. He was ready to go. He was always ready to go. Lena, Tracy said, please. Lena nodded tightly. White spots shimmered behind her eyes. She blinked them away and reached for her radio to call Jackson. She needed his help to organize a search party and find Keegan. The radio was dead. She pushed the buttons powered it off, then switched it back on, removed the batteries and replaced them, but still nothing. She checked her fanny pack where she kept a set of spare batteries and tried them. It still didn't work. Her heart sank into her stomach. She had no idea why it wasn't working or how to fix it. Tracy, do you have a radio? Tracy shook her head. That's why I was out searching for you. Lena hesitated, conflicted. She should not do this alone, not in the best of times, and certainly not ill, and not with a psychopath out there somewhere. She needed help. Eli would not want her to do this alone. But the radio was dead, 
and the inn was several miles in the opposite direction of Keegan's PLS, his point last seen. They had a few hours of daylight remaining. Once the sun sank, the odds of finding him alive plummeted. Lena made the split-second decision. Time was of the essence, and they needed to start the search as soon as possible. Once they reached the gift shop, she could send Tracy or Kurt after Jackson and Eli. That little boy was her priority now. She headed for the bike. I know a shortcut between here and the Enchanted Cascades. There's a groomed trail through the woods. It'll save us time, Tracy said. Hurry! Bear gave an excited woof and gazed up at her expectantly, his tail wagging his entire body. That's right, boy, Lena said. It's time to work. Chapter 53, Lena Easton, Day 103. Something was wrong. The singular thought blazed through Lena's brain as she approached the sign welcoming visitors to the Enchanted Cascades. The trail had cut through dense terrain and come out on Prospect Road, a short distance from the Enchanted Cascades. They followed the dirt road half a mile, passing a storage yard, a trailer park, and a big rusty building with a sign out front advertising Ronald's body shop. Everything was still and quiet. Once they'd hit the dirt road, Tracy rode ahead of her to meet Kurt. Lena biked as fast as she could, but her weakness slowed her down. Bear was a strong dog, but running long distances was hard on his joints. Endurance was more his thing, as was Lena's. Up ahead, a couple of horses were tied to a nearby tree. The Enchanted Cascades gift shop stood in the center of the clearing beyond. There was no sign of Tracy or her husband. It had rained last night. Hoof prints and tire tracks were evident on the muddy road leading to the gift shop. The tire tracks were fresh. That was odd. She'd barely seen a handful of working vehicles in weeks. A dozen yards from the gift shop parking lot, Lena halted in the middle of the drive, feet on the ground to balance the mountain bike. The hairs rose on the back of her neck. She was tempted to call out for the Tiltons, but something held her back. Eli's warning on situational awareness rang through her head. Something was off. The manicured garden surrounding the Enchanted Cascades gift shop had gone wild. The grass overgrown, the gift shop windows broken. She took in everything. The parking lot in front of her, a large pond filled with quacking ducks to her right, the thick woods to her left, and the dirt road behind her. The wind blew through the needles of the jack pines. Sugar maples and hemlocks scraped against each other, their leaves fluttering. The overcast sky was heavy with swollen clouds that blotted out the evening sun. It would rain again soon. Lena pulled the bike off the road and leaned it against a tree. Bear bounded up to her, panting hard. Uneasiness crawled beneath her skin. She reached for the pistol holstered on her hip and took an instinctive step backward, then another. Drawing her gun, she held it low, scanning everywhere for threats. Her instincts warned her to flee, to take the bike and run while she still could. It wasn't something she saw or smelled or heard. The air itself seemed wrong somehow. It felt wrong against her skin, heavier, denser. Why were there fresh vehicle tracks, but no cars or trucks in the parking lot? Why weren't the Tiltons outside waiting for her? What if the Tiltons were in trouble? Lena took a step backward. She should go get back up, get Jackson and Eli, and come back. The gift shop screen door slapped open. A man stepped out. He was barrel-chested, tall and broad. Prison-made tattoos writhed across his huge biceps. He grinned at her with flat, dead fish eyes. You know who I am, he said without preamble. His voice was soft and lilting, a trick to disarm you, to lure you in. Of course you do. Lena's mouth went bone dry. Her guts turned watery with terror, she raised the pistol. Stay back. I wouldn't if I were you, Darius Sykes said. Fire that gun and I'll put a bullet through your skull, said a gravelly voice behind her. 
Footsteps crunched as two men emerged from the trees and advanced on her from either side. To her right stood a skinny Hispanic gangbanger with tattooed tears that dripped down his angular cheeks. The man on her left was bald and muscular and covered in tattoos. They wore camo and gear like soldiers, with pistols and knives at their hips and long guns slung over their shoulders. They didn't move or act like soldiers, but henchmen. They trained AK-47s on her chest. Lena resisted the urge to recoil, to turn and flee. If she ran, a bullet to the spine would follow, or Sykes's thugs would chase her down and do even worse. Put the gun on the ground, Sykes ordered, or I'll cut off your head. Obediently, Lena dropped the gun. With numb fingers, she grasped Bear by the scruff and pulled him close to her side. She didn't doubt Sykes's threat. This man slayed women and children without conscience, a demon dressed in flesh and bone. She struggled to keep her voice steady. Where are Tracy and Kurt Tilton? I'm here for them. But I am here for you. He jutted his chin at the two men closing in on her. Meet Angel Flood and Jacob Huffman. They'll be your escorts. Angel moved in closer, within ten feet. Bear growled a warning low in his throat. Stay, Lena whispered frantically. The Newfoundland was a sweetheart, but he'd defended her from the black bear. He would defend her again, she had no doubt. This time, there were too many predators for one brave dog. Stay, boy. That thing's the size of a horse. The gangbanger lowered his AK-47 and pointed the muzzle at Bear. And dangerous. Terror shot through her veins. No, don't hurt him. Bear growled louder, a deep, menacing bass vibrating from his barrel chest. His black jowls pulled back over his teeth in a snarl. He's certified search and rescue. He's a teddy bear. He won't hurt anyone. Lena's words tumbled over each other in her desperation. Lady, that's no teddy bear, Huffman drawled. Growling, Bear swung his big head between the approaching thugs. His muscles bunched and strained beneath his fur as he barked furiously. The booming sound ricocheted through the trees. I hate dogs, Sykes said. Kill it. Bear, run, Lena shouted. Bear didn't run. He charged at Angel. Angel aimed at Bear and fired. The dog's hind legs collapsed. He let out a horrible yelp and tumbled to the ground. He lay on his side as blood dribbled from a gash along his haunches. No, Lena screamed and ran for Bear. Stop. Angel seized her from behind and jerked her backward. He shoved her to her knees on the ground. With his other hand, he aimed the gun at the dog. Lena didn't think, only reacted. She flung herself sideways at Angel. Shoulder first, she plowed into his side. The gun went off. The loud crack rang in her ears, dulling all sounds. You stupid slut! Something hard struck her in the back of her head. She fell onto her stomach, the breath knocked from her chest. Disoriented, she sucked in air her lungs screaming for oxygen that wouldn't come. Gasping and dizzy, she scrambled to her hands and knees. Bear, where was Bear? If they'd hurt him, or worse. Her mind stopped there. They'd shot Bear. They shot her dog. The round had gone wide. Bear was on his feet. Limping, he turned toward Lena, despite the men with guns trying to kill him. Run, she screamed. Run, bear. Somehow, some way, the Newfoundland seemed to understand. Bear turned tail and fled, trailing blood, but on his feet. Angel fired again, but he was too late. Bear disappeared between the trees, a fleeting shadow among deeper shadows in the lengthening twilight. Angel started after him. I'll finish it. No, you idiot, Sykes said. Who cares about a stupid animal? We have actual work to do. Bring her inside. 
Let's get this done. Chapter 54 Lena Easton, Day 103 The thug shoved Lena into the gift shop. The screen door squeaked shut behind them. Lena stumbled. Panic tasted like copper pennies in her mouth. Concern for Bear consumed her, but he was alive. He'd escaped. It was time to worry about herself now. Blinking back tears, she forced herself to focus, to think, to survive. The ransacked gift shop smelled of sandalwood and candle wax. Racks of t-shirts and hats had been knocked over. Shot glasses cracked, touristy mugs shattered, and ceramic figurines of bears, moose, and wolverines smashed. A few broken candles were on the floor, but most had likely been stolen to use for light. In the center of the gift shop, between racks of sunglasses, keychains, and mugs, three people knelt, their hands tied behind their backs. Tracy knelt beside Kurt and Keegan, who were both gagged. Huffman and Angel trained their rifles on the parents. Despite her fear, rage seared her chest. You! She choked out. I trusted you! Head bowed. Tracy made a despairing noise in the back of her throat. I sacrificed myself to save your son, and this is how you repay me? You led me straight into a trap. You catch on fast, Sykes said. Smart girl. You? For their son. That was the trade. They made the right choice, in my humble opinion. They get to live their merry lives, and I get to use you to annihilate Pope. Everyone wins, except you, sorry to say. They shot my dog, Lena spat, because of you. They would have killed my son, Tracy blubbered. She was sobbing, her chest heaving. I'm sorry. I'm so very sorry. Please forgive me. Lena opened her mouth, but nothing came out. Terror clotted her throat. Time seemed to slow, her thoughts sluggish, as if she was trapped in a vat of molasses. Panicked tears streamed down the woman's cheeks. She hadn't been touched. No bruising marred her face or arms. She didn't sport a busted lip or a black eye. Otherwise, Lena would have been alerted to the trap. Kurt Tilton hadn't been so lucky. His left eye was swollen shut, the blackish-purple color of eggplant. His lip was split, and his shirt torn and bloodied. He was in deep shock, his face blank with fear, his eyes glazed, expressionless, empty. Keegan sagged between his parents, his face slackened, low whimpers escaping his lips. A large knot swelled in the center of his forehead. Bruises marred his thin arms and his throat. They'd hurt him in front of his parents. The people they once were had ceased to be. Now they were paralyzed by shock, fear, and panic, rendered almost inhuman by terror. These people had betrayed her, lured her into a lethal trap, but they were caught within its savage jaws. She could not hate them. Let the boy go, she said. Let them all go. Sykes let out a displeased tsk. I thought you'd know better. The boy is a type 1 diabetic, and he needs immediate medical attention. He looks concussed. Sykes leaned in, his demeanor affecting the intimate tone of a close friend. It repulsed her. His smile was beatific, death itself grinning back at her. Stop worrying about everyone else and start worrying about yourself. What do you want? Although she knew, she already knew. They say revenge is a dish best served cold. I disagree. However, prison made certain objectives unattainable. The world being what it is, everything has changed. 
I will maim and slaughter my way to the top, as I always have. Not everything has changed. The powerful will still rule the weak. It's the way of things. This family has nothing to do with that. They're innocent. I needed them as bait. It worked. And I need you as bait for Eli Pope. Lena met his gaze and didn't blink, keeping her terror locked inside. I don't know who you're talking about. Sykes laughed. It was a high, sweet sound. It made her flesh crawl. I have little ears everywhere. Little birds I reward for their intel and loyalty. I know all about you and your romance with that traitorous scumbag. Unfortunate taste, my dear. We're old friends. I'm not in any... I'm not interested in debating facts, Sykes said coldly. I made a promise to Pope. I reiterated that promise on the train he tried to steal from me. He killed my men. That is unacceptable. He hurt the people I care about, so I hurt the people he cares about. It is simple, arithmetic. A beautiful equation. The terrible realization sank in slowly, then all at once. There was no escaping this. No way out but through. Let them go, and I'll go with you without a fight. I won't kick or bite. Sykes smiled again. Who says we don't like biting? A few of the convicts chuckled and leered at her. Lena felt sick. Her head was spinning. I like your spirit, girl, Sykes said. So I'll humor you. One of the three must die. I need a corpse to string up. Tracy moaned deep in her throat. Her eyes were wild and bloodshot, the tendons in her neck standing out like cords. She knelt, trembling and terrified, though she'd managed to move in front of her son, partially shielding him. Which one do you pick? Sykes asked. Lena blanched. What? You pick. Who dies? Who lives? The mother is the one who lured you here. Should I put a bullet through her cranium? Or her husband? Do you think he stood up for you or capitulated as soon as Angel put his hands on his precious little spawn? His words struck her like a sledgehammer to the gut. Nausea clawed at her stomach, her intestines twisted into knots. Cold sweat broke out on her brow. Her tongue felt like a dead slug in her mouth. I, I can't do that. Sykes gave a nonchalant shrug. Guess we'll shoot all three then. No. No? You're going to pick? Do it now. Sykes glanced at his watch as if bored. I'm a busy man. You have 30 seconds. Lena looked at the three of them in horror. The boy she'd saved, who would die without insulin. The mother who'd betrayed her. The father she barely knew. She smelled her own sour, panicked sweat. Her vision narrowed, her pulse loud in her ears. How could she make this impossible choice? How could anyone? I... I can't. Fine, shoot them all in the head. Angel raised his weapon. No, Lena gasped. Stop, I'll do it. Then do it. Everything in her resisted. But she knew the stakes. Knew she must make a choice or three lives would be lost rather than one. Sykes might kill them all anyway. Or he might not. Sykes liked games, but he did not bluff. She knew that much. Kurt squared his shoulders and lifted his head. Snot and tears smeared his face. He looked at her with the terror of a cornered animal, knowing it was about to die. Then his gaze cleared. He couldn't speak with the gag in his mouth, but he didn't need to. His eyes begged her, resigned, resolute, and she understood his request. 
You have five seconds or everyone dies, Sykes sang with glee. Lena met Kurt's tortured gaze and nodded. Her head weighed a thousand pounds. Save the mother. Save the boy. Sykes jerked his chin at Angel. You heard her. Lena longed to look away, but did not. She kept her eyes on Kurt as Angel stepped forward, placed the muzzle of his pistol against the back of the man's head, and pulled the trigger. A sharp crack split the air. Kurt toppled forward, face first. He lay motionless on the floor. Tracy moaned in despair. Keegan's dazed expression went slack. He didn't make a sound. It didn't seem real, but it was. It was real, all of it. The horror, the terror, and the blood. Two of Sykes's thugs yanked Curtis Tilton's limp body up by the arms and legs and lugged him from the gift shop like nothing more than a sack of trash. Blood streaked the floor, blood and other things. The air smelled like gunpowder and death. Sykes pulled his knife. Hang him from the flagpole out front. I want everyone to know this is my handiwork. Take the horses, they'll be useful. Everyone else, load up. And these two? Huffman pointed at Tracy and Keegan, cowering on the floor. Leave them. I'm a man of my word. When I want to be. What about this one? Angel asked. Get her to the storage depot and watch her. We need to make preparations before we let Pope know where she is. Don't say boo until I say so. Angel seized her by the arm. Lena struggled, attempting to wrench free, to kick him in the balls, scratch his eyes, or elbow his Adam's apple. Huffman stepped forward. He punched her hard in the face. There was a horrid crunching sound as her nose shattered. The explosion of pain was blinding. Her muscles turned to jelly. Her legs went limp, her vision going hazy. Rough hands lifted her into the air. As unconsciousness dropped over her like a black mantle, the last thing she heard was Sykes' silken voice as he leaned in close. Don't worry, darling. I'm gonna take special care of you. Chapter 55, Shiloh Easton, Day 103. Shiloh stood on the catwalk, ringing the lantern room at the top of the lighthouse tower. She had missed the lighthouse with a physical ache in her chest. The walls were constructed of floor-to-ceiling glass and offered spectacular 360-degree views. Her rock collection lined the sills, pudding stones, quartz, red jasper, black chert, Red and yellow agate, rare green stones, and euper stones, which glowed under UV lights. Next to the rocks sat the lockpick set Cody had given her. That morning, she and Eli had gone running together. He'd run ten miles without stopping. She'd made it eight miles this time. Afterward, they headed for the woods to check their snares, two rabbits and a raccoon, and then stopped at the lighthouse to weed the garden collect the ripe vegetables, and check on things. Eli had patrolled the perimeter of the property while she climbed the lighthouse tower to sweep up the shattered remains of the beacon. The generator was gone. The Fresnel lens was destroyed. She didn't know what to do about that. If they could get another beacon, they could convert it and maybe use an oil-fueled lantern, like in the old days. Fishermen and other small boats still operated along the jagged shores of Superior, so it was still important to keep the lighthouse functioning to guide boats to shore, to save them from wrecking against the shoals and rocks. The Great Lake was beautiful, yet cunning. She hid danger beneath her placid surface. Shiloh raised her face to the iron-gray sky. The wind tugged tendrils of hair free of her bun, whipping it around her face. Gulls squawked as they spiraled high, riding the currents. Her crossbow rested against the railing at her side. Lake Superior stretched as far as the eye could see, with endless emerald green water meeting the horizon in the distance. Along the shoreline, 
Great sandstone bluffs jutted like long, ragged fingers, layers of rock molded by centuries of glaciers. It felt like a different world up here, a world without brutality and death. But of course, that was an illusion. Her gaze was drawn to the canvas bag that held the harness and rope for an emergency descent. A month ago, she'd been stalked by a monster on this catwalk and had nearly died. Closing her eyes, she thought of Cody, of her mother and grandfather, of everything she'd lost and everything she might still lose. Grief left no physical mark. Losing Cody was like having her ribs cracked open and her heart carved from her chest, blood red and raw, still beating. Grief was trying to hold yourself together, cradling your internal organs in your hands, your lungs, your guts, and your pulsing heart. And Lena, if she lost Lena, she cringed at the thought of how she'd stormed out on her aunt like a petulant child. She needed to go to her, to apologize. It was pointless to be angry at someone who was dying. It wasn't fair to Lena. Shiloh had to grow the hell up, and she would, right now. If this was the end, Shiloh could hardly bear to think about it. But she had to. She had to face this, and Lena needed her. Something far below snagged her attention, some movement in the shadows beneath the trees. She squinted. It was bare. But that was odd, because he was supposed to be with Lena back at the inn. Shiloh slung the crossbow over her shoulder and returned to the lantern room, closing the door to the catwalk, then opened the hatch and descended the rickety spiral stairs quickly. Exiting the tower, she locked the door, pocketed the key, and whistled for Bear. The newfie moved with a clumsy, awkward gait as he loped across the meadow. Dark crimson matted his thick fur along his shoulder and front foreleg. It was spattered across his chest like paint. Not paint. It wasn't paint. With her heart in her throat, Shiloh looked beyond the dog, expecting to see Lena burst through the trees behind the Newfoundland. She didn't come. Eternal seconds passed, and still, Lena didn't come. A shot of liquid fear made Shiloh's scalp tingle, her throat constricted. There was no bear without Lena, and no Lena without bear, not unless bear was with Shiloh which he wasn't. Eli, she shouted in alarm as she sprinted across the meadow, the crossbow thudding against her spine. Overgrown weeds and nettles scratched at her shins, but she didn't care. The dog limped toward her, whining, his head down and his tail low. She knelt at his side. What happened? Who did this to you? Who hurt you? Where's Lena? Bear whimpered and pressed his immense weight against her almost knocking her over. Nettles and thorns stuck to his coat. Blood was everywhere. Aghast, she wrapped her arms around him, not too tightly, since she wasn't sure where he was hurt or how badly. It's okay now. It's going to be okay, she whispered into his floppy ear. He'll be okay. However, she knew no such thing. Rapid footsteps approached from the tree line. Eli dropped the snares and fell to one knee beside the girl and the dog, his body half turned to face the woods, rifle braced against his shoulder as he scanned the shadows between the trees, the barren beach, the woodshed, and the spring house. He's hurt, she said. Keep watch, in case whoever did this is following him. Shiloh leaped to her feet, crossbow in hand, a bolt strung and pulled taut. The buttstock nestled snugly against her shoulder her cheek pressed to the stock, with her dominant eye in line with the sight. With her trigger hand, she held the grip, her index finger balanced on the trigger, ready to fire at any threat that presented itself. Eli set the rifle within easy reach and examined Bear. With efficient fingers, he ran his hands across the dog's haunches, hind legs, spine, front legs, shoulders, neck, and head, parting the thick, blood-spattered fur to check for wounds. Shiloh forced herself to keep her attention on the woods, scanning for threats without daring to breathe. She didn't speak, afraid to interrupt Eli's concentration. 
Fury burned beneath her skin. Someone was going to pay for this. Whoever did this to Bear was going to die. She'd do it with her bare hands. Eli climbed to his feet and scooped the big dog into his arms. Bear was 150 pounds, but Eli held him easily and with tenderness. He started toward the cottage with sure, purposeful strides. Follow me, but cover our six. Shiloh obeyed, scanning left to right, then right to left, cutting up ten degrees and scanning again as she moved gingerly backward. Tell me how to help. Call Jackson and Devin on the radio. Tell them it's an emergency. Tell them to find Lena and that Bear has been shot. Shiloh made the call one-handed, contacting Devin, who promised to alert Jackson immediately, then raced ahead of Eli, checked the woods once more, shoved open the front door with her shoulder and darted inside. Slinging the crossbow to the coffee table, she spread a blanket on the sofa and lit a Coleman lantern as Eli laid the dog on the cushions. Kneeling beside him, Shiloh held the newfie still and whispered sweet nothings while Eli retrieved a razor from his cabin, then shaved the fur across Bear's right shoulder so they could see the wound. As if sensing the urgency of the task, Bear submitted to the humiliation with his head low, whining, his ears drooping. Shiloh's chest was too tight. She wanted to scream and cry and beat something with her fists, but she did none of those things. Eli mopped up the blood and irrigated the wound with a syringe of purified water. He pulled his IFAC from his vest and removed quick clot bandages, antiseptic, and antibiotic ointment. Shiloh watched as he tended to Bear's injuries, applied ointment, placed gauze over the jagged cut, and wrapped an ace bandage around the dog's chest and shoulder. He worked with intent focus, efficiency, and gentleness. His hands were skilled at violence, but they were much more. They were her father's hands. A lump rose in her throat. How bad is it? Fortunately, the bullet skimmed his shoulder blade. The wound is about a half inch deep and four inches long. I don't see any bone fragments or shredded tendons. The bullet nicked him and kept going. Another inch in either direction, and we'd be having a different conversation. The round partially tore the muscle, but it can heal. He's in pain, but nothing crucial was damaged. He'll need to take it easy to recover. He should see a veterinarian. I'm no doctor. Her concern for Bear abated, as another fear grew deep and wide as a pit beneath her. She stroked the Newfie's furry side, his chest rising and falling steadily, and met Eli's worried gaze. They were both thinking the same thing. What happened? Where the hell is Lena? At the sound of his mistress's name, Bear's tail thumped the cushions as he tilted his head and whined. He rose onto his belly and attempted to leap off the sofa. Eli restrained him. Whoa, boy, you need to stay right here and recover. Bear gazed up at them with forlorn brown eyes. He was trying to tell them the awful truth they already knew deep in their bones. Shaking, Shiloh climbed to her feet. Bear would never leave her, never. If he was shot, she left the terrible words unspoken. They knew, they both knew. Eli paced the narrow living room as he called Jackson on the radio. She's not at the inn, Jackson's voice crackled. We searched the place. Devin went to the carpenters and Anna Grady's place. She's not anywhere. Someone could have come to her for help, Shiloh said. She does that sometimes, goes to their house. She was supposed to report in if she did that, Eli said. She didn't. It could be Sykes, Jackson said. We have to find her, Eli choked out. Jackson said, I'll be right there. Eli clipped the radio to his belt and moved to the window, blading his body to peer through the glass, checking for threats. He radiated tension, ready to explode into violence. He glanced back at Shiloh. His coal black eyes mirrored her fear. Shiloh brought Bear a bowl and poured purified water from the jug she'd placed on the counter before they'd left. While he drank, 
Shiloh hurried into Lena's bedroom and returned a moment later, carrying a brown paper bag into which she'd placed one of Lena's shirts tossed in the dirty clothes pile. They'd brought few clothes to the inn, optimistic they'd soon return home. Bear perked up, his ears pricked. He clambered from the sofa to the floor, favoring the injured leg but on his feet, his tail wagging as he looked expectantly from Shiloh to Eli and back to Shiloh. Eli watched her. What are you doing? I have an idea. Bear can't. He can. We need the PLS, the point last seen. Bear can take us back there. Maybe he can track her scent. At least we can find where she was last. There will be clues, evidence. He could damage his shoulder further, possibly irreparably. I know, she said in a strangled voice, but she didn't back down. We have to. They stared at each other for a tense moment. Urgency crackled through the room. Eli nodded in reluctance. But how? Lena taught me. I've watched her do it. I can do it too. Bear will help me. Shiloh sank onto her knees in front of the Newfoundland. Bear licked her cheeks and chuffed into her ear, blowing hot doggy breath in her face. Love burned like a bright, hard spark in her chest. This is for Lena. For our Lena, okay? Her voice broke. I know you can find her. Take us to where she was last, and we can take it from there. You're so strong and so brave. I would never ask if it wasn't important. Bear chuffed, his tail wagging low in agreement. His head cocked, his chocolate brown eyes so expressive, so human, as if he could read her emotions and knew what she needed and why. And he would do it. For her, for Lena, he would gladly walk into the fire. Shiloh, this is dangerous. We don't know what we're facing. I can't let you. Do you know how to do this? She didn't take her gaze off Bear. How to handle a search and rescue dog? Do you know how to read him? What hand signals to give him? Because I do. I'm coming with you. Absolutely not. You said the lone wolf dies, Shiloh said. He stared at her. You told me once that the lone wolf dies. You made me promise not to run into a lion's den alone. She glared at him. You promised. You promised me back. She could see it in his eyes. He was conflicted, torn by doubt, worry, and fear. I can't lose you, Shiloh. And we can't lose Lena. Eli needed her. He could argue all he wanted, but he was wasting time. Besides, if he went off to play the hero, he'd be leaving her at the lighthouse alone. That wasn't an option either, and he knew it. He sighed. You do everything I say. No questions. Got it. Shiloh opened the bag and pulled out the unwashed shirt with two fingers, holding it to Bear's snout. This is Lena. You know her. You know this scent. We have to find Lena. Please take us to where she is. Bear sniffed the shirt, his entire body quivering with excitement. The dog chuffed, shaking his head back and forth, searching for the scent. Shiloh was his handler now. She gave the signal she'd seen Lena give him a dozen times. Time to work. Bear barked and loped for the door. Shiloh slung the crossbow over her shoulder and fell into step right behind him. With reluctance, Eli grabbed his HK-417 with one hand and followed them out as he radioed Jackson and Devon for backup. The Newfoundland wore no bright orange search and rescue vest. He shuffled with a painful limp, bedraggled and bloodied. But he was tenacious, unshakable, resolute. Bear had a job to do, to find the lost, to bring Lena home. Chapter 56 Shiloh Easton Day 103. They moved deeper into the Hiawatha National Forest. Bear took the lead, with Shiloh and Eli trailing him. Eli was a near silent shadow beside her, his weapon up, scanning left and right, ahead of and behind them. Shiloh watched Bear's tail, 
his hackles, his ears, and his mannerisms. Every reaction meant something, a clue to the unseen world he sensed, but humans couldn't, invisible currents of meaning leading them onward. Lena had explained how easily a scent could be lost, the constantly shifting air currents, how the scent could loop in on itself or pool into streams or ditches, funneling in the wrong direction, and how wind and humidity altered current patterns. On a hot day with no wind, the scent pooled without dispersing, limiting its range. Every few minutes, Bear paused and glanced over his bandaged shoulder with a pained expression. Even injured, he worked with tireless, unflagging dedication, oblivious to his discomfort. His limp worsened. Her heart felt split in two, with her fierce devotion to Bear pitted against her unrelenting love for Lena. For the first time in her life, the forest felt hostile. Though they mainly followed a trail, writhing roots tripped her feet. Lurking shadows played tricks on her weary eyes. Her boots skidded on damp leaves. She almost fell on her butt, but managed to keep upright by slamming into a pine tree. Thorny underbrush raked her right arm, drawing blood. Abruptly, Bear stiffened, his hackles raised, his tail sticking straight out. That was his alert signal. The woods hushed. The trees crouched and listening, waiting with bated breath. Adrenaline kicked her heart into overdrive. Fifty yards ahead, there was a wide break through the trees, an open circle of slate gray sky, a clearing. She glimpsed the roof of a building. In the distance, she heard a waterfall, the burble of water rushing over rock. Bear, come to me. She lifted a hand, palm out, to stop the dog from going farther. Bear alerted, she's here, or she was here. This must be where he was shot. Eli moved ahead of her, weapon up and swiveling. He stalked closer, half bent as he darted soundlessly from trunk to trunk, ducking beneath branches. As she watched, he seemed to fade into the background, almost invisible, melding as one with the forest, the dappled shadows. He didn't need to tell her what to do. Grasping Bear's collar, she scooted behind the massive nine-foot root ball of a fallen oak tree and quietly radioed Jackson their position, one hand on the dog to keep him still. Trepidation slithered up her spine. Who might be lurking inside the building, waiting for them to expose themselves? They had no clue what they might be walking into. A minute later, Eli returned and squatted next to her. He handed her his binoculars while he examined the scene through the optical scope of his rifle. Then he pointed to a spot past the root ball, which gave them a better vantage point, but still offered cover and concealment. Stay low and keep your head down. Belly flat on the soggy ground, she crawled alongside the huge log, frilled with some kind of white fungus, scraping over twigs, leaves, and pine needles until she reached a shallow depression in the ground. When she lowered her head, she could peer between the ground and the log without revealing her position. She raised the binoculars. A single-story building stood in the center of the clearing. It was a cabin, half log and half stone, with a red metal roof. They'd broached the rear of the property. She glimpsed overgrown weeds, a stone wishing well, a pond where ducks swam, quacking at each other, and a trail marked by a wooden sign. I recognize this place, the Enchanted Cascades. It's private land. There's a waterfall and gardens with a gift shop. It's mostly tourists who visit. Visited, I mean, without tourists. I bet it's been empty since the solar flares. Unlike most of the waterfalls on state land near Munising, the Enchanted Cascades was privately owned. One had to pay a fee to walk the gardens and visit the waterfall. There was no movement. Everything was still, quiet, and peaceful. Butterflies flitted above clumps of zinnias, marigolds, lilacs, and petunias in the gardens behind the gift shop. The scent of fennel and parsley filled her nostrils. A low moan echoed through the stillness. The sound was unmistakable. It was human, a human in tremendous pain. Bear's ears pricked. He raised his head, his tail thumping, but Shiloh pulled him back down. 
he obeyed with a miserable whimper. Shiloh went rigid. Someone is hurt in there. Could be bait to lure us in. Or they're dying while we wait. Panic seared her chest. Backup was still at least ten minutes out. It could be Lena. You have to do something. With one hand, Eli pulled a radio headset from his tactical pack and placed it on her head. Stay here. Keep Bear quiet and keep your head on a swivel. If you see anything, tell me immediately, like we've been training. Shiloh nodded soberly. She knew the risks, the stakes. He looked at her with a hesitant expression, as if he dreaded leaving her, as if this might be a very bad idea. She stared back at him, scared spitless, but rock steady. I've got this, Eli said. I'm going in. Chapter 57, Eli Pope, Day 103. Eli raised his HK-417, the stock braced against his shoulder, and peered through the scope. The cut on his forearm burned, but he hardly noticed. The compact Glock 19 he'd retrieved from his buried cache sat snug against his kidney, in an inside-the-waistband holster. He hated leaving Shiloh in the woods. He hated breaching the gift shop sans a team or backup. Hated rushing into danger without intel. Hated that Lena might be hurt, or worse. There were no resources at his disposal. No overwatch other than a 13-year-old girl. No thermal imaging cameras or listening devices. Not even a damn drone. He couldn't wait for Jackson and Devin. Not if Lena was hurt, maybe dying. Choking down his fear, he forced himself to steady his breathing and slow his heart rate. The familiar dead calm of battle settled over him. On high alert, Eli moved in. Half crouched, staying low and concealed within the tree line, he circled the perimeter, swiftly checking the gardens, the narrow stone paths, the pond and wishing well, and the little bridge that crossed the creek leading to the waterfall, scanning continuously for threats. His head on a swivel, he darted across fifty yards of open ground. The meadow droned with insects, grasshoppers whirring, hopping from stalks of drooping grass, and clouds of noceums swarming in the late afternoon sunlight. He reached the rear of the gift shop, ducked beneath the window, then rose and peered inside. An office and a bathroom, both empty. The store must be in the front. Blading his body, he moved along the right side of the building toward the front. The parking lot came into view ahead of him. A large, crimson puddle stained the asphalt. Spatters of blood marred the pitted surface. Another moan split the air, so distorted by pain that he couldn't tell if it was Lena. Cautious, Eli cut the front corner of the building, leading with his pistol. He stared up, in horror, at the flagpole. An American flag snapped in the wind. Not just a flag. Curtis Tilton sagged from the flagpole, with his chin lolling against his chest, his gray face slack. His flaccid corpse slowly twirled from the noose around his throat. Urgency crackled through him. Eli edged around the corner, sprinted to the front door, and kicked it in. Unlocked, the door burst inward at the first blow. Breaching the entry, he dropped to one knee to avoid head-on fire as he swept the room, slicing the pie with the HK-417. He took in the scene in a heartbeat. Graffiti scrawled across the log walls. Racks of trinkets toppled over. Folded t-shirts and mugs on shelves, plastic displays of keychains, pen knives, shot glasses, magnets, and piles of hats emblazoned with pure Michigan. In the center of the gift shop, Two people lay on the wood plank floor. One larger form was curled around a second smaller figure. The moans came from the small body curled into a fetal position, his mother's arms wrapped protectively around him. Swiftly, Eli cleared the building. He transmitted a message to Shiloh and told her to keep watch. Returning to the mother and child, he dropped to one knee, placed the rifle on its sling, and drew his Glock 19 setting it beside him within easy reach, before examining the victims for injuries. I'm a friendly, 
You're okay. You're safe now. The woman's pulse was strong, but frantic. He checked their breathing, skimming their bodies with his hands. They appeared to be uninjured, but for bruises and lacerations. The boy's pulse was strong, but his pallor was sickly, his lips purple, and his breathing labored. He'd managed to loosen the duct tape at his mouth enough to make those eerie, keening moans. He was in a near catatonic state, non-responsive. The woman rolled onto her back and stared at Eli in abject terror. Snot and tears slicked her face. Duct tape covered her mouth and bound her wrists behind her back, her legs taped at the ankles. Eli cut them both free. The woman turned her head and vomited. The sour, sick stench turned his stomach, but he ignored it. He'd smelled and seen much worse. Worse was outside, hanging from a flagpole. The woman bent over her son, murmuring his name, stroking his hair and his cheeks. He groaned, his eyelids fluttering, and curled into a tighter ball. She pulled him into her lap and held him, clutching his small body to her chest like she could ward off all enemies. What is your name? Eli asked. Tears gathered at her chin and dropped onto his pale face. T Tracy Tilton. Where is Lena? They, they took her. Eli couldn't breathe, couldn't get enough oxygen. Who are they? Her breaths came in hiccuping gasps, her words garbled with panic. That terrible monster. He took my son and my husband and tied them up. He, he held a gun to my son's head, said he'd torture him to death if I didn't do exactly what he said. I'm sorry. I'm so- Breathe. You're okay. You're safe, he said, with a calmness he did not feel. He wanted to shake her like a rag doll until she gave him answers. It took every ounce of self-control to hold back. Tell me what happened. She couldn't stop trembling. I went to get Lena and told her that my son was missing. I- I had to do it. I had no choice. He was waiting for her. Darius Sykes. She nodded miserably. He took her. Him and the awful men with him. Did they hurt her? They hit her a few times, but she was alive when they left with her. They put a hood over her head and tied her up. That man, he shot my husband in the head. I did everything they asked, and they still killed him. He's dead. I can't believe he's dead. Eli wasn't any good at comforting victims. All he could think of was Lena. Where did he take her? I, I don't know. What did he say? Tell me everything. He, he said it was a trap for you, that Lena was bait. He said, Things weren't ready yet, that you would know when it was time. How long ago did they leave? I don't know. How long? I'm not certain. My phone doesn't work anymore. The clock on the wall is broken. Guess. A couple of hours, maybe. Tracy hesitated. My son is diabetic. He's been without insulin for hours. There's a vial in my backpack behind the cashier's counter. Eli reared back on his heels. Your son is Keegan. She nodded wordlessly, frazzled curls falling into her face as she hunched over the boy. He curled into a tighter ball. His little chest rose and fell in shallow, hitching breaths. She stroked her son's slack cheek as if he could save her, could redeem her for the terrible things she'd done. His voice was an accusation. Lena shared the last of her insulin to keep him alive. Her swollen face flushed in shame. She did, and I, I repaid her by betraying her to save my son. And he, he. Her features contorted in despair, unable to say the words aloud. Her actions had doomed Lena, but hadn't saved her husband or her child, who would perish within days. 
Eli gritted his teeth, reining in his frustration, his fury, trying to be mindful of the trauma this woman had endured. The grief and guilt would haunt her for the rest of her life. He tried not to hate her for betraying Lena, but he did. He despised her for it. Jackson's voice came through the radio. We're outside. Eli didn't say a word. He rose to his feet, holstered his Glock 19, and stalked for the door. I'm sorry, the woman shouted at his back. Please, please understand. I'm sorry. He couldn't give her what she begged for. He couldn't even give it to himself. He had no pity left in him. His only thought was for Lena, for the seemingly impossible task ahead. Outside, dusk had fallen. Heavy iron-gray clouds gathered as a menacing wall of darkness on the horizon. A half-dozen deputies and cops had arrived on bicycles, horses, and ATVs. Nash set up a crime scene perimeter, while Moreno and Hart worked on the corpse strung on the flagpole a dozen yards from Devon and Jackson, who was bent over a set of tire tracks in the dirt driveway. Nix and Antoine were out searching for Sykes, following potential escape routes. Bear circled Devon, limping, but intently searching for Lena's scent, sniffing at the ground with anxious barks. Shiloh ran up the drive toward him. Where is she? He steeled himself. She's not here. Fear etched her face. They took her. The men who did that. She pointed a shaking finger at the body hanging from the flagpole. It's him. It's Sykes. He couldn't lie to her. Yes. Her pupils dilated. She screamed, a high, keening wail of fury and grief. She came at him in a distraught frenzy, pummeling her fists against his chest. He seized her wrists, gently, with one hand. She tried to rip away, but he pulled her close and hugged her against his chest, her heart thudding wildly against his ribs. I'm sorry, he said into her hair. I'm so sorry. You have to save her. She can't die. You have to find her. A terrible powerlessness swept over him. Sykes had Lena, and he would do terrible things to her until Eli came and did as Sykes wanted, which was to die slowly and in agony, while Lena was tortured to death in front of him. His thoughts spun in a frantic blur, his heart racing, his palms clammy with dread. How could he save her and keep everyone else safe? He did not know. Eli held his daughter as his heart shattered into a thousand pieces. Chapter 58 Eli Pope, Day 103 Eli stood with Jackson and Devin half a mile from the Enchanted Cascades gift shop. Bear had tracked his mistress to the paved road before losing the scent for good. The SUVs had headed west. Eli fought the urge to shoot something, or someone, in frustration. Luckily, Sykes didn't know about Shiloh, or he would have taken her too. His chest seized at the thought of losing Shiloh, of losing Lena, who was already halfway gone, slipping through his grasp. He knew the madman who held Lena captive, what that madman would do to her, might already be doing to her. The mere thought of Sykes set his blood on fire. He wanted Sykes, longed to hunt him down like an animal, to put a bullet in his temple, or worse, much worse. God help him, he wouldn't be able to hold back. He didn't want to. Nash had taken Tracy and her son to the inn, along with Shiloh, who'd gone kicking and screaming, but she'd gone. Moreno and Hart had dealt with the corpse. They would bury him in the cemetery next to Gideon Crawford. McAllister and several others continued to work the scene. They'd taken casts of the tire tracks and matched them to the other crime scenes. Jackson seemed deflated, shrunken somehow by stress, fear, and worry. We lost a third of our citizen volunteers after they heard Gideon was killed on watch. We don't have enough manpower. 
I reached out to the state police with the ham radio for backup, but they've left the UP under the governor's orders. They've lost more than half their workforce. The remaining officers are trying desperately to bring order to the chaos in Detroit, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, and all the other major population centers. Devin took the map of the DNR forest roads from her pack and spread it out on a boulder set along the shoulder of the road. There are still dozens of potential storage depot locations within a hundred mile radius of our last listening post location. Mines, logging camps, etc. If you add campsites, Devin waved her hand across the map. There are still too many sites to check, at least quickly. With the lack of boots on the ground and limited fuel for vehicles, it'll take days. Eli studied the map. Once it's daylight, we can get the drone up and start searching the closest campsites for signs of recent movement. Include the abandoned nickel and copper mines west of Gwyn. It'll be more efficient than checking them in person and we'll use less fuel. He pointed at the spot on the map where the last listening post had tracked Sykes's SUVs. The forest road splits into several off-road tracks throughout the wilderness northwest of Princeton and spreads into Tilden and Richmond townships, west of Highway 35 and heading northwest. I don't think he'll have holed up much farther than this range here, maybe a 20-mile radius. It's almost dark, Devin said. The SUV is likely headed straight back to their hidey hole, which means they probably won't pass a listening post tonight. We'll do it anyway just in case, Eli said, though she was likely correct. So far, Sykes hadn't attacked multiple locations in a single day. Jackson's mouth thinned into a bloodless line. I bet my father knows where they're storing the meds before they offload them. Sykes could be there. Eli shot him a questioning look. Where is your father? He knew I was on to him. He took off. He's in the wind. Jackson stared down the empty road fringed with trees, where shapes gradually merged, outlines in the gathering dark. In the twilight, his face was a pale, ghostly oval. I will find him. Somehow, all roads seem to lead back to the same place. Jackson swayed on his feet. He flailed his arms, then grasped Devin's arm to keep from falling. Hey, you okay? Devin asked. Fine. The blood had drained from his face. He swiped blearily at his glassy eyes. I'm fine. Eli studied him. Deep circles ringed his eyes, his skin gray with fatigue. Losing Gideon Crawford, and in such a brutal manner, had shaken him. He looked like he had one foot in the grave. When was the last time you slept? Jackson shrugged, chagrined. I've. I don't know. As a ranger, Eli had trained to go days with little to no sleep. Back then, he'd had pills to help him. He had nothing now, but he could push himself beyond a normal man's endurance. Jackson couldn't. You need rest. Go back to the inn, get some sleep, and we'll start fresh in the morning. No, no way. Not with Lena out there. You're a liability right now. Eli said firmly. It'll be pitch black in ten minutes. We can't use the drone in the dark. Moreno and Hart will man the listening post tonight. Not that it will do any good. Go home, Jackson. What are you going to do? Eli studied the map again, a line between his brows. I have an idea. I'll help you, Jackson insisted. Eli shook his head. For this, I work alone. Chapter 59, Eli Pope, Day 104. Eli was closing in on Sykes. One more bearing on his map, and he'd be close to an approximate location. He had traveled to the last known position on his ATV. Hiding the four-wheeler within some scrub brush, he'd covered it with his ghillie blanket and pine branches. Now he moved forward on foot to practice noise discipline. Outfitted in tactical gear, he wore his chest rig and battle belt, his rifle slung across his chest. The night vision goggles were pulled down over his eyes, casting the world in green. 
In one hand, he carried the map. In the other, he held a strange contraption, a homemade directional antenna he'd built, using salvaged supplies he and Shiloh had scavenged from the local hardware store, abandoned garages and sheds, and Amos Easton's salvage yard. The antenna consisted of several lengths of PVC pipe. It had four measuring tape arms cut at specific lengths that were attached to the PVC pipe body, with stainless steel hose clamps, a coaxial cable, and a receiver with an S-meter. The antenna he'd built was rudimentary, but it worked. In this way, he could pinpoint directional signals. An hour ago, he'd picked up a transmission. Attempting to get compass readings, which gave him bearings from different places in the woods in the middle of the night, was proving to be a difficult task. He'd been forced to keep to the logging roads, since it was impossible to wade through the dense forest, carrying a six-foot-tall antenna. Homing in on the source of the transmission, Eli had already taken a good compass bearing on an intercepted radio call, so he could plot the bearing accurately on his map. Where the lines crossed would triangulate the origin of the transmission. Hopefully, Sykes' hideout, or at least a location nearby. He needed a good second bearing from a new position, some distance from the first, so that the lines would cross on his map and give him a reasonably accurate location. Unless he got a good third bearing, his result wouldn't be very accurate. He also didn't know whether the radio transmissions he was intercepting were from people traveling toward the hideout, away from it, or from there. He was quite certain about his position when he took his first bearing. He was less certain about his exact position since then. Of course, all that assumed he'd plotted each bearing accurately on his map. He'd just managed to mark the second bearing when the signal died. As if Sykes could sense his pursuer, the radio traffic went abruptly silent. For a long time, he waited, but he couldn't hear any more. Was Sykes smart enough to practice MCON, radio silence? Or was something else at play? It was late at night, well after midnight. Whoever was communicating via radio may have gone to sleep, though he assumed patrols would remain in contact throughout the night. Thick cloud cover obscured the moon and stars. Insects whirred, the night creatures stirring deep in the trees. He stopped at the side of an off-road track, ready to dart into the trees if he sensed any vehicles nearby. Weeds and thorns snagging his shins, he studied the map again. Within five to seven miles, he counted too many potential locations. Three campsites, a Christian youth camp, a regional airport, Cal's rustic log cabins, the abandoned Eagle Falls copper mine, and half a dozen caves known for their large brown bat populations. Exhaustion pulled at his limbs. Though his other wounds had mostly healed over the last two weeks, the laceration on his arm burned like someone had poured acid on his skin. Holding the antenna for hours had overworked the torn muscles. Pocketing the map, he rested the PVC pipe contraption on the ground and leaned against the rough bark of a pine tree, inhaling the sweetness of the sap in the cracks, breathing through his fear, pain, and frustration. As much as he wanted to, it was too difficult to continue. As soon as the sun rose, Eli would be back at it. He needed that third triangulation point to narrow down the target area. One more day, at the most, and Eli would have him. He prayed that Lena could hold out for that long. She might go into a diabetic coma without Sykes laying a hand on her. Time was running out. He touched the St. Michael's medallion beneath his shirt and prayed like never before. He prayed to whatever supernatural power existed, to God, to the great spirit of his Native American ancestors, to whatever benevolent force up there might still care what happened down here on this cursed planet. Help me save her. Chapter 60, Jackson Cross, Day 104. Jackson sat in his chair, defeat curving his spine, his shoulders slumped. 
The Coleman lantern cast long shadows across the desk in his room at the Northwoods Inn. The air was still and stifling. It was midnight. He was utterly drained and bone tired. His eyes were gritty, his mind fuzzy with fatigue. But sleep eluded him. Earlier, Lori Brooks had brought over a plastic container of chili soup that now sat on his dresser, untouched. I'm so sorry, honey, she'd said, tears in her eyes. We love Lena. Bring her back to us. I'll try, he'd said. He was too sick to eat. Worry and fear chased him like beasts from nightmares. Despair coiled in his belly and crawled up his throat. Sykes had kidnapped Lena. Everything he had done, everything he had given of himself, and it hadn't been enough. Gideon Crawford was dead, Curtis Tilton was dead, and his wife and child were traumatized. Eli was still out there, looking. They'd narrowed down the vicinity of Sykes's location, but it might take days to find him, days that Lena didn't have. Jackson was supposed to rest, but he couldn't. How could he? What good was he if he couldn't do his damn job when it mattered most? The room was quiet. The silence pressed against his eardrums. His blood rushed in his ears. He rested his head in his hands. His jumbled thoughts blurred, spinning in manic circles. Lena's final request kept coming back to him. She'd asked him to catch her sister's killer. If he could do nothing to save Lena tonight, then he could at least do this. That feeling haunted him, that his family was somehow tangled up in everything, in ways he couldn't yet pinpoint. If his father had willingly jumped into bed with the cartel, and the cartel was working with Sykes, then he might know something about Lena's disappearance. Even more damning, Horatio certainly knew something about Lily's death. Jackson thought of Gideon's words before he died, regarding the suspicion that Horatio might have committed violence to keep the truth hidden. Certain facts didn't make sense. Even if his father had covered up his and Astrid's crimes, there was more to Lily's case. The broken heart locket, the lock of hair, the strangulation, and the beating around the face. Jackson raised his head. He pulled the half-melted Snickers bar from his pocket and set it on the desk. He stared at it, thinking of Shiloh. He thought about all she'd been through and the things she'd remembered. The shadowy monster in the hoodie, the thumping sound she'd heard, the killer knocking on the wall to taunt her, her mother's last weak plea for help, or something else altogether, a vital clue he was missing. He fumbled for Lily's case file and thumbed yet again through the witness statements, the crime scene photos, the notes from Underwood's press conference. He thought of Shiloh's testimony and his mother's disjointed memories. His gaze snagged on something, a sentence, a few words. The fishing tackle box. Jackson went still. The oxygen fled from his lungs and he felt like he was drowning. The pieces fell into place with a terrible clarity. And he knew, at long last, what he must do. Chapter 61 Jackson Cross, Day 104 Jackson opened the front door. I brought you a late dinner. Astrid beamed at him from her seat on the sofa. She'd been reading a paperback romance novel with a half-naked hunk on the cover. She put the book on the coffee table. Jackson shut the door softly behind him. I thought you might enjoy some hot black bean chili with chunks of seared bear meat. Lori made it. You know that it's past midnight, right? You're a night owl, like me. I figured you'd be up. Lucky guess. Astrid's cane thumped against the floor as she limped from the living room into the kitchen. She sank into her wheelchair at the breakfast table and leaned the cane against an empty chair. Jackson got out two bowls and spoons, opening and closing drawers noisily. He tucked an object into his pocket, 
and then brought the bowls to the table. He served her the still hot chili he'd warmed up on the wood stove in the Northwoods kitchen before he'd left. Astrid sat back and watched him. The lights were off for once. A handful of candles cast a flickering glow through the room, her bright eyes glinting, her silken blonde hair shimmering around her head like a halo. To what do I owe this pleasure? He pushed her bowl across the table. She took a bite and moaned with pleasure. The delicious smell wafted around them. Jackson dipped his spoon in his bowl, took a few bites he didn't taste, then set the spoon in the bowl and left it there. He'd lost his appetite. He'd considered how to tackle this conversation, how to get the answers he needed. He decided to go on the offensive. I know, he said. There is no use hiding. You know what? About the accident. I have no idea what you mean. I know what you did that night. You hit and killed a hiker. Then another vehicle came barreling around the corner and crashed into you. Gideon, Allison, and Lily were in the car. They were drinking. Their recklessness crippled you for life. Her eyes darkened as he spoke. Her expression didn't change, not even a tick of a muscle at her jaw. She was good, very good. Nothing happened to them. You were the sacrificial lamb. That's how you saw yourself. You'd killed a man, hit him with your car. You were drunk, but you blamed Lily. Gideon was driving, and Allison was dead. But Lily was the one who got away. She ran that night. She escaped all consequences, all blame. Everyone was drunk in the car that hit you. You wanted them to pay for what happened to you. But that couldn't happen. To cover up your crime, theirs had to go away too. There was no one to blame, not publicly, but you knew. You remained conscious at the accident scene and never lost your memories. And you hated it. You hated her. Astrid said, you think you're so smart. I'm not that smart, Jackson said. You've got it all wrong. I know this, Jackson said. Your future aspirations were ruined. Your dreams of college, of modeling, of a full life burned to ash, and no one paid for it. Your hatred for Lily festered through every minute hour and day that you suffered in agony, in horrific, unutterable pain for months. You lived, but you were left crippled for all intents and purposes, scarred and ugly. You had to live with that secret, that seething hatred, for years. And you wanted someone to pay for your misery. You wanted to make someone pay for it. Astrid said nothing. The room was dead silent. She sat still as a statue. You can speak the truth now. There's no reason to hide it. For a moment, she didn't move. Then Astrid leaned forward intently, her eyes burning. She walked away from the crash without a scratch. She deserved shattered bones, snapped tendons, and crushed limbs to wake up in the hospital with ruined legs. That slut escaped unscathed with no consequences. That wasn't right. It wasn't justice. You of all people should get that, Jackson. Jackson kept his voice even. So you made her pay. Astra didn't blink. Cyrus Lee Jefferson killed Lily. He didn't. Sheriff Underwood said so. He was wrong. She stared him down and took a bite of chili, not breaking eye contact. There's more. She cocked a delicate eyebrow. Back when Devin and I interviewed you, you mentioned Cyrus Lee's tackle box. But when Underwood gave the press conference, he didn't call Lee's trophy box a tackle box. He called it a toolbox. I made a note to correct him. There's no way you could have known it was a tackle box unless you already knew, because you'd seen it before. Astrid shot him an incredulous look. 
You or Devin called it a tackle box when you interviewed me on horseback. We didn't. Neither of us mentioned it. Only you did. I checked my notes. Your notes are wrong. I recorded the conversation with my phone. I'm very thorough. I called a stupid box the wrong name. That's all you've got? An issue of semantics? That means nothing. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Whatever you're implying, you're wrong. Not this time. A man killed her. Astrid smiled, not taking her eyes off him. Alas, I do not have the hardware. Everyone made assumptions. You're almost six feet tall and broad-shouldered. You can easily pass for a man in the dark. You're strong, even now. Working the wheelchair strengthens your back and your biceps. You wore a black hoodie to obscure your features, in case anyone saw you. Sounds like speculation to me, and a vivid imagination. He spoke slowly, deliberately. Then there's Shiloh. What about her? Shiloh told me about a thumping sound in her nightmares, a sound she heard that night. She thought it was someone knocking on the other side of the wall. The monster who murdered her mother, taunting her. I realized she'd heard it wrong. It wasn't someone knocking on the wall. It was you. You and your cane. The sound it made on the floor. Thump. 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 Astrid's pupils contracted ever so slightly. That's nothing. Oh, it's not nothing. It's something. It's the something that led me straight to you. Astrid took a large bite of chili. She chewed slowly, mechanically. She swallowed and daintily patted her lips with her napkin, then folded it beside her bowl. The silence stretched taut. He waited her out. If she was going to break, it would be now or never. There was a part of her that longed to boast of her exploit. He was counting on it. She was proud of herself. All sociopaths suffered from enormous egos. Their biggest disappointment lay in the realization that the more cunning they were, the fewer, if any, people would ever get to appreciate their genius. So he used that. It was late that night, but Lily opened the door because she knew you which is why there were no signs of forced entry. She underestimated your strength and your brutality. You used your cane to beat Lily in the face and render her unconscious so she couldn't fight you. Then you strangled her. And all these years, no one knew it was you. You were the poor, crippled girl who could barely walk. No one suspected you. You weren't even on our radar. Thanks to the sheriff, no one knew you had a motive for murder. Even if a few cops got suspicious. Our father had covered up a crime once for you. You knew he'd do it again. You got away with it. Scot free. A twitch of her lips. A flash of something. Arrogance. A glint of disdain. He knew then, without a shadow of a doubt, that he had the right monster. Every discombobulated trail, every twisted clue, every lie and deceit and misdirection led back to his own corrupt family, first to his father and then to his sister. You think you've got it all figured out, she spat. What do you need me for? The confession you're going to give me. Astrid snorted and took another bite of chili. The only sounds were her steady chewing and the rattle of her spoon as she cleaned out the bowl. Finally, she looked at him and smiled. Shiloh, that little rat. Chapter 62, Jackson Cross, Day 104. Astrid's eyes glinted in the candlelight, her skin dewy and glowing like an angel. It was disconcerting as hell. Killing is a rush, she said. Just like they say it is. It's all true. 
It's better than drugs, better than sex, better than winning the lottery. There's nothing like it. There is so much power in your hands, absolute power over another person. Jackson felt gutted. He'd expected this, but still, it stunned him. He felt nauseous and repulsed, but he matched her step for step, as controlled and calculating as the predator sitting across the table. You tried to kill Shiloh. You hired that meth head to murder her in the woods, just like you hired the two druggies who tried to steal Lena's insulin. I should have killed her myself, she said absently, as if she were discussing the weather. Lesson learned. Jackson had thought he couldn't be more incredulous, but once again, he was wrong. He was horrified and dumbfounded by her callousness, her flippant cruelty. Astrid frowned prettily. I knew you were getting too close, that Shiloh might be remembering things. I made sure she saw me at the FEMA riot to see if she reacted. She didn't, but I figured I should kill her anyway, just to be safe. She shrugged. I knew the crackhead from the homeless shelter. It was easy to goad him to do it. He would have done anything for the promise of one more fix. But he messed it up and got himself killed in the process. Served him right. I decided that I would have to do it myself. And I would have done it too. All I had to do was get her alone. I had it all planned out. Then Sykes showed up and everybody went to DEFCON 4. You and Eli tucked her into that Northwoods cult, and I couldn't get to her. She pinched her fingers together. I was that close. A chill shivered through him. You underestimated Shiloh. That girl's got balls, Astrid said, with something that sounded like admiration. She leaned forward intently. I'll get her eventually. I always get what I want in the end. Horror tasted like rotten fruit on his tongue, like death and decay. Interrogating a sociopath was like crossing a tightrope a thousand feet in the air. The altitude was dizzying and disorienting, and one misstep would pitch you headlong into the abyss. The memories came at him, one after another. Astrid watching the neighbor kid fall off his bike, a smile on her face. Astrid, never crying never showing empathy, only contempt and derision. She'd volunteered at the shelter to see others in pain, the homeless, drug-addicted, abused, and downtrodden. She gorged herself on misery and suffering. Astrid sipped from the glass of water and set it down. I should have just eliminated her back then. Problem solved. The truth is that I'd forgotten about Lily's snot-nosed kids until I heard a sound in the bedroom as I passed by. I saw her hiding, squished between the bed frame and the wall. She was so tiny. I was so powerful. What could I have to fear from a baby? I figured she was too young. It was too dark, and she didn't see anything. She was nothing. I granted her mercy. And look what she did with that mercy. She threw it back in my face. Jackson sat back in his chair and stared at her. A thousand terrible emotions tumbling through him. Dread, revulsion, loathing, and horror. He pulled himself together, forcing himself to stay calm and emotionless. In an even voice, he said, More chilly? She nodded, and he rose, went to the counter, and poured the remainder of the chili into her bowl, willing his hands to remain steady, making sure she didn't make a move while his back was half turned. He brought the bowl back to the table and sat down. She took the bowl. Thank you, she said with impeccable manners, as if this were any given Sunday, a typical family meal, when it was anything but. He switched tactics. How long have you known Cyrus Lee was a killer? She narrowed her eyes. I didn't. I know you figured it out. No one else did but you. 
Now she beamed. Nine years ago. <laughs> you cops are pathetic. How did you know? He didn't need her to answer. He had a hunch. She gave a careless shrug. I found the tackle box in Cyrus Lee's garage. Right away, I realized who and what he was. I realized how easy it would be to kill someone and get away with it. I had the evidence to pin it on someone else right there in my hands. And that's when you decided. Her left eyelid twitched. He'd hit the nail on the head. Why didn't you turn Cyrus Lee in when you learned what he was, what he'd done? He always treated me like a queen. He stalked and murdered women. She gave him a petulant look. Not me. You didn't think he would hurt you? I wasn't his type. I was his cover. He needed camouflage and I provided it. I gave him access to ongoing murder and assault cases. He needed me. Once you found out what he was, you were a greater threat to him than his need. That's why I stole four necklaces and put one in a safety deposit box in four different banks. I found Elise McNeely's driver's license in the bottom of the hidden compartment in that tackle box. I knew she was missing. The hair in the locket matched her hair color from her social media accounts. I put McNeely's driver's license in one of the safety deposit boxes, too. I told Cyrus what would happen if I disappeared. That I'd left a letter for my father and for you to find. I convinced him I was an ally, more useful alive than dead. Smartly, he agreed. He kept killing women. All that time, you knew and did nothing. Another dismissive shrug. Not my problem. Jackson stared at her, incredulous, like she'd grown three heads. The words coming out of her mouth felt incongruous, as if he was in some alien dimension and couldn't find his way back to reality. He was discreet about it. He tried to hide his revulsion, but failed miserably. Don't look so horrified, Jackson. It's not like other serial killers haven't had partners. Fred and Rosemary West, Gerald and Charlene Gallego, the Lonely Hearts Killers, and the Sunset Strip Killers. It wasn't like I participated. She said the word with distaste. Like those messed up whores. I simply accepted it. It's easier than you think. You didn't merely accept anything. You committed a savage murder and staged the scene to look like your boyfriend's previous crimes to frame him. You knew the details because you cajoled him into telling you everything he'd done. She shot him a smug, triumphant look. I thought for sure he'd go down for it. He was the perfect patsy. Unfortunately, the bodies of his other victims hadn't been discovered. So the necklace didn't mean much until you used that evidence against Eli. You decided to frame your best friend instead, and everything worked out for me after all, like it was supposed to. What snapped in you? What made you do it that night of all nights? Lily brought it on herself. Her death was her fault. I had Cyrus Lee's necklace, which I knew I could use to protect myself if I decided to do it. I hated her, but I didn't have a plan. Not until the evening she came around, pounding on our door, looking for you. She didn't find you. She found me. You and father were out on an investigation. Some narcotic stakeout. Astrid smiled that sly, cruel smile. Father thought he had it under control, that he could keep Lily under his thumb. But I saw it in her face. She hated him, and she hated me. She'd lived with her secrets long enough, and she was going to start talking. She threatened to tell you. She was going to destroy father and me. So I did something about it. 
Jackson trembled with the effort to rein in his emotions. He had been blind to so many things. He wasn't blind now. He saw clearly for the first time. He saw his father's greed, his sister's cruelty, and Lily's desperation. For someone who had professed to love Lily from afar, he had failed her miserably. He didn't think less of her, the things she'd held close and the secrets she'd kept. She had known what Jackson had refused to believe. The Alger County Sheriff was corrupt to the core, and she could not win against him. Over the years, it ate at her, until the corrosive lies had done more damage than the dangerous truth. And she'd just let you inside the house that late at night? I rang the doorbell. She came to the door in her pajamas. I told her she was right about everything. That I didn't want to live with the guilt either and would confess to it with her. <laughs> it was like taking candy from a baby. Astrid's pretty features transformed into something grotesque. She was too stupid to be afraid. She should have been afraid. But I made her fear me in the end. He saw the ugliness hidden beneath the beautiful mask. The accident had broken more than her legs. It had shattered something crucial inside her, and no one could put her back together again. But that was another lie, an obfuscation, a blurring of the truth. Astrid was broken long before her accident. The wrongness in his own family that everyone had recognized but chosen to ignore. The monstrous elephant in the room. Father knew, he said dully. Not the accident, but about Lily. He knows what you did. Her beatific smile told him everything. And Garrett? What did he have to do with this? I'm not our brother's keeper. Go ask father. He knows. Did he figure it out? Is that why he left? She gave a small shake of her head. You have no idea who Garrett even is, do you? You haven't a clue. He ignored her attempt to distract him. Then what about mom? You thought she was protecting our father. Her smile widened. It was me. It was always me. He thought of his parents with a mix of revulsion and pity. His whole life, he'd understood the unspoken rules of his family. A smoothing over of reality. A softening of the rough spots, the ugly things. That ability to unsee what was right in front of them. The problem wasn't the person who committed the offense. It was the one who dared to call it out. To force the others to acknowledge the thing they couldn't bear to face the truth, and their own culpability. I'm getting bored with this conversation. Astrid slid one hand beneath the table into her lap. With her other hand, she spooned up the last of the chili. Forget we ever had this conversation. You got the truth you wanted. You should be happy now. Let the past stay in the past and die. None of it matters. This is the new world. Like Father says, and we are the ones who will remake it in our image. He stared until her form blurred and shifted, until she hardly looked human, her garish grin a caricature of humanity, a facsimile, so close to the real thing, it was uncanny. He'd had it wrong. She was no monster. She was fully human. That was the worst part. No, I don't think so. Jackson pulled out a pair of handcuffs and placed them on the table between them. I'm going to arrest you and take you to a jail cell at the sheriff's office. I'll figure it out from there, but you are under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may be used against you in a court of law. Astrid laughed hysterically. A <laughs> court of law? What fantasy world are you living in? No one cares. I care, Jackson said quietly. 
I am still the law. Astrid shoved back her wheelchair and lurched to her feet. A glint of sharp-edged steel revealed the butcher knife in her left hand. She must have hidden the weapon in her wheelchair beneath her legs. I was hoping you would see reason. But since you refuse to be reasonable, I'll have to kill you too. I'm not so crippled that I can't do what needs to be done. She waved the knife at him. She took a lumbering step around the table. Her lips peeled back in a snarl. Nothing personal, brother. Jackson was ready for her. He'd expected the attack. Carefully, he stood and shoved back his chair. It's always personal with you, Astrid. She moved toward him. Halfway around the table, she faltered, nearly falling and catching herself on the edge of the table. Her coffee cup toppled over. Her spoon rattled against the empty bowl. Confusion flashed across her face. With her free hand, she reached for her throat. Her cheeks flushed a deep red. What? You are a sociopath, a parasite, a clear and present danger to the existence of everything good left in this world. You destroy everything you touch. Her eyes bulged. The butcher knife slipped from her fingers. It clattered to the tile floor. What did you do? He'd considered the possibilities, weighed the options, and examined the consequences. He thought of Lily, wild, reckless, passionate Lily, who never got the chance to leave her mistakes behind and create something new. And he thought of Shiloh. Astrid would not stop, not ever. She had tried to kill Shiloh, and she would do so again at the first opportunity. As long as she lived, she was a threat, not just to Shiloh, but to everything they were trying to protect. Right about now, your throat is closing. You're finding it hard to breathe. Her mouth opened and closed, too shocked to speak. He placed his hands on the table to steady himself. He had wrought this devastation. It was his duty to see it through. I added a special ingredient to your second bowl of chili. Ground peanuts from a Snickers bar for Shiloh. Shiloh. The girl you wanted dead. How's that for irony? Stunned, she gaped at him. I knew you were guilty, but I needed to hear you say it. I needed your confession. You gave it to me. You couldn't help it. You're so proud of yourself, so smug and arrogant. You underestimated me, like you underestimated Shiloh. Astrid staggered for the kitchen drawer next to the fridge. Jackson withdrew an object from his pocket, which he'd surreptitiously taken while gathering the bowls. He held her EpiPen for her peanut allergy. This what you're looking for? It's not where you left it. She spun, half stumbling, and held herself up against the counter. Give me the Epi. He held it out of her reach. There's still a chance for you, a way to save yourself. Where is Lena Easton? She swore at him, spitting and hissing, her eyes swelling and puffy, her skin had gone red. How would I know? You know. You know where she is. You know where they have Lena. You've been listening to Father's Ham Radio Communications. You left scuff marks from your wheelchair on his office floor. You've known exactly what our father was up to. Screw you! If you don't tell me, you die. If you do tell me, you have a chance to live. But you better start talking. Veins popped out on her forehead. Sweat ran down her temples. Panic flashed in her eyes as her airway became more constricted. She started wheezing, her body heaving desperately for oxygen. You cockroach! You stupid idiot! I'll kill you! Tell me. He gazed at her, hard and emotionless. This is your reckoning. A life for a life. You're too late. A maniacal grin split her face. They have Lena. They'll kill her. 
too late. You're always too late. Kill me, and you'll never find out. You can't save her. You're running out of time. Tell me what I need to know. With a shriek of outrage, his sister hurled herself at him, took two staggering steps, and her legs gave out. She tumbled to the floor with a crash. The silverware on the table clattered as her hip banged into the table leg. She sagged to her hands and knees, the wheezing higher and raspier, and scrabbled for the knife a few feet from her reach. Even dying, she attacked him, a predator through and through. Jackson moved closer and kicked the knife, sending it skittering across the tile and out of her reach. He held the EpiPen high so she could see it. Start talking. You won't let me die. You don't have it in you. Watch me. This was his sister, the woman he'd loved and resented his entire life. In his mind's eye, he saw her as a fat, giggling baby a five-year-old trailing devotedly after their father, and as a ten-year-old killing frogs with rocks, and then worse. He wished the world was different, but it wasn't. The law he'd clung to and had depended upon to keep his life orderly, to keep chaos at bay. Had it all been a falsehood, a mirage? Had chaos always waited for him, nestled at the beating heart of his existence? Tell me, he shouted. A mine, she spit out, half choking. On the radio, Sykes told the cartel. He took her. Which mine? Astrid collapsed. On her back, she writhed, hands flailing. Her face was swelling up and going bright tomato red, her lips garishly fat. A vivid rash appeared on her cheeks. Her eyes bulged in fury and fear. She mumbled something. He leaned closer. Which mine? I don't know. On the radio, they used codes. I don't know. What kind of mine? C copper, a copper mine. He believed her for once. She writhed on her back, clutched at her throat with one hand, reaching beseechingly for him with the other, pleading, begging him for salvation. Give it to me. He held the epinephrine in his hand. It was cool and slick in his palm. He withheld it. You, she gurgled, her bloated features contorted in pain, disbelief, and rage. You have to help me. That's not going to happen. Wh what? Jackson squatted beside her. He didn't give her the EpiPen. In this new world, she would never have been taken to court to face justice, to spend the rest of her rotten life in prison. Much as he loathed it, the only justice was this, right here, right now, in this room. He said, this is a mercy. Her hands flailed helplessly at her throat clawing for air, her puffy mouth gawping, a limpid flash of awareness in her eyes. This was the end. She was dying. Jackson was going to let her die. An agonizing minute later, it was over. He felt numb. For a long moment, he stared at her still form with a mix of consternation and nauseating anguish, tormented by the terrible thing he had done. He felt no sense of satisfaction, only a miserable emptiness, a tremendous ache in his chest. And yet, he felt a stirring at the back of his neck, the soft exhale of a ghost finally put to rest. Lily, at long last, had found peace. Whatever punishment or penance was due him for this hideous act would have to wait. The dead were buried and gone. The living could still be saved. Stealing himself, Jackson rose to his feet and turned his back on the corpse of Lily's killer. 
He didn't want to leave his mother alone with a corpse. So he first radioed Fiona Smith and asked her to come sit with Dolores. He didn't want his mother or Fiona to stumble upon the corpse. So he moved the body into the laundry room and shut the door. He would deal with the body later. Returning to the kitchen, Jackson righted the toppled chair, set the dishes in the sink, and checked his service pistol. It was locked and loaded for the battle yet to come. He radioed Eli and told him what little intel he'd discovered, praying desperately that it would be enough. Sykes has her in a mine, but I don't know which one. We don't have time to check them all, Eli said. I know where she is. Chapter 63, Lena Easton, Day 105. Lena awoke to pitch darkness. Terror constricted her lungs. Her shoulder joints ached. Her arms were yanked behind her back and bound tight with plastic zip ties that bit into her wrists. She tugged on her bindings, but there was no give, not even a centimeter, the plastic cutting into her skin, her flesh raw. Pain radiated from the center of her face. Dried blood caked to her lips, chin, and throat. Her nose was broken. Her ribs ached like she'd been kicked by a horse. Gasping, she strained her ears and eyes, but heard nothing, saw nothing. Her senses were blunted. There were no sounds but her pulse and her hitching breaths. No animal sounds, no birds or squirrels or insects. Total silence. The darkness was absolute, thick with a physical weight she could feel pressing down on her, a sensation of immense heaviness. She felt like a mole, deep beneath a mountain, deaf and dumb and blind. She moved, shifting her spine, focusing on every sensation. Hard, lumpy rock beneath her butt, digging into her tailbone. She leaned against something smooth and square. She took a deep breath. Damp, dank air filled her lungs. It was cold, very cold. Goosebumps prickled across her bare arms and legs. She shivered, using up precious energy. A cave. She was in a cave. Hello, she called softly. The sound bounced back at her. It was some sort of cavern, a large one by the reverberation of the echoes. Her memories returned, hard and fast. The big guy with the tattoos, punching her in the face and slinging her over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes as she lost consciousness. Help, she whispered, her throat parched. Help me. The sound of her voice resounded back at her in mockery. Her breath came in short, shallow gasps. Lightheadedness spun through her. She needed to check her numbers. They were skyrocketing, dangerously high. She could feel it. How many hours had it been? She had no sense of time. It could have been days. Her stomach was concave, hunger gnawing at her insides. Her throat burned with thirst. Lena was a prisoner, a captive locked in the dank bowels of the earth. And she had no insulin, no glucose pills, and no emergency injection, nothing. Every hour, every minute that passed dragged her closer to the precipice, to her death. It was coming. Time was running out. She knew the symptoms, her clammy skin, the dizziness, her blood sugar rising, rising, poisoning her cells. Distant sound echoed in the blackness, approaching footfalls. Light flashed bright and harsh against her retinas. She blinked against the glare, ducked her head, and squinted as a powerful flashlight beam lit up the cavern, approximately 60 feet by 80 feet in size, the rough-hewn ceiling curving three stories above her. Angel Flood appeared from the tunnel on the opposite end of the cavern, dressed in an oversized t-shirt over cargo pants and black combat boots, armed with a pistol and a knife, a flashlight in one hand and a lantern in the other. The gangbanger set the Coleman lantern on one of the dozens of crates stacked along the perimeter of the cavern. Boxes on wooden pallets wrapped in plastic with labels scrawled across the sides. Abvi, Merck, 
GlaxoSmithKline, Bayer, Gilead Sciences, Sanofi, and Pfizer. The realization struck her like a gut punch. This was the storage depot where Sykes and his crew had offloaded the stolen medications from the train. A spark of hope flared in her chest. Insulin must be here somewhere. It had to be. You shot my dog, she said. Angel gave a nonchalant shrug, barely glancing at her as he adjusted his belt buckle. He must have left the cavern to answer nature's call. She'd awakened moments before his return. Next time I see that ugly mutt, I'll finish the job. Fear clamped her throat with steel talons. But there was something else, something dark forming beneath the terror, a cold, crystallized anger. Her natural affinity for nurturing and compassion became usurped by a righteous fury that burned so bright she was incandescent with it. These psychos had threatened the people she cared about. They'd murdered and plundered. They'd hurt her beloved dog. She hated all of them, but this one most of all. Utterly indifferent, Angel perched on one of the boxes 20 feet from her location one eye on her and the other on the passageway. He withdrew a combat knife from the sheath at his belt, along with a hunk of flint, and began to sharpen the blade. Where are we? Underground. A cave? Nope. An old mine, then? The convict scuffed his blade across the sharpening stone in even passes. The lantern cast long, flickering shadows highlighting the uneven surface of the rock, cut by hand in the 18th century by half-blind miners, given a single candle to work by, hundreds of feet below the surface. These are all medications that could save people's lives. Angel didn't bother to answer. There will be insulin here, in a refrigerated container. I'll die without it. Not my problem, lady. I know it's here. Probably right in this cavern. Please, I need your help. Angel ignored her. Thinking tactically, like Eli had taught her, she checked her surroundings, searching for anything that might aid her escape. To her left, a narrow passageway cut into the rock. The network of pulleys and ropes attached to the ceiling of the main passageway looked new. An ancient metal cart sat on rusted tracks, used a hundred years ago to haul away the heavy copper ore. The slick walls were scarred with deep grooves where the copper had been extracted painstakingly by hand with chisels. There might be other openings and passageways she couldn't see. Where the light did not reach, the dense blackness lurked. This place was home to demons and wraiths, the monsters of the deep. Let me go, she said, to keep her captor focused on her words rather than her actions, as she fumbled behind her with her fingers, her movements hampered by the flex cuffs. Unlike the movies, her captors had correctly restrained her hands behind her back. Her fingertips brushed the slippery corner of a box sealed with plastic. Let me go, and nothing bad has to happen to you. Angel snorted. <laughs> Sure thing, sweet cakes. It's all been a terrible misunderstanding. Her cuffed hands found the rough edge of the wood pallet stacked with boxes behind her. Furtively, she scooched on her butt and lowered her shoulders until her wrists were level with the corner of the pallet. How did you find me? Sykes has ears everywhere. We shook down the right people until we heard the right rumor. It didn't take too long to hear about Eli Pope's special lady friend, the paramedic with the big dog who lived in the lighthouse. Besides, your friends, the Tiltons, talked too much. The Tiltons sang your praises, telling everyone and their brother how you saved their kid. Sykes figured a first responder would come out of hiding to save a kid, especially one she'd already saved once. And he had been right. Lena winced. 
The Tiltons were a means to an end, as was she. They were mere pawns in a deadly game for which there could only be one victor. She was the lure in the trap Sykes had set for Eli. She understood that. If she could have sacrificed herself to protect him, to save him from this, she would have done so in a heartbeat. But it was too late now. The plan was set in motion. Eli would know this was a trap, and still he would come. Of that, she had no doubt. The only thing she could do now was to do her best to stay alive and try to help him when the time came. Lena clenched her jaw. Please, let me go. Angel glanced quickly behind him, then returned his attention to his knife. Shut up. You're annoying me. Your boss told you to keep me alive. If my blood sugar gets too high, I'll lose consciousness and go into a diabetic coma. Once that happens, short of a hospital and intensive medical intervention, I'll die. You look fine to me. Please, I'll die without it. Not my orders, lady. If I go into a diabetic coma before Sykes springs his trap for Eli Pope, he'll be pissed. You've seen what he does to his enemies. What do you think he'll do to you? Angel's expression hardened. Shut up. I have a 13-year-old girl to take care of. Her mother is dead. I'm all she has left. We already know about her, Angel said with a dismissive wave of his hand. If you don't get Sykes what he wants, he'll take her next. Lena recoiled at the thought of Sykes touching Shiloh. She'd thought she knew fear intimately, had explored the depths of terror. But she had not even begun. There were always new levels of torment. He smiled nastily at her fear. He enjoyed it. He wanted to hurt her, to get under her skin, to make her submissive to make her cower, humiliated and afraid. She longed to claw his eyes out. This seething anger was both unfamiliar to her, and yet it felt as natural as breathing. Without hesitation, she would commit violence to protect Shiloh. As she had before, so she would do again, in a heartbeat, as many times as it took. Lena didn't waste energy begging for her life. Her effort to get him to see her as a person he couldn't depersonalize had failed. He was a sociopath, cruel and brutal, with no moral compass, no compassion, and no value system beyond his own twisted desires. Exhaustion pulled at her, along with pain, horror, and anguish. The muscles in her arms strained, taut and aching in protest. Yet she continued to rub her wrists against that jagged point, unrelenting, her skin stinging and bloodied. Angel sheathed his knife and glared at her. The light from the lantern cast eerie shadows beneath his sunken eyes and the hard slash of his cheekbones. You're dead. No one cares if you die in an hour or a day. The trap for you is set. I don't know why Sykes hasn't put a bullet in you already. She knew why. She'd seen it in Sykes's dead fish eyes. He wasn't simply a killer. He was a sadist. A bullet was too easy, too quick, too painless. He planned to torture her in front of Eli before he killed them both. Before she could respond, a sound came from behind them, a clatter a pitter-patter like a pebble rolling across an uneven stone floor. The mountain of rock was settling with a groan. Angel jerked around, his face papery pale, a flicker of apprehension sweeping across his taut features. One hand splayed across his upper shoulder, as if to protect himself from something unseen, to ward off an evil spirit. He was afraid of the dark, or maybe he was afraid of Eli. Either way, he was definitely spooked. Maybe she could use that. Three hundred feet below the surface, the dank, chiseled walls seemed to breathe with history, with the thousands of lives that had suffered, endured, and even died in this wretched place. Kids as young as five had worked the copper mines, 
all day, in the dark, they collected the chunks of copper and transported the great hunks in carts. Down here, it was easy to believe in ghosts and evil spirits, death itself creeping up behind you. There are ghosts down here. They've suffered, they're trapped, and they're angry. Angel fiddled nervously with his radio, but there was no signal. Sykes! Sykes! Come in, damn it! Nothing but static. Bad mojo in this place, he muttered under his breath. My granddad mined in this hellhole for 30 years. 14 hours in the dark. Six days a week. He went blind doing it. I'm not scared of the dark. I'm not scared of nothing. He repeated the words like a mantra. I'm not scared. Lena's fingers closed over a pebble on the ground. She tried to throw it, to create more unnatural sounds. But her bound hands were worthless. The pebble dropped from her fingers with a barely audible clink. Did you hear that? I said shut up, Angel shouted. The sound bounced off rock, echoed eerily, and faded into oppressive silence. Angel's breathing came in hitching gasps, his eyes frantically darting in every direction. She was getting to him. She didn't believe in much, but she believed in God. Not ghosts haunting Hispanic gangbangers for bloody vengeance. The lantern light wavered and sputtered. Angel gave a little grunt of terror. Lena made the mistake of smiling. Angel saw it. Rage darkened his face, and he lunged across the cavern, faster than she'd thought possible, seized her by her shirt, and yanked her toward him inches from her face. His stale breath struck her cheeks. Even in the dim light, she could see the pores in his flesh, the tattooed tears scarring his skin, his glassy, bloodshot eyes. No one said I couldn't hurt you, senorita, he snarled. She swallowed the panic clawing at her throat. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Angel shoved her to the ground, rose to his feet, and kicked her in the ribs. The pain took her breath away. Flinching, she curled into a ball, protecting her internal organs. But there was no way to protect her head. If he wanted to bash her skull in, he would. Stop, please stop. We're just getting started. He relished her terror. She forced herself to let him see her pain, her fear. Let him get drunk on it. Her only chance was to act submissive and weak. They saw her as prey. She'd act like prey. She made herself beg. Please, don't hurt me. He kicked her again, this time half-heartedly, and returned to the stack of boxes where the Coleman lantern glowed warm and welcoming. He leaned against a crate labeled with the red looping lily emblem with a cunning, self-satisfied grin, more confident now. Taunting her had placated him, beaten back his own depthless fears. He thought he'd conquered his demons. He thought the darkness had been tamed. It wasn't. Lena had to stay alive until Eli came for her. He would come. Then, the darkness would be the least of Angel Flood's fears. Chapter 64 Eli Pope, Day 105 Tension shot through Eli like a live wire. Crouched beneath a limestone overhang, shielded by underbrush that snagged at his clothes, he focused on the target ahead through his field glasses. His mind spun with tactics and strategies strengths and weaknesses, pros and cons. Early that morning, Eli and Jackson had gathered the team, traveling from house to house and banging on doors. Then they'd geared up and headed for Eagle Falls Mine, located southwest of Ishpeming and north of Iron Mountain. Though Sykes was likely to move frequently, Eli was fairly certain this was the location where he was keeping Lena. It was a perfect location to set up an ambush. The 80-mile, one-way trip would significantly deplete their emergency fuel. Eli feared they wouldn't have enough gas to return to Munising, but that was a problem for later. 
As they drove, Jackson tensed, his knuckles white as he gripped the steering wheel. He was pale and haggard, shaken in a way Eli had never seen him. Something had happened, but when Eli pressed him, he remained distant and vague. Jackson blinked, his gaze clearing. I'm fine. My head is in the game. Don't worry. He hesitated. Right now, we need to focus on Sykes. Eli hadn't argued with him. Now, he crouched in the dirt and reconned the target. Ahead of him, the uneven ground angled into a deep ravine between two ridges carpeted in dense, jewel-colored greens of pine, spruce, and fir. They'd positioned themselves on the opposite hill, halfway up, approximately a quarter mile from the main entrance to the mine, holed up behind a house-sized boulder that provided solid cover and concealment. Several team members squatted next to Jackson, who'd spread a map on the ground. Hart and Nash acted as lookouts on either side of the rock, while Nix was nestled in a sniper hide somewhere on the hillside above them, providing overwatch. Her elevated position gave her an excellent view of the ravine, the hillside, and the mine. Before they'd left, Jackson had rustled up history books from the library on regional copper and ore mines in the Upper Peninsula, which included an old black and white copy of a map of Eagle Falls Mine. Over the last 150 years, 12 billion pounds of native copper had been mined in the UP. Although the main copper region ran along the western range from Ontonagon County up through the tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula, a smaller deposit had been discovered south of the Marquette Iron Range and had operated from the 1850s to the 1960s before shuttering its doors. Jackson pointed at various points on the map. The first four levels descend about 400 feet. The fifth and sixth levels are flooded and extremely unstable. The main entrance is here. Out here along this dirt road is the old mining village. Follow the road a mile north to reach the main mine entrance hewn out of the hillside. Eli lowered his field glasses for a moment to glance at the map. Perspiration gathered beneath his armpits. Beads of sweat slid down his temples, and his heart thudded like a jackrabbit in his chest. What's this, over here? That's the dump site, the side tunnel where they dumped the waste. Useless tons of rocks they'd dug out and chucked down the mountain. It's steep as hell. But it leads to the main tunnels? Jackson nodded. There are eight main caverns, large enough to store significant supplies. It's likely Sykes is keeping Lena in one of these locations, but we can't be certain. That's a hell of a lot of possibilities, Antoine said. From his vantage point, Eli eyed the side of the hill through his field glasses. The tunnel entrance stood perhaps eight feet tall by seven feet wide, with a narrow ledge of rock protruding from the hillside. The slab face was 200 feet tall, and steeply sloped at a 45-degree angle. Over the decades, thousands of rock chunks had been flung over the side, littering the slope like the mine had vomited up its insides. It was piled so deep, the base of the hill was buried. Jackson was right. The slope was steep, but not impossible to scale with the right equipment. How are your mountain climbing skills? He asked. Rusty? Moreno muttered. Anyone who climbs the side of that hill will be fully exposed, Jackson said. We'll have overwatch and constant radio communication, Antoine said. His injuries from the train ambush had mostly healed, at least enough that he could fight. The burn on the side of his face was still pink and a bit raw. Until we get inside, no signal beneath all that rock. Eli glimpsed movement motion in the shadows within the tunnel entrance. He stilled, peering through his binos as a distant figure poked his head out, scanned the forest below, then pulled a cigarette and lighter from his pocket and lit it. The man stood, relaxed and casual, smoking. Clearly, he did not expect a threat to emerge from the dump site below him. The man was burly, bearded, and heavily tattooed. A rifle was slung over one shoulder, 
a pistol at his hip. He wore a military-style chest rig over a t-shirt and ratty jeans. A second sentry appeared and bummed a light off the first. The second guy was scrawny, likely from drug use. His greasy, stringy hair pulled back in a ponytail. He carried an M4 in his hands. Eli's breathing quickened. He recognized these two from his time served in prison. The big bearded one was ex-military, not special forces, but he knew enough to be dangerous. A longtime member of Sykes's crew, he'd committed armed robberies, including one where he'd bashed in the homeowner's head with a crowbar. He'd be a problem. The stringy one was a small-time drug dealer who'd earned himself a two-decade sentence behind bars after a drive-by shooting where he'd slaughtered a rival dealer and his girlfriend on the street. He didn't look like much of a threat, but he was vicious and bloodthirsty. I've got visual on two sentries guarding the dump site, he said into his radio. They're definitely Sykes's guys. Sit rep, Echo 2. Through the headset, Alexis said, Four convicts guarding the main entrance. They switched sentry duty on top of the hour, all heavily armed. We spotted two more sentries a half mile down at the road turnoff, ensuring no one gets through. I've seen four additional guys pop in and out of the entrance. An hour ago, two convicts loaded a truck with boxes and took off. Alexis had situated herself inside an abandoned cafe, a mile from the mine, using the drone to get eyes on Sykes's security protocols. They'd been reconning the target site for three hours. Eli was so anxious to get inside, he was about to crawl out of his skin. Antoine frowned, a line appearing between his bushy brows. I hate to say this, but Sykes may have already killed her, brother. If this was my op, and I was the bad guy, that's what I would do. He won't kill her until he has me. The words were razor blades in his throat. He made it clear. He'll make me watch as he tortures Lena. It's part of his sick revenge shtick. That wasn't entirely true. There were myriad ways a hostage could get killed. If Sykes's plan for revenge fell apart, he might shoot Lena in the head and leave her body for Eli to find. Beside him, Jackson and Devin exchanged apprehensive glances. Darius Sykes wasn't the only threat. Lena's body was a ticking time bomb, and they all knew it. Above them, the bruised sky loomed low, dark clouds swollen with rain. The air crackled with electrons, raising the hairs along his arms and the back of his neck. A storm was headed their way. Let me get this straight. Marino said. They have three times the manpower we do. We have no clue on their whereabouts within the labyrinth or the weapons they've got inside. They're minions of the cartel. They have freaking missiles for all we know. We have no idea where the hostage is located within that dragon's lair, but we sure as hell can expect multiple threats to burst from every tunnel, hole, nook, and cranny to pop us when we least expect it. Marino shuddered. And rats. I bet they'll be rats. All Eli wanted to do was leap down the hillside and run and gun. Use shock and awe and sheer force of violence to mow down the enemy and save the love of his life. His mind raced through the tactical questions for which they had no answers. There were too many unknowns. It was a logistical nightmare. That's about right. He had to constantly remind himself that most of the team were small-town officers, dedicated to their jobs, fiercely brave and loyal, but neither soldiers nor Tier 1 operators. They did not have years of experience in hostage rescue. They were not shock troops. I can't ask anyone to do this, Eli said. I'm the one he's after. Like hell, Jackson exploded. You'll get creamed before you make it ten steps and you know it. We're in this together. We're a team. We take the risk together. We take the victory together. We celebrate or mourn together. That's how it works. What he said, Antoine said. 
Let's go get these bastards and bring Lena home, Devin said fiercely. Moreno shrugged. What the hell? I'm in. Rats or no rats, just tell me where to sign. Eli stared at them, a little stunned. He'd spent eight years trapped in a cell with monsters, solitary and alone, hunted at every turn, betrayed and abandoned. To trust again was slippery, difficult, incredibly painful. It felt foreign and unnatural. Okay, he said. Okay. We're in, Jackson said. But I won't lose my men to a half-cocked plan. I hate it as much as anyone. But we need better intel. He's right. We cannot go in there without intel. We cannot. They could have mine shafts, booby-trapped with explosives. They could be lying in wait in various passages and hit us like fish in a barrel. We have no idea what we're walking into. If we go in like this, we will die. Not just Lena, all of us. Reluctantly, the others nodded. We're not letting her die, Devin said. We won't, Eli said. But we're getting intel, one way or another. How? Jackson asked grudgingly, like he didn't want to know. Before Eli could answer, Alexis spoke into his headset. This is Echo 2 for Alpha 1. I've got movement at the entrance. A red jeep just pulled up, one suspect behind the wheel, two more approaching the vehicle. Keep watching, Echo 2. There was a moment of tense silence. Everyone waited. A black fly buzzed around Eli's face, but he ignored it. Frustration roiled through him. He was utterly blind, and he hated it. Two suspects in the jeep now. They're driving down the two-track toward the main drive. His pulse accelerated. He glanced around the group and considered the moves ahead. He trusted Jackson to have his back, to fight hard in the battle to come. But Jackson was an idealist who didn't have the stomach for what needed to be done. Eli needed someone as cold-blooded as he was. Let's go, Nix said. She'd come down the hill to switch places with Antoine, who'd take the next shift on Overwatch. Her blue eyes reflected a steely resolve, her jaw set. You and me, hurry, before they're out of range. Eli eyed the bandage wrapped around her shoulder. She glowered at him. It hurts like hell, but I've got full range of motion. How's your arm? Touche. He shot her a grim smile. Nix would do just fine. Eli rose to his feet. We're going after the targets in the Jeep to get that intel. The rest of you keep eyes on the main target and apprise me of any changes. We'll be back as soon as we can. Jackson gave him a disquieted look, his expression hesitant. How are you going to obtain that intel? Don't ask me that, Jackson. Jackson's eyes were dark and conflicted, like he wanted to stop Eli his idealism interfering with the reality of what they must do in this world to survive. A strained look passed between them, weighted with everything they'd left unsaid. He knew Jackson was torn between order and lawlessness, morality and survival, mercy and violence. Jackson looked tortured in a way that Eli had never seen him. With a jolt, he realized, he still cared what Jackson thought. These people aren't innocent, Eli said. They're the wolves who prey on the innocent. Jackson's mouth thinned into a bloodless line. There was a hard edge about him that Eli hadn't noticed before. Though reluctance still etched his face, he nodded. I trust you. Eli tucked those words away to consider later. Jackson's admission and what it meant for him and for Jackson, for their tentative, complicated relationship. Did trust mean friendship? Was that even what Eli wanted? He pushed it out of his mind as he gestured to Nix, weapon in hand. Let's go. Without a word, Nix headed downhill. Eli followed her, 
jogging along a deer path that descended the steep hill through the underbrush. He spoke into his headset. Echo 2, keep that drone on them. Don't let them out of sight. Unless they drive out of range or the battery dies, I'm on it. But we're on borrowed time here. Eli had never been more aware of the time he did not have. Chapter 65, Lena Easton, Day 105. A faint sound came from the darkness, a subtle scratch, like a rat scrabbling in the darkness, or fingernails scraping across rock, or a demon crawling up from the abyss. Alarmed, Angel leaped from his spot across the cavern. He spun and aimed the flashlight at something behind him. The beam flailed wildly over scarred stone and piles of rock. He was agitated, his anxiety skyrocketing. Lena was almost delirious with thirst and hunger, her belly an aching knot. Her broken nose pulsed with agony, making it difficult to think clearly. Dried blood coated her lips and her chin. Hours ago, she'd drunk the bottle of water Angel had held to her mouth to keep her alive and conscious. Twice, he'd hauled her to a spot outside the cavern along a secondary tunnel to use a chemical toilet, pulling her pants down and watching her with a leering smile because it humiliated her and because he liked to make people small and afraid. Anger flushed through her, but she hid her emotions and acted as he expected, weak and scared, a harmless mouse. To her left, a small furred creature skittered behind a stack of crates. Not a mouse, but a rat. The presence of another living creature in this hellhole was bizarrely comforting. Luckily, Angel didn't see it. Something's out there, she said. I heard it too. He cursed, then crossed himself and reached for his radio, but it only hissed static. What if there are ghosts down here? Lena shuddered, acting scared as she worked her bound wrists against the edge of the pallet. The little kids who died, begging for their mamas. What if their bodies are still trapped down here, angry and out for vengeance? I said shut up, Angel shouted. His voice careened and bounced, distorted by the echo, almost deranged. I know how to shut your pretty little mouth permanently. He hurled threats like a boy throwing rocks at a stray cat, but his heart wasn't in it. His attention was elsewhere, his head on a swivel, the tendon standing out on his neck, his movements jittery and tense. Lena kept half her attention on him, half on the rat. It scuttled between the crate and the cavern wall, then disappeared. She leaned closer, squinting. The shadow cast from the row of crates obscured a hole, approximately two feet wide by two feet high. Not a hole, but a human-sized tunnel. Angel spun with a jerk, pistol up and aiming frantically at ghosts he couldn't see. The flashlight spun strobe-like across the cavern walls. Adrenaline surging, Lena straightened her spine, faced away from the tunnel, and subtly shifted her body to shield it from Angel's view. His fear made him furious, and Lena was the closest target. He whirled on her with a vicious smile. Sykes will carve you up in front of Pope, and then he'll do the same to him. You'll both be begging at the end, and I'll watch it all. Once he's done with you, he's gonna burn through the UP and slaughter anything and anyone who gets in his way. No one is coming for any of you. We can do whatever the hell we want to whoever we want. We can take whatever we want. It's ours. It's all ours. There's no one who can stop us. Lena said nothing. We're going to kill all your friends. Sykes is waiting for them. He's set the trap. They won't even see it coming. Lena didn't react. She stared at her feet, kept herself small and still. After a minute, 
Angel lost interest in taunting her without a reaction. Instead, he messed with the silent radio, his hands shaking, his eyes half crazed as he glared at her. I'm going to the surface for a signal. Don't you dare move. Flashlight in hand, Angel stalked across the cavern into the northern passageway and vanished from view. He left the Coleman lantern behind. Lena closed her eyes and listened to the echoing footfalls fade to nothing, her breathing shallow, conserving her energy except for the frenetic activity behind her. Her wrists bruised and bleeding, she worked feverishly. Her vision darkened as the strength leached from her muscles, suckled by the rapacious, cancerous force inside her. Despite her stubbornness, her willpower. You couldn't outwill biology. Time was her enemy now, a creeping darkness slowly consuming her bit by bit as her body betrayed her. With one final jerk of her arms, the flex tie snapped. Lena's hands were free. Chapter 66 Eli Pope, Day 105 Eli jogged down the hill at Nix's heels. They scrabbled down a steep deer trail through old-growth groves of hardwood and birch, hemlock and maple. A chipmunk scurried across the deer trail. Thick clouds of mosquitoes swirled, biting like they would eat them to the bone. Tell me where we're headed, Echo Two. There was a moment of silence. Alexis said, It looks like they may be headed to the old mineshaft operation. It's a collection of dilapidated buildings. The road takes a long loop around, but there's a dirt trail that cuts through the forest along the creek. You can catch up going that way. They'd hidden their four-wheelers to the south, concealing them off the road, inside the trees, covering them with pine boughs. Now they shoved aside the foliage, ignoring the bugs, and clambered onto the four-wheeler, Nick's behind Eli grasping his waist with one hand and holding her pistol down at her thighs with the other hand. Copy that, Eli said. If they turn onto the main road and head east or west, I won't be able to follow them for more than a couple of miles. The drone will be out of range. We'll lose them. Let's hope they stay close. They took the narrow dirt path winding through the forest. The trees crouched in close. Thorns and brambles scratched their arms and legs as they drove, low branches and twigs slapping at their faces. Five minutes later, Echo 2 verified the jeep had indeed stopped at the old mine shaft. Eli and Nix hid the four-wheeler behind some pine trees a half mile out and closed the distance on foot, keeping the forest between themselves and their targets. Every fifty yards they took a knee and paused behind a tree, boulder, or another natural concealment, intent on listening and looking for sentries, roving patrols, or booby traps. Eli glanced up through the canopy of leaves in growing apprehension. The wind had picked up, whipping at the foliage and obscuring the sound of their movements as the sky transformed to gunmetal gray. Dense, dark clouds roiled above them. He couldn't see or hear the drone hovering several hundred feet above them. Hopefully their targets hadn't noticed it either, or he and Nix would be walking into a death trap. Ahead of them, a clearing appeared. The air smelled of decay and rot. The jumble of rickety buildings was in ruins, with roofs half caved in, and vines and ivy snaking across rotting plank walls. Dusty train tracks choked with weeds meandered through the property. Mining equipment hulked here and there like bleached dinosaur skeletons. It looked like a ghost town. Eli pointed to the two-story building in the center, the red jeep parked beside it. Nix nodded, revolver in hand, her M2010 sniper rifle slung across her back. After circling the perimeter, they approached the rear of the building, they snuck in a low crouch along the northern wall, Eli leading with his rifle as he rounded the corner of the building. Nix was right behind him, covering his six. They crept to the front door, and each took a side. Urgency crackled through him. 
At least two hostels were inside, waiting for them. Maybe more. Either way, they were going in. On the count of three, they exploded into action. Eli whirled and kicked the doorknob. The rotted wood splintered. The door caved inward as he and Nix breached the entryway and surged inside. Eli went low and spun left, while Nix went high and spun right. In the center of the large space, a man knelt over a duffel bag. Startled, he turned toward the threat and reached for a weapon. Eli had him dead to rights, his finger on the trigger, but not squeezing. Not yet. Don't move. On the right, the second hostile raised his long gun and swung it around to shoot at Eli. Nix fired first. The man tumbled backward, stumbling over another duffel bag, and sank onto his butt. With a scream, he dropped the gun and grabbed at his kneecap, which was reduced to a pulpy mess. Blood bubbled from the wound and saturated his pants leg. He was damn lucky Nix was shooting a forty-four Special, and not forty-four Magnum, or he wouldn't have a knee left. Nix aimed her revolver at his center mass. We said, don't move. Defeated, the hostiles raised their hands. They glared at Nix and Eli with pure malevolence. The first man was heavy set. In his thirties, he sported a shaved head and a handlebar mustache, like he wished he were from the Wild West and not a run of the mill thug. A handgun with a suppressor was jammed into the waistband of his pants. He'd run with Sykes in prison, roughing up anyone who dared disobey Sykes's commands. His name was Paul Masek. I know you, Masek growled in a raspy smoker's voice. Funny, I'd completely forgotten about you. Eli recognized the guy with the blown knee. African American and short at five feet six inches, he was lean to the point of emaciation, with prominent buck teeth and the ragged look of a deviant who'd do anything for a fix. Kirk Thompson had once taken a swipe at Eli with a sharpened toothbrush in the mess hall. In retaliation, Eli had cracked three of his ribs and collapsed a lung with Thompson's own toothbrush. Radio's out, Nix commanded. Throw them across the room. Knives and guns, too. Slowly, furiously, the men obeyed. One of the knives skittered across the dusty plank floor and landed at Nix's boot. She didn't look down at it, but kept her gaze scanning their surroundings. Eli ordered them to lay prone on the floor, hands forward, legs crossed, so they couldn't try anything tricky. The one Nix had shot howled in agony as he dropped to the floor on his belly. Nix covered Eli while he secured their hands behind their backs with zip ties, frisked them thoroughly, and removed an ankle pistol from Thompson and a pocket knife from Masek's pocket. Thompson kept howling. Eli needed him quiet. He put his Glock 19 against his skull. Shut up, or I'll gag you, but not before I shoot the other knee. The whining stopped. The man's breathing was deep and ragged. He was shaking, probably from blood loss, but Eli didn't care. While Nix watched their prisoners, Eli swiftly cleared the building finding nothing of interest but a pair of ratty, mildewed sleeping bags in one corner, trash everywhere, and several duffel bags surrounded by footprints in one corner, the telltale bulge of weapons pressing against the canvas. Sykes had used this spot as another makeshift weapons depot. In the center of the main room, a massive support beam held up the moldy ceiling. The stale air smelled faintly of urine. Dust swirled in the dim light streaming through the broken windows. Thick layers of dust coated everything, the floors, the windows, and the walls. The equipment had been salvaged, sold, or stolen decades ago. A minute later, Eli returned. Everything's clear. Check the duffel bags. Nix bent, unzipped a few, and cursed in delight. A whole bunch of toys. AR-15s, ammo and magazines, and better yet, a bunch of flashbangs, smoke grenades, and hand grenades. Eli smiled. Perfect. 
What the hell do you want with us? Masek snarled. You think Sykes is gonna let this go? He'll kill you for this. He's planning to kill me anyway. Guess it doesn't matter what I do, does it? Masek blanched. To Nix, Eli said, In case you feel any qualms about what we're about to do here, Thompson's a serial rapist, and Masek here gets off on beating women. Nix showed her teeth. I'm plumb out of qualms. He wondered briefly at her past, what had made her so hard. There was no time for anything but the mission at hand. He turned to their prisoners. Where is Lena being held in the mine? They stared at him blankly, hate in their eyes, and violence too. Neither man spoke. We need answers, and we're getting them, one way or the other. Masek snorted in derision. He wasn't afraid yet, not nearly enough. Do you know why both of you are still alive? They didn't respond. So I can kill one of you to get the other one to talk. Thompson winced. Masek's expression hardened. Thompson was the more frightened of the two, and already suffering tremendous pain. He was the weakest link. Men who preyed upon women were cowards, every last one of them. Your lives depend on telling us the truth. Tell us what we want to know, and we let you go. Don't tell us. We start shooting body parts. You're going to kill us anyway, Thompson whined. We'll tie you to that load-bearing beam in the center of the room and leave you. If any of your intel comes back rotten and some of my guys get hit, we come back and do things to you that you cannot even imagine. Masek looked dubious. Thompson's frantic gaze darted everywhere but at the gun barrel jammed in his face, his whole body twitching with terror. Cross my heart, hope to die, Eli said. Or we can do things the hard way. I think they're asking for the hard way, Nix said. He angled his chin at Nix. Go ahead. Nix holstered her revolver and drew her K-bar knife. She held the point of the seven-inch carbon steel blade against Thompson's thigh. Hey, wait. Nix didn't wait. She shoved the K-bar into the meaty part of his leg, careful not to hit an artery. No use in him bleeding out before they got the intel. Thompson shrieked in agony, writhing on the floor and kicking up sprays of dust. The coppery smell of blood permeated the air. His breathing went rapid and gasping. Nix put her knee on his back and grabbed his hair. She put the blade against the fold in the top of his ear. A smirk twitched across her face. I can do this all day. What are you using the mine for? Eli asked. Someone answer me, or Thompson loses an ear. Masak had gone pale. Sykes is using abandoned mines as black market shipping hubs. The train offloads the cargo at various strategic locations. Then we transport supplies to regional dealers via truck, horse, four-wheeler, boat, whatever. You've got the meds right here, Nix said. Eli knew she was thinking of the beta blockers her grandmother desperately needed. It made sense. The abandoned mines offered natural refrigeration, were well hidden, and easily defensible. Where is Lena being held? I don't know, Masek insisted. Nix made to shove the blade into Thompson's ear. Thompson shrieked, wait, wait. Nix hesitated. Start talking. Sykes has her in the mine. Duh, Nix said. Tell us something we don't know. Which chamber? Eli asked. The, the second one, on the second level, where most of the meds are. Eli didn't let his expression change. At last, they were getting somewhere. How many guarding her? W one, as far as I know. They've got her tied up. And where is the insulin? The, what? Thompson looked genuinely confused. Insulin, you moron, Nick said. The elixir that keeps diabetics alive. 
He shook his head, frantic. I don't know, man. The second and third chambers on the second level are the storage levels. That's all I know. How many guards are inside? Five, Masek said. Liar. Eli moved so fast, Masek never saw it coming. He drew his combat blade and stabbed Masek's left knee, digging deep. The man let out a keening wail. Eli smiled a terrible smile. A part of him hated himself for relishing this man's pain. Hated that he took pleasure in hurting bad people. Another part of him accepted it. The fury was in him, hard and humming. The darkness he couldn't control, didn't want to control. The devil inside. He was the monster he needed to be. Eli twisted the knife. How many? Thirty-two. Masek screamed. Sykes has everyone at the mine. He says he's going to take out everyone at once. The, the local cops. He was near sobbing from the pain. Beside him, Thompson sagged, moaning softly. He was losing blood and would go into shock soon. I'm running out of time and patience. Eli pressed the knife against Masek's jugular. I don't need both of you. You want to be the first to go? Masek had reached the point of sufficient pain and terror. He couldn't talk fast enough. He gave them what they needed. The number of guards and their locations within the mine. The chamber where the convicts were sleeping. What tunnels were booby-trapped and where the triple arms had been set. And the weapons they had access to. Automatic weapons, grenades, smoke grenades, and one... 50 caliber M2 Browning. In the end, Eli got everything but the exact location of the insulin, and only because these two clowns were too stupid to know what they didn't know. When are you supposed to check in with your superiors? Nix asked. We're out of walkie-talkie range, Masek said dully. We don't have long-range radios. We were just supposed to gather the last load of weapons and bring them to the mine. I predict we've got less than an hour before the alarm bells start going off, Eli said. Time to jet. Nick glared at their prisoners with bloodlust in her eyes. Do we waste them? Tell me we get to waste them. He thought of his promise to Jackson. Lena's face flashed in his mind. In another world, he might have softened, kept his word to Jackson, agreeing to return if their intel was solid, if the team survived the assault, let the goons rot in prison. That world had died. Any semblance of mercy Eli might have retained had died with it. He didn't want to be the sort of man who condemned other men to die, but he was that man. These hardened criminals thought nothing of taking from others, of destroying everything good. They were parasites who preyed upon the weak and defenseless. No more. One less monster in the world meant one more child who slept peacefully in her bed at night. And that was a thing he refused to regret. Kill them, Eli said. But don't waste ammo. You promised you'd let us go. Masek howled. You can't do that. They ignored him. A minute later, it was over. Eli glanced hurriedly at his watch. Fifteen minutes had passed. The clock was ticking. If Jackson hated him for this, then so be it. He spun for the door. Time to go. Nick scrambled for the duffel bags of weapons. Right behind you. Without a second glance, Eli and Nick strode from the derelict building into the gloom. The air buzzed with ozone. It had an acrid taste to it. A storm was coming, a big one. The bleak sky darkened like a stain, as if Mother Nature knew the wicked things they had done and was punishing them. The first drops of rain began to fall. Chapter 67 Eli Pope, Day 105. Rain poured from the sky. It drummed against the tarp, 
water pelting the muddy ground as saplings bent beneath the onslaught. Eli and the others huddled beneath a camouflaged tarp strung between a few trees, making last-minute preparations for the missions ahead. Their faces hardened with determination and resolve, their gear and weapons ready. Jackson was quiet, staring at nothing with a distant look in his eyes. Something was bothering him, but that was a problem for later. Moreno loaded magazines with intense focus, and Antoine thrummed with high, nervous energy. Nix bounced on the balls of her feet, one finger massaging the trigger guard of her M2010 sniper rifle, her jaw set. We go in at nightfall, Eli said grimly. At the next sentry shift, the darkness will give us cover, and the rain and clouds will help us even more. Moreno jutted his chin at the hill across from their position. You want us to climb that, in the pouring rain, in the middle of the night, hoping we don't get shot? Eli gave a rueful smile. Never promised you a rose garden. I'm cheap, Antoine muttered. I'll take pasties as my heavenly reward. As many pasties as I can eat, forever and ever, amen. Eli ignored him and turned his attention to the group. We'll split into two six-person teams like we've trained and enter through the dump site. Once we're in the mine, each team must be capable of being completely independent, since our comms are only line of sight inside, and we can't support each other. Each team is responsible for their wounded and getting them out. If you lose enough people, either dead or wounded, your team may become ineffective, at which point you should exfil immediately. After completing your mission, you'll exit through the main entrance. Once Nix eliminates the sentries at the dump site entrance, she will move to a hide overlooking the main entrance. She'll provide overwatch and will pick off any pursuers with the 300 win mag. Alexis is running the drone. I'm leaving the saw with Devin. Between them, they'll crush any quick reaction force in pursuit, or at least slow them down. But you've got to get out of the labyrinth on your own. Everyone nodded, listening intently. Eli pointed at the map. Bravo, team. You'll move to the lair where Sykes's men have hunkered down, here in the fourth chamber, on the second level. You should find at least eight hostels, maybe ten or more, sleeping. A few may be awake, prepping weapons, eating, etc. Use the IR infrared glow sticks and IR illuminators if it's pitch dark. They'll never know what hit them. If there's ambient light, use the normal setting on your NVGs. You're gonna be outnumbered, so this is your biggest advantage. Do this right and most of the people you're going to kill will wake up dead. If you lose the element of surprise, use the grenades instead, and make sure you have cover when you throw them. Your primary objective is to eliminate as many of Sykes's men as you can. With prejudice. They're a plague, and they need to be wiped from the face of the earth. Now that deserves an amen, Nick said. Hell yeah, Marino said. Eli continued. Antoine and I will lead Alpha Team to retrieve the hostage and get her and our men out of this hellhole alive. Distant lightning pulsed, the growl of thunder swallowed by the thrashing trees. The wind whipped the tarp with a snapping sound. Rain drummed against the canvas and battered the underbrush, turning the rocky ground slick with rivulets of muddy brown water. Speed surprise, and overwhelming violence of action, Eli said. That's our best chance at success. He didn't say it was their only chance, that the odds of success were incredibly low, or that the odds of everyone surviving this operation were even lower. He didn't say that he alone was going to make damn sure Sykes didn't survive. Sykes was determined to kill the people Eli loved. Therefore, he had to die, even at the cost of Eli's life. Chapter 68 Lena Easton, Day 105 
Lena climbed to her feet, swayed dizzily, and stumbled across the cavern, collapsing against the crate containing the insulin. Her bruised fingertips stung as she fumbled at the heavy-duty plastic wrapping the boxes in tough, impenetrable layers, attempting to scratch it open with her fingernails to no avail. She needed a knife, anything sharp at all. Breathing hard, she bent and gnawed at the corner of the crate with her teeth. An explosion of agony radiated from her nose and jaw. Bright white stars burst in front of her eyes in dizzying shockwaves, her legs turning watery as she sagged against the crate, gasping. Trying to bite through the thick plastic hurt so much she nearly passed out. Hunger and thirst scoured her insides. Her diabetic headache pulsed like a vice against her skull. The raw skin of her wrists burned, and her broken nose throbbed. Groaning in pain and frustration, she splayed her palm against the Eli Lilly symbol emblazoned across the refrigerated container for balance. Her thoughts were fuzzy, but the irony hadn't escaped her. The name of the insulin manufacturing company that kept her alive shared the name of her lover and her dead sister. What a cruel, bitter joke. Scanning the cavern, she considered her options. There were two passageways. The larger northern tunnel through which Angel had departed moments ago, which seemed like a bad idea, and the smaller passageway to the south that likely led deeper into the labyrinth of the mine. Either option was far from safe. Even if one of Sykes's men didn't shoot her, she was liable to get lost in the warren of subterranean tunnels, alone, sick, and blind in the dark. That left the small hole in the wall behind her. The tube, around two feet in circumference, began a foot from the cavern floor and was large enough for a slender person to squeeze through. Where did it lead? Someone had dug it out for a purpose. Maybe it would be her salvation, or maybe it would lead to her death. The unknown was terrifying. Either way, it was her only option. Lowering herself to her hands and knees, she squeezed between the stack of crates and the cavern wall and disappeared into the black shaft. Somewhere ahead of her, she heard the almost comforting squeak and scuttle of the rat. Rocks surrounded her. She scooched on her belly, legs flat out behind her, her arms squeezed close to her body. Claustrophobia constricted her lungs. She'd never feared tight spaces before, but she'd reached an entirely new level of terror. The rock was damp and slick beneath her fingers, a faint, foul smell of things that had lived and died a hundred years ago. Hundreds of feet below the surface, a hundred million tons of rock bore down on her. The only sound, her ragged breath, and the scratch and scrape of her feet and arms as she inched her way forward. The crown of her head bumped against the rock ceiling, her arms and legs cramped in the ever-tightening space. Inch by inch, the tube narrowed, shrinking down on her, constricting her body as if she'd been swallowed by a great snake. The dim glow from the Coleman lantern disappeared as she crawled further into the tube. As the profound darkness enveloped her, she could no longer see her hands or anything else. She was utterly blind. A squeak near her ear. Tiny claws pricked her hand. She swallowed a cry of alarm, half expecting small teeth to clamp down on her fingers. She went rigid as the weight of a small body scurried across her arm and shoulder, down her spine and over her legs. She couldn't move, couldn't even recoil. Just like that, the rat was gone, and she was once again utterly alone. The shaft narrowed further. She could hardly push herself forward. Panic snatched at her with seeking fingers. She shuddered trembling and dizzy from the hyperglycemia. What if she got stuck? What if? Her outstretched hands struck rock. She felt blindly in front of her, above her head, to either side. Everywhere she touched, there was more rock. A dead end. 
No, she whispered. Please, no. Despair curdled in her belly. She'd accomplished nothing worthwhile with her freedom. Angel would return at any moment and bring Sykes with him. They would torture and kill her. She could stay in the shaft and pray they didn't find her. But that was a futile hope. Since the shaft was 20 or 30 feet deep at most, they'd find the hole. Her captors couldn't crawl in after her, but they didn't need to. A bullet would do the job. Her corpse would remain stuck here forever, her flesh dissolving, her clothes rotting, until she was naught but a pile of bones to be discovered a hundred years from now, if ever. She would die in this place, mere feet from the medication she desperately needed but could not access, put down like a frantic animal caught in a snare. A sob tore from her throat. She slumped against the rock, digging into her belly and thighs, and pressed her cheek to the cold ground, tears streaming down her face, her chest heaving. This was the end, then. No way out. She was well and truly trapped. There was a kind of relief in acceptance, in surrendering to the inevitable, abandoning the struggle for survival, a giving up of your very self. No, her mind whispered. No, she could not give up. It wasn't a part of her makeup. She didn't know how. She thought of Shiloh, of Eli. No, she could not quit, not ever. If these were her last moments, then so be it. She wasn't going out without a fight. Not like this, trapped and helpless prey. Lena lifted her head. The tears dried on her face. Through the haze of panic, she forced herself to think, to do something, anything, as long as it was action. Her hands again felt the uneven rock face, searching for anything she might have missed in the darkness. Along the floor of the tunnel, to her left, near her elbow, her thumb grazed something foreign, something that was not rough-hewn rock. She fumbled clumsily in the dark, her fingers doing the work of her eyes, feeling the object, the long, skinny rail, the shallow cup holder, the hook on one side, and the sharply pointed end. It was about ten inches long and two inches wide. She recognized it as would any student who'd toured the historic copper mines on a field trip. During the early mining days in the 1800s, the miners used an implement called a sticking tommy. It was an old-fashioned candlestick, forged from iron. On one end was a candle holder. On the other end was a long, thin spike used to drive into a wood beam or rocky crevice to light the area where the miner worked for 12 to 14 hours a day. How long had this implement laid here? Had a child worker left it behind a hundred years ago, crawling into this narrow shaft to chip out a vein of copper he couldn't even see? She didn't know, and it didn't matter. This was a gift she must not waste. Her fingers closed around the sticking Tommy. Using her feet, pushing with her free hand, she squirmed backward, keeping her head low her stomach scraping over stone. The rock walls clutched at her, closing in. She fought for every inch, heart thumping and mouth dry. Her blood rushed in her ears. Two feet, four feet, then five feet. Every movement was agonizingly slow. Distant footsteps echoed from the northern passageway. Adrenaline shot through her veins. She wriggled backward, desperately pushing and shoving, scrabbling with her feet and her hands. Her palms were scraped and bleeding, but she barely noticed. The footsteps grew louder. Extricating herself from the tunnel, legs first, she jerked free and dove for the crate. Leaning against it, she slumped her legs, curled beneath her, and hands behind her back as if her wrists were still bound, the candlestick palmed in one hand. Not a second later, four men burst into the room, Angel and Sykes and two others, big, muscular guys with hard faces and harder eyes. They were armed with bulky weapons, 
wore chest rigs with helmets, with their MVGs pushed up off their faces. Darius Sykes crossed the cavern and squatted in front of her, about five feet away. His lips spread in a lurid smile. Terror juddered through her body. Her heart jackhammered against her ribs, threatening to beat out of her chest. She tightened her grasp on the sticking Tommy, keeping it carefully hidden behind her, and tried to look weak. It wasn't difficult. She was weak. But she was not as feeble as they thought. If Sykes would only come a few feet closer, he'd be within range of her weapon. She would kill him if she could, to give Eli and the others a slightly better chance at surviving this hellhole. If only he would come a little closer. Sykes licked his lips, like he was anticipating a delicious meal. There was something obscene in his face, the wrongness, a lurch in Lena's gut. There was pure evil in this world. She was face to face with it in human form. Go to hell, she said softly, so he had to bend toward her to hear her words. Sykes grinned. Hell is empty, and all the devils are here. Not all of them, Lena said. One is out there, and he's coming for you. Sykes gave a hollow, echoing laugh. <laughs> You've got some spunk in you, don't you? Come closer, she whispered, and I'll show you. That time is coming soon enough, don't you worry. Instead of coming closer, he rose to his feet, still just out of reach. He gazed at her hungrily, like he wanted to devour her. Oh, I am going to enjoy this. Chapter 69, Shiloh Easton, Day 105 Fear rattled through Shiloh's chest. Thick black clouds roiled across Lake Superior from the west, coming in hard as sheets of rain pounded the wave-lashed water. There was no moon, no kaleidoscope of stars. Behind her, the trees bent beneath the onslaught. Shiloh and Ruby lay on their bellies in the sniper hide Eli had built along the edge of the bluff a perfect position for sentries to watch for threats attempting to infiltrate the Northwoods Inn from the water. The high bluffs were a significant obstacle for an assault, making it the least likely spot for a breach, which was the only reason Eli allowed Shiloh and Ruby to keep watch. On the lip of the precipice, it felt like balancing on the knife edge of the world itself. Shiloh had never felt so small. Mother Nature didn't give one whit for the doings of humanity, not when the sun blasted a billion tons of plasma at Earth, and not now, as the trees writhed, the great lake raged, and the wind roared. The sheer immensity of Superior was overwhelming. It felt like an ocean, a raging sea, with all the power of Poseidon behind it. Waves eight to ten feet high crashed and rolled against the cliffs below. Nature's wrath came sudden and powerful. She blinked back the wetness and peered intently through her scope, blurry shapes materializing out of darkness, swaying trees to her left and right, the jagged ledge of the limestone cliff a few feet ahead. The great bowl of the sky was gray as ashes. The stinging rain slashed against her head and shoulders, the wind bitterly cold as it tore at her hair and lashed wet tendrils into her face. We should go, Ruby shouted beside her. This is dangerous. Her face was a ghastly white oval, a foot from Shiloh's, her eyes huge in her pale face, red hair a drenched pelt against her scalp. Shiloh, this is my job. I'm doing my job. No boats can get near us in this storm. They'd crash against the shoals and kill themselves. We need to go inside and get warm. We're the ones in trouble. The fierce squalls blowing across the lake felt like being sucked into the spin cycle of a washing machine. They were powerless against it. 
like the solar flares. All you could do was hold on to something and hope you made it through to the other side. Ruby was right. Of course she was right. But Shiloh did not move. Her muscles stiff and sore, her body fixed rigidly in place. If she abdicated her responsibility to keep watch, the storm would destroy everything and everyone she loved. You go, she shouted. No way, Ruby hesitated. We should check on Bear. Ruby was trying to guilt Shiloh into leaving. Bear was going to be okay. Lori was watching him now. But for the last two days, Bear hadn't left Shiloh's side. She had tended to his bullet wound, cleaning it, applying antiseptic, and reapplying his bandages. But it was Lena the Newfie wanted. The dog sensed Lena's absence keenly and kept shuffling to the door, rising on his hind legs and checking the windows, whining for Lena. He'd slept beside the door to Lena's room, moaning in his sleep, his paws twitching like he was chasing her, desperately searching for her, even in his dreams. Shiloh shared his anguish. She was terrified for Lena and for Eli. She had found her father, only to risk losing him, and there wasn't a damn thing she could do about it. She longed to fight everything, to shoot the storm, to stab the waves, to pound the world until it retreated and gave her back what she so desperately wanted. Shiloh couldn't explain it, this desolate feeling, the desperate ache in her chest. She felt it in her heart, in her soul, the slow drain of hope and the end of all things. There was so much brokenness, in the old world and this new one. So much wrongness, danger and fear and despair, pain and loss. I need to stay, she said. I, I have to stay. Stubbornly, Ruby shook her head. If you stay, I stay. Shiloh opened her mouth but nothing came out. Rain ran down her face like tears. Maybe they were tears, salty on her tongue. She was weeping, and she couldn't stop, didn't know how to stop. Santiago, Chile. Bogota, Colombia. Brasilia, Brazil. Ruby took her wet, ice-cold hand in her own and squeezed hard. Startled, almost embarrassed. Shiloh's first instinct was to pull away. She forced herself not to. Instead, she squeezed Ruby's hand right back. Despite the chill, the cold rain soaking her to the bone, warmth seeped into her chest. This was a true friend then, the one who stays, who refuses to let go, the one who holds our hand in the dark of night, who bears witness while we painstakingly put ourselves back together, piece by shattered piece. The wind roared like a train bearing down on them, snatching at their clothes, tugging at their hair, threatening to hurl them over the edge as easily as tossing a doll. They braced themselves and held on. Chapter 70 Eli Pope, Day 105 they moved in the rain and darkness, silent and lethal predators. Eli climbed the steep incline, his hair plastered to his scalp beneath his helmet, water dripping down the back of his neck, pouring into his face, droplets clinging to his eyelashes as he peered through his NVGs, the world awash with an eerie alien green light. Jackson, Antoine, and Moreno climbed beside him. Hart and Nash remained on the ground at the base of the hill, hidden in a dense cluster of spruce, their rifles swiveling in search of targets as the teams ascended the rock-strewn hillside. Rifles slung across their backs, weighted down with chest rigs, body armor, and battle belts loaded with spare magazines, they scrabbled up the slick bedrock, using slippery footholds and handholds, layers of unstable rocks shifting beneath their feet and hands, threatening to twist an ankle, or worse. The pouring rain made the ascent difficult, but the steady drumming obscured the noise of their climb, 
the rain a thick gray curtain blurring the landscape. Above them, Nix lay in her sniper hide across the ravine, sighting through the scope of her rifle, an M2010 enhanced sniper rifle knockoff she had built to U.S. Army standards, chambered in 300 Winchester Magnum with a large suppressor and an AN PVS-29 clip-on sniper night sight. It was a beautiful, lethal weapon. She was ready to eliminate the two sentries the second they appeared, so that they couldn't radio an alarm to their comrades. Those down in the mine were unreachable, but Devon had eyes on at least four sentries manning the main entrance. Halfway up, three feet to Eli's right, Antoine balanced on one foot and reached for an outcropping to hoist himself to his next handhold. The rock he'd put his weight on wobbled, his boot slipped. With a curse, he scrambled to regain his purchase. A dozen loosened stones skittered noisily down the hillside. Everyone froze. The men pressed their bodies against the rock, clinging like spiders, barely breathing. Eli tensed, the stitches in his forearm burning. Antoine turned his head to face Eli, his face a white oval in the heavy rain, eyes wide with fear. They were utterly exposed. If the sentries peered over the edge, they'd get picked off like fish in a barrel. At least thirty men, armed with automatic weapons, would converge on them within minutes. They heard something, Nick said into their headsets. Sentry one is moving toward the mouth of the tunnel. Sentry two is right behind him. They both have their guns up. Come on, come on. One more step. Come out into the open. Nix, Antoine said tensely. I got this, Nix said through their headsets. If one of them gets their hands on the radio. I said I got it, Nix said. Shut up and watch the magic happen. A spitting sound split the night air. A second later, another sound followed the first. Something tumbled down the rock face, bouncing and spinning past them in a dark blur. A body. Two seconds later, a second body followed the first. Eli clung to the hillside and glanced down. Two corpses lay bent and broken on the piled rocks, a small round hole in the center of their foreheads, the backs of their skulls completely gone. The 300 Win Mag was originally built to hunt elephants and was adopted by Army and Marine snipers alike for its superior ballistic performance at long range. Against human targets, it was devastating. Bullseye, Nix crowed. Don't try that at home, boys. Relieved, Eli continued to climb. Jackson and Antoine followed, faster now, but still careful of the slippery rocks, their clothes soaked through and their skin sodden. In the torrential rain, they were vague, washed out shapes, indistinct at the edges. He clambered over the edge onto the wide ledge that led into the mine. A barred iron gate with a rusty padlock had once kept out the looky loos. The lock was broken, likely by a sledgehammer or bolt cutter. Jackson and Moreno aimed their weapons into the tunnel, while Eli and Antoine crouched at the mouth and scanned the base of the hill and surrounding trees, searching for a hint of movement. Below them, Bravo team scrabbled up the slick hillside. Several rocks broke free and plunged down the hill, but no hostiles appeared. Once everyone had reached the ledge, Chief McAllister led Bravo team into the mine in search of the fourth chamber, intent on eliminating as many of Sykes's men as they could. Then it was Alpha team's turn. They entered the mouth of the tunnel, swallowed by the darkness as they crept down the throat of the mine. It felt like descending into the underworld the house of Hades itself. They formed a double column, Antoine and Eli in the lead, Eli on the right, Antoine on the left. Moreno and Hart stacked up behind Eli, while Jackson and Nash stacked up behind Antoine. Eli had night vision goggles with illuminators attached to the NVGs, and IR glow sticks tucked into a pouch on his chest rig, along with several flashbangs and five fragmentation grenades 
they'd stolen from Sykes's men. IR wasn't normally used by tactical teams, since hostiles with night vision could see their exact location. But in situations with zero ambient light, like this damn mine, they were a necessary evil. They each wore headsets, though their comm system only worked within line of sight underground. Each team could communicate with their teammates, but no one else. They were cut off from the world above. Bravo team had headed left at the first forked passageway, while Alpha team turned right. Stepping quietly, they crept through the darkened shafts. The cold, dank air smelled of sediment and rust. Their clothing and gear made soft rustling sounds, but they were otherwise silent. Eli had memorized the blueprints of the mine, but faded lines on a piece of paper and the reality of deep subterranean tunnels were very different things. A maze of larger tunnels and small tributaries branched off in various directions. The signs of long dormant mining activity littered the passageways. Holes drilled in the rock for dynamite and rusted tools and ancient implements left behind like detritus. They stepped over strips of original rail tracks, old-fashioned drill steels, and iron candle holders. When they approached a side tunnel, three team members entered and cleared the first 20 feet, while Antoine and Eli held their guns forward and Nash pointed to the rear to cover their six. Once the tunnel was cleared, the three fell back into the stack, and the double column proceeded down the passageway. A long, straight tunnel stretched ahead of them. Eli motioned, and three men moved up, while three remained behind the turn to provide cover. They executed the same move for every turn, every abandoned minecart, and every tall cairn of piled rocks. In this way, they moved cautiously from cover point to cover point. Eli hated the claustrophobia, the feeling of exposure as they moved in the narrow tunnels. Ballistic shields would have offered significant protection in these labyrinthine corridors, but the deputies weren't trained in how to use them, and neither the rural sheriff's office nor the police department had the budget to purchase them anyway. Ahead, the tunnel forked in two directions. The left passageway was eight feet wide by ten feet tall, with a six-foot-tall pile of rocks stacked near the entrance like a giant cairn. To the right, the shaft was low-ceilinged and narrow. According to the intel they'd gleaned from Masek, the left passageway was booby-trapped with a trip-wired grenade just past the cairn. Eli checked and caught the gleam of the thin filament stretched across the tunnel at ankle height. Alpha team headed to the right and followed the tunnel straight a few hundred feet before it curved into a bend with no sightline beyond it. At the front of the double column, Antoine and Eli stopped, took a knee, and listened hard. The men behind them did the same. No sounds of approaching hostiles were heard, only the beating of their hearts and the rustle of their breathing. Eli was about to gesture to Antoine to move into the right branch of another forked passageway. He froze. The reddish glow of the IR illuminated a silvery thread about an inch off the ground. Another tripwire. Eli held up a closed fist. Antoine followed his lead. Behind them, Alpha Team halted. Eli followed the slender wire with his eyes, to the grenade lodged in a crevice hidden in the shadows. Motioning to his team, he gingerly stepped across the wire. They continued, crouched and stealthy, descending steadily into the bowels of the earth, moving silently through the labyrinth. Repeatedly, Antoine and Eli took a knee and paused, straining their ears. Eli's laceration stung, the stitches pulling with his movements. He wasn't healed, but there was nothing for it. Lena would pitch a fit. If that meant she was alive, he'd accept a hundred lectures. He started to rise. Then he heard it. Pebbles crunched underfoot. Far ahead, a single pair of footsteps approached from around the bend. A small pen light beam appeared, sweeping back and forth across the tunnel walls. Eli motioned to his team, 
then bladed himself against the wall, dropping the HK-417 on its sling and drawing his combat knife. Moreno and Nash followed suit behind him, while Antoine's column pressed themselves against the opposite tunnel wall. Adrenaline spiked his veins as he tensed, waiting. A second later, the hostel appeared around the corner. Big and burly, he gazed straight ahead with his weapons holstered, his guard down. The flashlight obscured his night vision. Eli was on him in a heartbeat. He clamped one hand over the thug's mouth and punched the tip of the knife upward into the back of the man's neck, piercing the base of his brainstem and killing him nearly instantly. The man crumpled. Eli lowered the corpse to the ground as Alpha Team fell back into position, stepping over the body as they approached the first of the large caverns. Eli peered around the corner, leading with his weapon. According to Masek, Sykes didn't have men stationed here. Their IR lights didn't reach the opposite side of the cavern. He sensed a vast openness. The subterranean room was immense. He loathed the thought of crossing the exposed space, but the passage leading to Lena was located through this cavern. There was no way out, but through. Eli and Antoine led in a half crouch, weapons up and ready scanning ahead. The others followed. They moved through the darkness. The blood rushed in his ears. He counted off the steps. Ten. Twenty. Thirty. A sound came from ahead of them. Before Eli could react, the first hostiles appeared. From the opposite end of the cavern, several thugs strode into the cavern, beams of light sweeping the walls and ceiling. Startled, they halted in their tracks. Eli glimpsed seven shadowy figures carrying AR-15s and AK-47s held low, tactical flashlights affixed to their weapons. Alpha Team reacted first. Swiftly retreating, the six-man team laid down rapid fire. Shouts and gunfire exploded as they dove for cover behind the rear tunnel wall. Rounds sprayed the ceiling. Plucking a grenade from his pouch, Eli pulled the pin and hurled it into the cavern, ducking into the passage just as the thugs unleashed a barrage of firepower. In anticipation of the pressure blast, Eli closed his eyes and opened his mouth. Someone shouted, Grenade! A thunderous boom trembled the cavern wall, seemingly the mine itself. A cacophony of tortured screams rent the air. Even with the noise-canceling headsets, it was deafening. Eli's ears rang, sound going dim. Unlike the movies, there was no massive fireball. The frag grenade boasted a kill radius of five meters, with casualties up to 15 meters, approximately the size of the cavern itself. A moment later, Alpha Team leaped up and darted into the cavern, searching for targets to eliminate. The weapon lights on the ground provided enough ambient light for the NVGs, so they could see the entire chamber now. Smoke hung heavy in the air. A thousand fragments of twisted metal scattered across the cavern floor. There were five men on the ground. Two were ripped to pieces and appeared to be dead. Three writhed on the floor, disoriented and mortally wounded, screaming in agony. Antoine swung right and fired at two of the injured. Eli went left and put a headshot into the dead guys to ensure the dead stayed dead. Nash and Hart fanned out, each moving across a section of the cavern and eliminated two more enemy combatants. At the far end of the cavern, one of the hostiles sat propped against the wall, his right leg a bloody wreck, but he was conscious and firing. Rounds pinged and cracked above their heads. Nash dropped to one knee, fired twice, and missed. Jackson spun and squeezed a double tap. Both rounds caught him in the face. The thug sagged against the wall, very dead. The hostiles wore ballistic vests and headgear, their NVGs pushed up. Little good it had done them. So much for stealth. Antoine reached down and seized an M4 from one of the corpses. 
An M203 grenade launcher was attached beneath the barrel of the M4. Antoine grinned like it was his birthday. This sweet baby will do some damage. Jackson motioned toward the opposite tunnel. Time to move. Let's go. If their presence hadn't been discovered yet, they'd surely been exposed now. Tension thrummed through Eli, his nerves raw. The seconds counted down in his blood. Lena's time was running out. Chapter 71 Lena Easton, Day 105 Rapid footsteps echoed from the opposite tunnel. Lena looked up as a huge man appeared. In his thirties, he boasted big, meaty hands and a muscular body writhing with tattoos. A jagged scar cut deep into his leathery right cheek. He carried an automatic rifle with a pistol stuffed into the back of his jeans. This better be good news, Huffman, Sykes said, his attention still on Lena. Gar and Reynolds didn't report in as scheduled. I sent Clayton to check on them. Sykes went still. Anyone else missing? Huffman hesitated for just a moment. Well, Thompson and Masek should have been back 20 minutes ago, but the storm could have slowed them. It's Pope, Sykes growled. We don't know that, Huffman said. Sykes rounded on him. Of course it's him. It's too early. How the hell did he find us? I don't know. That was a rhetorical question, you idiot. Rouse the men and tell them to prepare for an attack, now. Again, Huffman hesitated. Go, Sykes snarled. Don't come back until those deputies are dead. Every single one of them. Hang them by their entrails from the nearest tree. Let every law officer know from here to Marquette who's in charge now and what happens to the cockroaches dumb enough to stand in our way. With a curt nod, Huffman vanished down the main tunnel. Sykes jutted his chin at his other men. Guard the tunnels. No one, in or out, without my say-so. As they obeyed, Sykes turned to Angel. Pope thinks he's getting one up on us, does he? We'll start with her now. Her screams will draw him. When he sees her shattered body, he will know he's already lost. I will break him before I gut him. Panic torqued through her. Eli was coming for her, but too late. Her vision went indistinct and hazy. Her limbs were full of lead. She was too weak to do anything to help him or herself. So she did the one thing she could do. She went limp. Her muscles turned to water, her bones liquid. She slumped against the side of the crate, her arms behind her back as if bound, her face slack. Wake up, Angel shouted at her. She didn't respond. Angel strode over to her and kicked her savagely in the ribs, knocking her onto her side. The pain was like a hot poker to her kidneys. He put his boot on her throat, cutting off her breath. Only slightly more pressure, and he'd snap her neck like a twig. It took every ounce of her self-control to remain still. Angel removed the boot from her throat and nudged her ribs. I said, wake up! She didn't move. She was insubstantial as air, a wraith, a ghost. What's wrong with her? Sykes demanded. She said she was diabetic, that she could go into a coma or something. Sykes cursed. That explains why Pope ambushed the freight train. Damn it! I thought she was lying. Check her stomach. She'll have a pump or something. A shadow fell across her body. She sensed a figure looming over her, smelled the sour tang of Angel's sweat, that dank, unwashed scent of him. He squatted, searching fingers like spiders beneath her shirt. She fought the urge to recoil from his touch. Ah, uh, no pump, but she's got a weird hole thing in her side. Guess she was telling the truth. 
She's breathing, but she's unconscious. Sykes cursed louder. You worthless moron. I should have put a bullet in your belly back on the prison transport. Fix her. What do you want me to do? For a moment, neither man spoke. There was only the sound of their ragged breathing. Lena remained utterly still, eyes closed, body limp. Her right hand, gripping the sticking Tommy, flopped behind her, out of view in the shadows cast by the stacked crates. Pope won't know the difference. He'll think I killed her. Either way, I'll rub his face in her bloody entrails. Sykes's words were calm and controlled, but fury laced his soft voice. There was a sound like the scrape of a knife sliding from its sheath. Bring her over here, into the light. I like to see my handiwork. Angel bent over her. His pungent breath struck her face. His clammy hands grasped her shoulders, yanking at her, pulling her up to drag her to her death. There came another sound, much louder, a distant rumble like thunder, or the throaty growl of a dragon wakening from its slumber, deep beneath the earth. Surely it was Eli, coming for her. Angel jerked his head up. What the hell? Pope is here, Sykes shouted, half enraged, half panicked. Kill her! Before Angel could act, Lena's eyes popped open. She seized the gangbanger's shirt with one hand, yanking him toward her and knocking him off balance. He froze, bewildered that she had two hands free when she should be bound and helpless. He was more surprised at the strange, sharp object in her hand. With the last of her strength, Lena rose and thrust the stake into Angel Flood's tattooed throat, right below his frantically bobbing Adam's apple. The stake sank three inches deep. His mouth gaped, eyes bulging. Blood spilled, hot and wet, across her chest. As he collapsed on top of her, she whispered, That's for shooting my dog. Chapter 72 Eli Pope, Day 105 Eli motioned toward a passageway to their right. He and Antoine took the lead as the team fell into position behind them. They crossed the cavern and entered the broad passage which wound to the left before straightening out. Performing a tactical reload, Eli dropped the half-used magazine into an empty pouch on his chest rig, grasped a fresh one from a different pouch, and slammed it in. Thirty yards down the tunnel, two more hostiles appeared. Spotting them, the armed men broke into a run, firing wildly with automatic weapons. Jackson, Nash, Hart, and Moreno dove to the ground. Eli and Antoine crouched low against opposite sides of the tunnel wall. Adrenaline spiking, Eli fired two shots at the first assailant. He missed, and both shots went high. Rounds impacted all around them, pinging and sparking off rock. The sheer volume of firepower was deafening. Aiming for center mass, Eli squeezed off two more rounds. They struck the first target in his groin and shattered his pelvis. As he fell, Eli fired a kill shot into his temple. The second assailant fired rounds that zipped over Eli's head. Before Eli could reacquire the second target, a massive boom sounded. Antoine had fired the grenade launcher beneath the barrel of his newly acquired M4. The massive tube held a buckshot round, lead pellets spraying the second hostile's vest, groin, and throat. The result was instantaneous. The man toppled with a tortured shriek of agony. Death followed within seconds. Simultaneously, a third man emerged from a side tunnel just behind Antoine and Eli. He ran down the tunnel, careening toward them like a demon, bullets flying. Hart swung over Eli's shoulder and fired, hit him in the right collarbone, and fired again. The round pierced his upper thigh. The thug tumbled backward, still firing, his finger twitching on the trigger. He's hit, but not down, Hart yelled. 
Eli spun and put a kill shot in the center of the thug's forehead. He sure is now. Beside him, Jackson ejected his spent magazine and shoved in a fresh one. Me and Moreno are going to check the tunnel and make sure there aren't any more. Jackson and Moreno moved into the mouth of the passageway. Nash leaned against the wall, weapon lowering as he glanced down at his leg with a curse. You okay, man? Antoine asked. In the light from the IR illuminators, Eli saw blood oozing from a hole in Nash's pants leg on the outside of his upper right thigh. Winged, Nash said between gritted teeth. I'm okay. It's okay. Like hell, we're checking you first. Antoine, cover me. Eli squatted in front of Nash. Pull your pants down, kid. Either that or I cut them off. This is no time for modesty. Nash made a pained face, but obeyed. Eli checked the wound. It was a graze, a bloody notch, a half inch deep in the meat of his upper thigh. It had hurt like hell, but wasn't lethal. Reaching for his eye fac, Eli quickly wrapped it in a pressure bandage. You sure you're okay to keep going? We can come back for you. Nash clenched his jaw. No way you're leaving me behind. I'm good. Moreno and Jackson returned. No one in the tunnel. We're good to go. Eli rose to his feet. We're almost there. Keep your heads on a swivel. The team rose, resumed their loose formation, and kept going. Urgency crackled through them. They stepped over the corpses, moving fast. Blood trickled down Eli's left arm. He'd ripped his stitches open, but the adrenaline masked the pain. He ignored it and kept moving, always moving. A minute later, the acoustics changed. A large space opened up ahead. He strained his ears, listening to the distant voices reverberating. He inhaled the dank mineral scents of the mine, mixed with the smell of kerosene. This was it. Everything was on the line, for Lena and for the men under his command. Eli was determined to get his team past the fatal funnel of the chamber entrance. If they didn't get this right, people would die. Crouching, Eli and Antoine peered around the corner. Low lantern light shimmered from the entrance, light enough that they didn't need their NVGs. They pushed the goggles up on their helmets. I can't see Lena, Eli whispered. No flashbangs or grenades. When I say now, I want Jackson and Antoine to go in, crossing left and right. Once you get to the far corners, open up. Nash and Moreno, go in after me, one on each side, and head toward the crates in the center section, which we'll use as cover. Hart, you hold back, covering the rear. Antoine said, Stay frosty. Hart gave a thumbs up. When Eli gave the cue through their comms, Jackson sprinted into the second cavern, weapon up and swiveling to the left, 90 degrees from the tunnel entrance. Antoine went in fast, pointing his weapon 90 degrees to the right. Eli, Nash, and Moreno spread out behind them in a fan pattern, moving forward to cover the perimeter of the massive chamber. Hart remained at the tunnel entrance, crouched and peering backward, covering their rear for threats. The cavern was immense, grand and high-ceilinged as a cathedral. Stacks of large crates and boxes circled the perimeter. Lantern light wavered across the rough-hewn walls. In the center of the cavern, four armed thugs spun to face them, automatic weapons rising. Gunfire sprayed in wild arcs. Rounds impacted the cavern's walls and ceiling, chipping bedrock and thudding into wooden crates. Eli dove to the ground. A dozen rounds blasted over his head. Rolling hard, he came up in a combat crouch and squeezed the trigger in rapid succession, firing a zipper across the closest man's chest. The first two rounds struck body armor. The next two punched into his throat and skull. The man slammed back against a crate and slid to the ground. Eli swung left and fired at a thug bringing his weapon to bear. Several rounds impacted body armor, and the last one hit pay dirt. 
The bullet drilled into his mouth and tore off half his face as he went down with a garbled scream. Eli was already scanning for the next target with his weapon. Incoming, Moreno shouted, on the left. At his nine o'clock, Nash and Moreno crouched to the side of a stack of crates. They opened fire as a half dozen of Sykes's men poured into the cavern from a side tunnel. They unleashed a barrage of firepower, but imprecisely, muzzles bouncing with each jarring step, their aim veering wildly. Rounds thudded and thumped all around them, sparking off stone. The hostiles were caught in their own fatal funnel. They were dropped one by one as Nash and Moreno returned fire. Five, five, six rounds slamming into body parts not protected by the ceramic plates in their chest rigs. Eli saw an opportunity. Nash and Moreno, when I start moving, head to the boxes ahead. Antoine and Jackson, pour on fire when we go. We got you, brother. Antoine and Jackson crept along the perimeter, shooting steady cover fire, keeping a clear line of sight from Nash and Moreno as they moved forward. When Moreno and Nash reached their cover positions, they opened up on the men, crouched inside the opposite tunnel, as Antoine, Jackson, and Eli moved forward. On the far right, at Eli's three o'clock, a figure cowered on the ground between two crates, seeking cover from the firefight. Lena. A body lay beside her, blood spurting from its throat. One of the thugs ran toward her, likely to put a gun to her head and use her as a hostage. Before Eli could readjust and aim, Antoine took the goon down, stitching rounds across his torso from his crotch to his throat. He crumpled ten feet from Lena. Eli had no time to feel relief. The rat-a-tat of an AK-47 split the air. Rounds sprayed the walls, ricocheting off the stone. He spun to the right, weapon swiveling. Across the cavern, Sykes dropped his Kalashnikov rifle. The 30-round magazine run dry. He wore no plate carrier or battle belt with extra magazines. Sykes fled through a secondary tunnel to the right. Jackson and Moreno spun and fired at him. Both shots missed. Sykes slipped between two crates and darted into the shaft firing behind him with his pistol as he escaped. The thunder of gunfire faded, the enemy combatants either dead or fleeing. Eli's ears rang, and his nostrils filled with the stink of gunpowder. With the rest of Alpha Team covering the tunnels, Eli went to Lena. Angel Flood writhed on the ground beside her. Blood gurgled from his punctured throat, mouth gawping like a dying fish his limbs spasming. Without an iota of remorse, Eli shot the gangbanger between the eyes. Lena was covered with blood. Blood spattered across her shirt, her face, and her hands. Her skin was bone white, her eyes closed. A blood-drenched implement lay at her feet. Fear punched his chest. For a heart-wrenching moment, he didn't know if she was alive or dead. Kneeling beside her, his rifle in one hand, he touched her cheek. Lena. Her eyelids fluttered, then opened. Her eyes were the most beautiful he'd ever seen. He checked her over quickly. A broken nose, bruises, a few scrapes. Most of the blood wasn't hers. I knew you'd come, she said. He was already rising to his feet. We have to get you out of here. Insulin, Lena gasped. He looked around at the hundreds of crates. Where is it? She pointed weakly at a crate across the cavern. Jackson went to it and tore it open. They'd brought a syringe with them, along with her blood glucose meter. Within moments, they'd found what they needed. He hadn't known whether Lena would be conscious or not. But before she'd been kidnapped, Lena had given both Eli and Shiloh thorough, detailed instructions on what to do if she went into a diabetic coma. Eli administered insulin in the field. Lena was barely coherent. She tried to stand and faltered, swaying unsteadily. I can do it. But she couldn't. 
She staggered, and Jackson caught her. Clearly, she was physically weakened, but her will had not broken. They had not broken her, and he thought his chest would explode with love and fear. He would not breathe until she was out of here, safe and sound. He would not rest until Sykes was dead. Hart reloaded his weapon and slapped in a fresh magazine. Let's get the hell out of here. Jackson put his arm around Lena and helped her to her feet. They loaded her onto the portable stretcher they'd packed in Hart's field pack. Hart and Nash carried the stretcher, with Antoine and Jackson in the lead, Moreno taking up the rear. They headed for the main tunnel. Eli did not move with them. Jackson hesitated. He glanced back at Eli, a dark awareness in his face. He knew what Eli was going to do, what he needed to do. Jackson nodded, not in tacit approval, but in acceptance. I'll get her out. Eli had no choice but to trust Jackson with her life. I know. We've got her, let's go, Antoine shouted, cursing loudly in French. Alpha Team vanished through the tunnel. Lena was too dazed to realize Eli wasn't with them, which was for the best. Their footsteps echoed faintly, then disappeared. Eli turned and headed for the passageway through which Sykes had fled less than a minute before. He must have been winged in the firefight. A faint trail of blood glinted oil black in the light of his IR light. The maw of the tunnel before him was dark as a coffin. Wiping the blood leaking down his arm onto his chest rig, he entered it. Subterranean drafts whispered, as if an ancient voice was speaking from the throat of the mine. This ended, now, this very hour. Either Sykes died, or he did. One thing he knew, only one of them would walk out of here alive. Chapter 73, Eli Pope, Day 105. He hunted. If there was one thing Eli Pope was good at, it was hunting men. Again, he entered the twisting tunnels, the oppressive darkness. The air was dank against his skin, the cold like the kiss of a ghost on the back of his neck. It felt like a labyrinth, willingly stepping foot into the heart of darkness itself. There was a monster at the heart of the labyrinth. There was always a monster. He could never eradicate all evil. Evil was endemic, a part of every human heart. It spread like a fungus, a disease. There was no finish, no end to it. But this evil, this monster, Eli would end him now, one way or another. He moved cautiously through the tunnel, straining to hear feeling the wall with his left hand, his Glock 19 held tightly in his right, going mostly by sound and touch. Only occasionally did he switch on the illuminator to see what his hands and tentative footsteps couldn't tell him. He searched for the scattered droplets of glistening blood, hot on Sykes's trail. His IR beam swept tunnel entrance after tunnel entrance. Impenetrable shadows lurked outside the reach of the light, stalking him, waiting to pounce. The dank smell of water and minerals filled his nostrils. He strained his ears, listening hard, to no avail. His hearing was impaired. He would not be able to hear the padding steps if Sykes snuck up on him. His throat closed in fear. It would be a terrible way to die, lost down here, sightless and afraid. How easy it would be to make a wrong turn at a fork. Choose the wrong tunnel, twist an ankle and stumble, plunging into an abyss. The thought made his flesh crawl. He passed a cavity carved into the wall, no larger than the size of a walk-in closet, approximately four feet wide by ten feet deep, the beginning of a tunnel offshoot from the secondary artery. It went nowhere. The copper vein the miners had followed dried up. Similar grottos were interspersed along this shaft. They provided perfect ambush locations for Sykes to lie in wait for him. 
Ahead, he glimpsed another splatter of blood, fresh and glinting. Eli had no choice but to continue on. The roof of the tunnel sank gradually lower. The walls closed in, growing narrow. Rock scraped his spine like clawed fingers. Cold panic flushed through him. He fought it back and kept moving. Five minutes later, he entered a larger space, the ceiling arcing 40 to 50 feet above him. To the left was a narrow path, steeply angled and six feet wide. To the right, a cliff, the sheer drop-off, black and bottomless as the abyss. His imagination conjured demons and wraiths keening from the depths, slithering up the steep walls to devour those who dared trespass, the Windigo hunting for human flesh to devour. The narrow path clung to the lip of the cliff and descended along the ledge to another passageway a hundred yards distant. If Sykes was hidden behind the bend, he'd be able to see Eli's light a long way off. With grave misgivings, he switched off his IR illuminator. He was plunged into darkness. He would have to feel his way from here. Pausing, he stopped to listen over the dull ringing in his ears. Had he heard something? A soft step, perhaps? An expelled breath? He stopped breathing his muscles tensed. He waited, silent for a full minute, but heard no other sounds. Instinctively, his hand moved over his chest rig, wishing he could touch the St. Michael's medallion beneath it for good luck, for blessings from any saints or supernatural beings who might be watching from above. He thought of the sacrifices of noble men. Warily, his nerves raw, he again began to move, Keeping close to the wall, his palm scraped the rough rock, then felt an empty space carved into the passage, another grotto. Pebbles crunched underfoot. The blood rushed through his veins. Absolute blackness pressed in on him. Terror stalked him in the dark. Behind him, a pebble skittered, a whiff of body odor. Eli started to spin. The rock struck Eli's spine just below the shoulder blades. Pain exploded throughout his entire body. Knocked off his feet, Eli launched forward and smacked the wall face first, then fell on his back, his breath expelled from his lungs. His pistol was smacked from his hand. It skidded off the ledge and tumbled over the drop off. He never heard it hit the bottom, it was so far down. Sykes had attacked him. Hidden in one of the grottos, he must have snuck up behind him and struck him with a rock. Fear scythed through him, pain like a hot poker stabbed between his shoulder blades. Gasping, he flipped onto his belly, the ground slick and uneven, angled downward toward the abyss he couldn't see, terribly aware that Sykes was somewhere, invisible and out of reach, about to attack again. Painfully, Eli clambered to his knees. Before he could climb to his feet, a heavy form leaped onto his back. Hot breath in his ear, hands like claws on his shoulders, his throat. Eli fumbled desperately in the darkness. He found Sykes's arm, locked it with his own, and spun him to the ground. Something hard slammed into his forehead. Sykes had headbutted him. Forced to release his hold, Eli stumbled back, scrambling for balance. White stars swirled across his vision, his chest pounded, his lungs bursting for air. He sensed Sykes moving backward, heard the thud of his footsteps, the sound of a blade sliding from its sheath as Sykes drew his karambit. Simultaneously, Eli drew his combat knife. The men faced each other, knives out. Both blind, enveloped in all-encompassing blackness. Balanced on a narrow ledge, the wall to his right, the cliff to the left. A fight to the death, in total darkness, hundreds of feet below the surface of the earth. So be it. Eli sucked in a single deep breath. He rushed Sykes and snap kicked hard. His boot made contact with Sykes's stomach. Sykes grunted, pained. White hot pain slashed across his shin. 
Blood gushed down his leg as Eli's boot hit the ground. Sykes had nicked him. He danced backward, attempting to stay close to the wall. A sensation of movement, a displacement in the air molecules. Eli braced his left forearm to protect his face and throat and slashed outward with the knife. He struck at empty air. He spun, trying to place Sykes by sound. A grunt, a footstep. To the left? Two feet away? Three feet to the right? He didn't even sense Sykes move. Sudden stabbing pain punched his right shoulder outside his chest rig. Sykes had slashed downward and barely missed driving the blade under Eli's vest for a kill shot. The cut sliced his flesh from the top of his shoulder to his armpit. Eli held out his blade, but his muscles were slow to respond. His shoulder wasn't moving right. Something was wrong. His entire arm was a white-hot flame of pain. Eli kicked again and made contact. Sykes cursed, stumbling backward. But fresh pain from the blow shot up Eli's leg where the karambit had knifed him. His leg was bleeding hard, blood filling his boot. His pulse throbbed in his cut shoulder, blood spilling with every beat of his heart, soaking his t-shirt. A breeze touched his cheek as Sykes landed another attack. The blade sliced the front of his chest rig. Eli checked the arm holding the blade, while his knife hand slid across and underneath Sykes's arm to try and disarm him, to cut his hand or wrist. But Eli's right arm was injured, too slow and pouring blood. In the darkness, he couldn't see his way. He missed. Sykes didn't. The karambit blade sliced across Eli's left hand and cut through flesh, tendon, and bone. With a strangled cry, Eli jerked back. His bloodied foot struck a rock. He stumbled and nearly fell. The sensation of a yawning void to his left was the only warning that he was inches from the edge. Regaining his balance, he clenched his fists. Blood ran down his fingers in rivulets. Agony pulsed with every heartbeat. Sykes broke free and pulled back, breathing hard. Death by a thousand cuts, Pope. His girlish sing-song voice echoed eerily, seeming to come from all directions at once. As I promised you. In the total blackness, he could hear Sykes' breathing, could smell his sour sweat and tangy adrenaline, his own coppery blood mixed with the dank air of the mine. Eli sucked in oxygen, his lungs burning, the pain throbbing through his body, weakening him beat by beat. I'm gonna cut you wide open and watch you bleed. Sykes's words echoed off the cavern walls and reverberated in the yawning pit. Your girlfriend is next. She can watch me torture and kill your daughter before I do the same to her. Oh, yes, we found out about Shiloh. Did you think you could hide her from me, Eli? Did you think you had a chance? Nausea churned in Eli's gut. He swayed, sickened, and enraged. You think you're such a big shot. But everyone will know you failed. I'll put your head on a stake and parade it in front of your friends before I kill them, too. Admit it. You can't beat me. You'll never win. You can't win. Eli understood what would happen, what had to happen. He refused to allow this demented psychopath to harm his daughter or the woman he loved. The pain receded. The fear vanished, replaced with a cold resolve. This, then, was how it would end. For Sykes, but also for Eli. He inched to the left, away from the wall. In his mind's eye, he pinned Sykes's location based on his voice. Directly ahead, five or six feet between them. Sykes was laughing. <laughs> You're beaten. You're alone, in the dark, and that's how you'll die. I win, Pope, not you. 
I don't need to win. He felt Sykes still for an instant, confused at his words. Eli said, I just need you to lose. With the last of his strength, he launched himself into darkness. He lunged, not at Sykes, but past him, to the edge of the ravine. His left foot slid over the lip of the pit. His right hand brushed the outside of Sykes's arm. Behind Sykes now, Eli spun and grabbed his hair with his left hand. With his injured right arm, he managed to shove his blade deep into Sykes's side, puncturing his kidney. Stunned, Sykes gave a stifled cry. He struck wildly with his knife, but Eli was behind him and out of reach. Eli pulled Sykes close, felt his body heat, smelled his sour sweat. He said into his ear, game over. Wrapping Sykes in his arms, Eli flung them sidelong toward the cliff. Sykes's feet scrabbled for purchase, but found none. He roared in outrage, his knife hand striking backward and down, stabbing at Eli's neck. The knife slashed his ear, but he didn't feel the pain. Eli shoved the knife deeper into Sykes's side. Then he pushed them both over the edge. Sykes teetered, clawing at Eli's bloody arms. The blood made his skin slick. Sykes's hands slipped away. Sykes screamed like a wounded demon returning to hell. He plunged into the abyss. Eli fell with him. As he fell, Eli managed to twist in midair. His upper half slammed into rock. His legs dangled over the pit, his chest on the ledge, his hands grasping for anything to hold him. Dimly, he registered the thud of a body striking hard rock far below him. His own body began to slide backward. A rock broke free and skittered down the sheer wall, dropping a hundred feet, maybe more. Pain quaked through every nerve in his body. His right arm wouldn't work correctly. The agony threatened to paralyze him, his muscles spasming as he skidded toward the abyss. Panic bit at him. Eli clutched at blood slick rocks, desperate to drag himself up and over the ledge, his fingers rigid like claws. His fingernails split as his hands found a shallow ridge of stone and dug in, pulling hard, muscles straining. His whole body trembled from exertion and nerve shredding pain. He let out a groan. The sound echoed, cruelly mocking him. He was about to fall, to pitch over the edge to his death, with no one to witness his demise but the cold, indifferent rock. Inch by quivering inch, he hauled his upper half onto the ledge. His boots slid down the steep wall. He dropped several gut-clenching inches before catching himself. Stinging, Burning pain racked his arm, his legs, and his ribs. Grunting, mustering all his strength, he managed to lever one leg up. Finally, he flung his left leg up and over the ledge, then the other. Gasping in relief, he rolled away from the edge. He lay on his back. The agony like a boulder pressed upon his chest, blood leaking from a half dozen cuts, breath rasping from his bruised lungs. Dully, he touched his head with numb fingers. His hand came back sticky. His night vision goggles were gone. They must have been knocked off in the fight. He stared up at the black nothingness, at the white stars pinwheeling behind his eyelids. The monster was dead. Eli had thought he would die. He had been meant to go over the edge with Sykes. By some damned miracle, he couldn't comprehend. He hadn't. He was far from saved. He was injured, bleeding profusely, and hopelessly lost. Down in the dark, hundreds of feet below the sun, with no light to guide him home. Chapter 74 Eli Pope, Day 105. Eli tried to rise, 
groping his way along the rough wall. But his legs would no longer hold his weight. His knees buckled. He sank against the tunnel wall, the rock damp against his head and spine. He exhaled an unsteady breath. Dizziness washed through him. He'd lost a lot of blood. He was bleeding profusely from several punctures and slashes, a dozen tiny wounds, a thousand cuts. It was okay. It was okay because he had done the thing he'd set out to do. The monster was dead. Eli had killed him. The girl and the woman he loved would be safe now, safe at the end of the world. There was no way out of the labyrinth. If he'd had Ariadne's thread, he might have escaped certain death, like Theseus. But alas, he had no string to lead him from this dark maze into precious daylight. He was no Greek hero, and this was no myth. His movements slow and lethargic. He forced himself to reach for his IFAC kit, tucked into a pouch on his chest rig, fumbling for bandages to attempt to slow the bleeding. But it was no use. One hand clasped his stomach, his blood pulsing like a little river, sliding in rivulets over his knuckles, down his fingers, spurting in time with his heart, slowing, ever slowing. He was dying. Time passed, minutes and then hours. The silence, thick and heavy, his heart turning on him, pumping his life from his inert body. He'd become the darkness. He was the darkness. The darkness was in him, would consume him. Oh, the irony. At the end of all things, he had found his beginning, only to have it brutally stolen from him. Violence was a cruel mistress, a double-edged sword. The sound was gradual, a distant thing unknowable and strange and alien down here. Footsteps approached, slow and hesitant, but purposeful. He knew he must be hallucinating. There was nothing down here but demons and devils, himself included. A red tactical flashlight shimmered along the rock floor, reflecting off smooth puddles of water. Not water, but blood, he thought dully. His blood. And then Jackson stood in front of him. He crouched and held the flashlight beam angled down so as not to hurt Eli's eyes. Still, Eli squinted as if he'd been trapped in the dark for years, as though his very soul had forgotten the promise of light. Jackson glanced around warily, pistol in hand. Where is Sykes? At the bottom of hell. Good. Lena. Eli croaked. We'll be fine. The, the others, he mumbled, thinking of the brave team members who'd entered the labyrinth with him. Don't worry about them. The battle is over. It's you we have to worry about now. Eli nodded dully. You came back for me. I did. Why? For one, before we left, a certain 13-year-old Hellion told me she'd cut out my tongue and feed it to me if I didn't bring you home. Sounds perfectly reasonable. She is her father's daughter. Eli attempted a smile in the dark. It hurt. His mouth wasn't working properly. I came to bring you home, Jackson said. Once they got Lena out, everyone wanted to come back for you. I've got Antoine, Devin, and Nix a little ways back, checking our six. They've got the portable stretcher. Looks like you're gonna need it. Eli tried to say he was fine, but the words wouldn't come. He was far from fine, and Jackson knew it. Jackson unslung his pack, squatted, and rummaged through it as he spoke. You're bleeding pretty badly, so I'm gonna bandage you up as best I can with these Israeli trauma bandages and quick clot to get the bleeding to stop. Then we'll get you out of here, okay? While Jackson worked on him, Eli faded for a while, everything dim and distant, and cold, so impossibly cold. 
When he came to, he was shivering uncontrollably. He mumbled, I think I'm dying. You're far too irritating for that. Come on, get up. People are waiting for us. Eli managed one word. Who? Everyone that matters, Jackson said simply. Then, Jackson's arm was around his ribs. His arm slung around Jackson's neck, his legs heavy and dragging. Jackson practically carrying him as they trudged in the near dark. Shadows pressing in, ghosts breathing all around them. Each step was a grueling ordeal of pain, effort, and exhaustion. Not today, he thought dimly. The darkness would come for him, but not today. How did you find me? Eli asked. Jackson's voice was wry and grim. I follow the cookie crumbs. Crumbs? Blood, you big oaf. I followed your blood. Chapter 75 Eli Pope, Day 110 You're awake? Eli's eyes fluttered. He groaned and tried to sit up, but a detonation of pain throughout his whole body sent him right back down again. He was on his back, in a bed, a mattress beneath him, a feather pillow propping up his head. He was shirtless, his dog tags and St. Michael's medallion resting on thick white bandages, wrapping his ribs and right shoulder. His left hand was bandaged, along with his left leg from ankle to knee, which was propped up with more pillows at the foot of the bed. An IV bag hung from a hook attached to the bed frame, saline dripping steadily through a plastic tube into the needle taped to the inside of his forearm. The deep laceration carved into his ear was stitched. It felt like someone had pressed a hot iron to the side of his face. It hurt everywhere. It hurt to move, to breathe. I'm alive, he croaked in surprise. You're alive, Lena confirmed. She sat in an armchair next to his bed, a pile of yarn and knitting needles in her lap. An array of medical equipment stacked on the antique dresser behind her. Bandages, gauze, topical antibiotic creams, saline bags, needles, a urinal bottle, and a bedpan. Barely. Shiloh sat cross-legged on an ottoman in an oversized t-shirt emblazoned with a picture of Darth Vader. The words, number one dad, scrawled below it. Her head was bent, and strands of black hair slipped across her face her mouth pursed in concentration as she sharpened her knife. Bear flopped on the floor at her feet, snoring loudly. Eli blinked. How am I? Still breathing? Lena asked. Dr. Vertanen came back. Her family didn't make it. So she decided to return, and just in time. You lost a lot of blood. We got you patched up, but it was touch and go there for a bit. More than a bit, Shiloh said. You needed a blood transfusion. The hospital had none left, but we had a donor volunteer. Dr. Vertanen was a bit rusty working with a living patient. She prefers the dead, since they don't talk back. You were her first live patient in a good while, but we got it done. I remembered your blood type from the time you hit your head on the boulder at Chapel Rock when we were 12, remember? He did. He remembered waking up in the ER to her concerned, pretty, reproachful face leaning over him, just like now. The donor? Jackson. Eli grunted. Jackson Cross, the man he loved and hated. Why am I not surprised? Your brother's Eli, in spirit, if not through DNA, it's in your blood. Literally, Shiloh quipped. He came back for me. Lena smiled. He was determined not to leave anyone behind. If there's one thing I can say about Jackson, when he sets his mind to do a thing, he stays on it until it gets done. Like a pit bull. Or a cockroach, Shiloh said. Not so dissimilar to someone else I know. 
Lena's eyes shone with fierce affection. Her chestnut hair swept over one shoulder, with the soft waves burnished bronze in the candlelight. She was still too thin, her face swollen and bruised from her broken nose at the hands of Angel Flood. But she fairly shimmered with vitality. Her gaze was bright and alert, and her cheeks flushed a healthy pink. His heart tumbled in his chest. She was beautiful, so beautiful. For a moment, he forgot the pain, forgot how to breathe. Clearing his throat awkwardly, he forced himself to look away, to take in his surroundings, blinking blearily as he recognized the log walls and the lacy curtains, the sweet smell of wood smoke. Distant waves murmured as they lapped the shoreline. I'm at the lighthouse. Shiloh rolled her eyes. He's a genius. No lasting damage from nearly dying. Sykes is dead, Lena said. And his gang of criminals, too. Jackson saw to that. I think Nix single-handedly took out five or six with her sniper rifle. They managed to kill all but one or two of them, who snuck out, turned tail, and ran. It was like he was swimming from a great depth, everything distant and fuzzy around the edges. The pain muddled his brain. What about Devon? Nix and Antoine? A shadow darkened her features. They're okay. They got out. Eli's chest went cold. They'd lost someone. At least one. He could see it in her face. Who? The police chief. Sarah McAllister. A couple of rounds got beneath her plates and hit her in the gut. There was too much damage. We tried, but we couldn't perform the surgery she needed. He'd barely known her, but he did know she had been tough and brave. One of the ones willing to stand in the gap, to fight against evil without pay or reward. For that, she had suffered miserably and died. She'd been under his charge, and he'd lost her. Like Charlie Payne and David Kepford had been lost fighting to save him. Like the innocent kid in the bowels of Sawyer's yacht. He closed his eyes, remembered that Lena and Shiloh were here and safe, and that Sykes was no more. That was something. And the insulin, he asked. That, too, and the rest of the meds. Cartons and crates of the good stuff. Antibiotics, painkillers, beta blockers, antipsychotics and antidepressants, and steroids. Nix got her beta blockers for her grandma. We have enough to start a real clinic. Even reopen a small wing of the hospital, maybe. Eli nodded painfully. What about the Tiltons, Tracy and her son? A shadow passed across Lena's face. Keegan is stable. He was pretty hyperglycemic. But now that he's got the insulin he needs, he's doing great. Physically, at least. He and his mom are still at the inn. They're both in shock and grieving over the death of Curtis. We should kick them out after what that woman did, Shiloh said. I guess the kid can stay, but she almost got you killed. Lena shot Shiloh a warning look. No one is getting kicked out. At least not right now. Something has to happen to her. She can't just get away with what she did. We'll deal with them later, Lena said. We've got plenty to worry about right here, right now. Shiloh pouted, but she didn't argue for once. How long have I been out? Eli asked. Lena hesitated. Five days? Five days. The shock to his system made him dizzy. He groaned and tried to rise, or at least sit up. Stabs of pain throughout his entire body reminded him why he shouldn't. Slow your roll, cowboy. Lena leaned forward, put her hand on his bandaged chest, and pushed him gently but firmly back. You need to rest. Hurry up, though, Shiloh said. Don't let your lazy butt lay around too long. I've been doing your chores for days, and it sucks big time. Reluctantly, Eli obeyed. Guess I'll be laying off the ten-mile runs for a while. 
Damn straight you will, Lena said. You hungry? Shiloh asked. We've got bear patties, bear bacon, bear chili, or bear steak. Sounds delicious. He offered a wry smile. The smile hurt, but it felt good. It felt wonderful. There were still threats to contend with. Desperate people, Sawyer, and the cartel. But this moment, right here, was perfection. Lena swiped at her eyes, which had gone suddenly glossy. I could smack you. He frowned in confusion. That took a hard turn. He almost lost you. Her voice was raw with worry, her expression a map of the fear and sorrow she'd carried. I almost lost you. That goes both ways. He seized her hand. We're right here. I'm right here. She gave him a shy smile. Guess we'll have to make up for lost time. We'd better. She squeezed his hand. Nobody knows how the story ends. What does that even mean? Shiloh asked. It means I never imagined I would ever be here like this. With you and Eli. That I'd ever have a family. Despite everything terrible that has happened, there is good here, too. There is beauty, joy, and goodness. Shiloh made a disgusted face. Ew, don't get cringy on me. Too late. Lena met Eli's gaze. All we can do is our best, every day. It's all we have. We keep trying. She leaned in and kissed his cheek smelling of vanilla and sunlight. Her warm lips set his skin tingling. We don't give up on each other, not ever. Despite the pain, Eli reached up and touched her temple, tucked a strand of silky hair behind her ear, and traced the contours of her cheek. I know. Shiloh watched them, her eyes widening in bewilderment. Wait, what's happening right now? Bear snorted awake, lifted his head and whined, his big head swinging in confusion from Shiloh to Eli and Lena and back to Shiloh. His bushy tail thumped happily. His fur was already growing out where he'd been unceremoniously shaved. His wound was healing. Like the humans, it would leave a scar. The walking wounded, with scars that marked what they'd survived. Lena smiled as she kissed Eli on the mouth. He kissed her back. Gross, Shiloh cried. Horrified, she clapped her hands over her eyes. Stop, please, what the hell is happening? They didn't stop. Eli kissed her harder, deeper, with every fiber of his being. Lena returned the kiss with enthusiasm, though she was cautious of her healing nose. She held his face in her hands, her hair a curtain draped around them. With an angst-ridden groan, Shiloh leaped from the ottoman and fled the room. She shouted, who's paying for my therapy? Chapter 76, Jackson Cross, Day 114. It was Astrid, Jackson said. Lena blinked, stunned. What? Shiloh's expression darkened. Her eyes burned with ferocity, the terrible understanding. Astrid killed Lily. Lena, Shiloh, and Jackson had hiked to Sand Point to visit the beach and marsh for foraging. Located a few miles north of town, they'd made it up the trail past several tumbling waterfalls through dense northern hardwoods of sugar and red maple, yellow birch, and hemlock. The leaves of the trees were already tinged red, orange and yellow. Summer had vanished as swiftly as it had appeared. The heat and humidity seeped from the earth, and the chill of fall creeping in, the sky a hard enamel blue, as unforgiving as winter when it fell upon them with vengeance. Jackson told them everything, how he'd unraveled the mystery, thread by thread, leading to Gideon Crawford, then his father, and then ultimately to Astrid. 
He saw his sister clearly now, a wretched soul, deformed not by the scars on her legs, but by the grotesque hatred she'd fed and nourished until it consumed her and anything within reach. She tried to have me killed, Shiloh said. She thought I was remembering. She did. The thumping sound you heard helped me fit those last pieces together. It was her cane. Shiloh nodded gravely, pride and satisfaction in her eyes. She had helped catch her mother's killer. Do you think your father knew Astrid killed Lily? Lena asked. The question still haunted him. I think he spent his life protecting Astrid from consequences. It was about protecting his reputation. I kept sniffing around, asking questions, and my mother knew something. She started remembering, and Horatio saw her as a threat, so he drugged her to keep her from speaking the truth. To my father, secrets stay secrets, and bodies stay buried, no matter what. The truth is more dangerous than kryptonite to someone like him. He created his own reality, balanced on a precarious house of cards. If one of those cards toppled, then the whole house collapsed. Where is your father? Lena asked. He ran. He's gone. He may have linked up with the Cote cartel. As of now, it's unknown. And where is Astrid now? Shiloh asked. A jolt of guilt speared him. Astrid is dead. He didn't know what he expected, but Lena simply nodded, accepting it. Her reaction surprised him. Hers was an indomitable will. Though her nature was to heal, nurture, and help, when it came to protecting those she loved, few were more dauntless. Lena was alert and bright-eyed, quickly regaining her strength. She had years of insulin to keep her healthy and alive. Jackson loved her like family. More than family, she and Shiloh both. Good, Shiloh muttered. The girl shared her father's warrior spirit. She didn't blink in the face of death. Taking a life didn't seem to torment her like it did gentler spirits, like Lena's and his own. I killed her. Jackson stared unseeing at Lake Superior. The water shone calm and bright in the near windless day, little frothy ripples ruffling its surface. I don't know if it was the right thing. I worry that I'm no better than a common criminal. It was justice, Lena said. Fair laws, unbiased court systems, and prisons to incarcerate those who could not abide by society's rules for the betterment of all. That was the justice he'd believed in his entire life. Yet justice had always been flawed, even before the solar flares set civilization on fire. The justice system had collapsed. He had done the most just thing he could think of to do. The world had changed. For better or worse, he was changing along with it. Four months ago, to take another person's life would have been shocking and reprehensible. Perspective changed things. He was adjusting to the decay of the old world and the birth of something new. Still, a thread of despair tugged at his chest. Part of him felt like he'd sacrificed his soul in the act of killing his sister. Fear gnawed at him somewhere deep down. He'd stepped across a line that could never be uncrossed. All his life, he'd believed he knew the right thing, the moral thing. He was the good guy. And now, now he didn't know anything. I have so many doubts, he said. I have nightmares. Keep doubting. The second you lose that doubt and think you know everything, is when you've lost your way. Lena leaned over and brushed an unruly lock of hair out of his eyes. You haven't lost your way. Jackson wasn't sure he believed her. Shiloh saw the torment on his face and took his hand. Thank you. He hadn't realized how much he needed her absolution until that moment. 
Shiloh held his hand in her warm small one and looked up at him with something like affection beaming from that mischievous elfin face, her coal black eyes fierce and so very alive. He knew, in his heart of hearts, that he had done what he had to do. Whether it was the right thing or the just thing was a different matter. It was a scar he must live with. You're free now, Jackson, Lena said. What do you mean? Lena gave him a penetrating look. With the insulin, she was rapidly regaining her strength and vitality. Her eyes were bright and alert. She'd always known him better than he knew himself. All these years, you've been haunted by this case, by Lily. I don't believe in ghosts, but if I did, I would tell you that she's at rest. You can rest now, too. It felt like lightness, an unburdening. He had kept the promise he'd made to Shiloh and Lena. He had followed the case to its bitter end and found some semblance of peace for Lily and himself. That wasn't entirely true. For every mystery he solved, another lay beneath it in ever darker layers. There was a reckoning to be had, things left unfinished in a way he could not articulate. In some ways, he'd constructed his entire life in penance to his family. There would be no redemption until he had tracked down his missing father and confronted him face to face. And found what? He didn't know. The burden of the Cross family, the curse that had plagued him from birth, was not finished with him yet, nor was he finished with it. A cold resolve filled him to end what needed ending. Lena touched his arm. I am sorry about your mom. His mother was gone too. It still surprised him, fresh grief washing over him at unexpected moments. He'd planned to bring her to live with him at the inn. But two days after the raid on the mine, he had found his mother stiff in her bed. Fiona Smith had stayed the night with her, but had left when Jackson arrived to remove Astrid's body and bury it in the rapidly growing graveyard. When he'd returned hours later, hands calloused and grimy with dirt, Dolores was dead. Several empty pill bottles sat on the nightstand beside the bed, alongside an empty glass. There was vomit on her nightgown. He didn't know if it was an accident or intentional. Perhaps she'd found the state of the world incomprehensible and had chosen to abdicate her own life. In truth, Jackson had hardly known her, not really. His mother had shielded her deepest emotions, wearing a pleasant mask, playing the role they'd allowed her to play because it was convenient. She had bent herself around others, to their needs and desires, never her own. He was the only one left who would miss her, though Garrett was still out there, somewhere. In one fell swoop, he'd lost his mother and his sister. His corrupt father had vanished, and his prodigal brother was a complete mystery. The family that defined him, guilted him, and haunted him, gone. Shiloh looked up at him with a pensive expression, as if she knew exactly what he was feeling. In many ways, she was the only one who possibly could. You have us, she said. We're your family now. Chapter 77, Eli Pope, Day 120. Eli, said a voice behind him. Eli recognized Jackson's distinctive footsteps and did not turn around. Jackson approached and stood next to him. Eli leaned heavily on crutches. He was still incredibly weak, his legs rubbery and his shoulders stiff and sore, his body betraying him at every turn. Lena insisted that he rest, but Eli didn't have a restful bone in his body. He had to move, no matter how much it hurt. But each day, step by agonizing step, he got a little stronger. Together, Jackson and Eli stood on the bluff and looked out over the rugged coastline. The unseasonably high temperatures had finally broken. The day was chilly, in the high 60s. The wind whipped up white caps across the lake. 
It was already September. Winter was coming, and with it, the frigid cold, starvation, and more death. It had been four months since the fiery northern lights lit up the skies and set half the world on fire. North America plunged into darkness, along with Canada and Mexico, Russia, Europe, and the entire UK, nearly all of Asia except for Indonesia. In total, over 50 countries, consisting of billions of people, were affected. Everything transformed in a heartbeat. Things were still changing so rapidly that people's heads were spinning. One must adapt to new ways or die. Some people had adapted better than others. Some had chosen to drown their sorrow in booze, prescription pills, meth or heroin, or with a bullet to the brain. Hundreds of thousands more had perished due to lack of medical care, hunger and disease, waterborne illnesses and lack of sanitation, especially in the cities. As for Eli, he had found his home at the lighthouse, though he feared it wasn't yet safe enough for his little family to return. Maybe it would never be safe. He sensed Jackson's tension. What is it? Antoine just called me. A security team captured someone trying to sneak past the checkpoint on Adam's Trail, out by the Pictured Rocks golf course, where we found the golf carts. What do you need me for? Marino or Nix can take care of it. Antoine says it has to be you. He thinks this clown is a spy. Eli sucked in a breath. For Sawyer? No, Jackson said. For the cartel. Eli had seen firsthand the cartel's ability to lay waste to anything it touched. Scenes of war slammed through his mind. Countless dead. Crows picking stringy meat from corpses. Flies buzzing across a horrific battlefield. Every cell in his body thrummed in alarm. Balancing awkwardly on his crutches, he withdrew his pistol, his head on a swivel scanning the placid scenery as if he could suss out the unseen threat slinking through the trees, coming once again for everything he loved. In this harsh new world, there were no happy endings. The darkness was unrelenting, ruthless and malevolent. The only thing to do was to fight, to keep fighting, in a never-ending struggle to push back the despair for a moment, for a day, for a brief respite, before rising to fight again. They've got him talking, Jackson said. He says the cartel is coming here, to Munising. They know we stole the meds from Sykes and killed their band of proxy soldiers. He said, Jackson hesitated, fear on his face. Tell me, Eli said. He says they're going to burn us to the ground. Author's Note Thank you for reading the third book in the Lost Light series, The Hope We Keep. This story clocked in at my longest yet, at 130,000 words. I hope you enjoyed the ride. I've really enjoyed fleshing out the location of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, which is rural, wild, and filled with spectacular beauty. This past September, my family and I visited the UP and toured an abandoned copper mine, which included rappelling down a deep hole to 300 feet below the surface and edging across a narrow wooden bridge over a 50-foot deep pit. This is where I saw the sticking Tommy candle holder the miners once used. I knew instantly it was a perfect murder weapon for one of my characters. I didn't know at first that it would be Lena, but she really stepped up in this third book in the series and I can't wait to see what she and the others do next. Can you? Thank you so much for reading this series and following Jackson, Eli, Lena, and Shiloh as they struggle not only to survive, but to live with purpose, even as the world unravels around them. We hope you have enjoyed The Hope We Keep, a post-apocalyptic survival thriller, Lost Light, Book 3. Written by Kyla Stone. Read for you by Stacy Glomboski. The audio for this book was engineered by Anansi Audio. The Hope We Keep is copyright 2023 by Kyla Stone.
Production copyright 2023 by Kyla Stone. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening.